Welcome to Palestine, also known as the Palestinian territories, the occupied Palestinian territories, Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank. I feel the need to give all the names so we're just on equal level playing field here. Before this crazy war, I got a chance to travel through what is regarded to as Palestine or the accessible part of Palestine to a person like me. I got to sit down with Arabs, with Muslims, with Jews, with Christians and visit a bunch of holy sites, a bunch of conflicting zones and show you guys the best of what I could find in the area regarded to as Palestine. In this long travel documentary, you're going to meet a bunch of different characters, eat a bunch of food and see a bunch of different sites. So I hope you enjoy and let me know what you think. Assalamu alaikum, my friends, and welcome back to the Holy Land. We are here right outside of the Palestinian territories in... We're, right now we're on this place called Mount Gazarim, which is like the Samaritan community. We're making some videos with them. But that right there is the city of Nablus, also known as Shechem in Hebrew. One of the biggest cities in the Palestinian territories. We're going to go in there and we're going to go eat some food. I'm super excited for this. I'm joined with my friends Abud hey, and go. Musa. Let's go get some food, boys. Let's go. Yalla. So we're driving across the streets of Nablus right now. You can actually see it's like it's like a big valley. It looks like a really big downtown or winding down into uh, deeper parts of Nablus. You yeah. know some good cool spots here in the area? For sure, yeah. yeah. There's a restaurant called Hamis. Hamis. Which means Thursday. Oh, nice. I'm very, very excited to, to try some food here. It's like a nice proper high uh, street here. Rafinia. It's one of those uh, most, you know, active roads in Nablus. Oh, that's where we're going? I am very excited, very. First steps on the streets of Nablus. Welcome to Nablus, my friend. <laughs> Here we are. I have not seen a pay meter like that in a long time. I know, right? Wow, that's actually like a retro throwback. It's all vintage. <laughs> so we're gonna pop and get some grub, taste some uh, delicious local food here in Nablus. And this is a restaurant you frequented. You, you know this place well? Yeah. Well, Samaritans come to this place pretty often. Mm. It's one of those more kosher ones, if you know what I mean. Okay. It's uh, known for its hummus and uh, falafel. There's yeah. not too many meats here. There is meat, meat here, but I think it just got stuck with us. Like, Hamis is involved with like more kosher food. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool being on the streets of Nablus for the first time. Oh, look at this. It's like already pre-made meats. This is some nice chunks of fish, too. Shisha and Mancusha. Whoa, this is a beautiful restaurant. Oh, my God. Wow, it's so beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice place. I'm very excited for this. I'm excited specifically more to see the prices as well because uh, Abud was telling us that it's a significant, significant price difference. Fish can be pricey? It is a little pricey. Let's check it out. Let's see what we're dealing with over here. The currency is in check -in. That's not the best uh, menu I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys can't have mine. Sorry. <laughs> I got the good menu. Palestinian water from Palestinian Springs. Guys, check out this hummus and all the salads. This is exciting. Would you know how to say the names in Arabic of every single one of these salads? I can try. Let's see. We have betinjan betin, which means um, eggplant with tahini. Hummus. This one, I actually know in English and not in Arabic. This is beets. But I forgot in, in Arabic. I probably remember it soon. Lifto. Tess. Okay. Oh, that's the corn salad. Wow. Yeah. This one? Janana. Janana? Yeah, something with eggplant in tomato. So in Hebrew, this would like, we would definitely call this matbukha, right? Jaji? Yeah, you can try a leaf. Okay, wait. It's arugula? Arugula. It's arugula. Okay. It's not lettuce. I Look at this pita. This is a beautiful looking pita. Palestinian hummus in Abelis. What I'm seeing difference here. We've got a nice spread of the hummus on top. One side has olive oil in it. The other side has olive oil as well, but it has uh, red paprika. And then this side is zaatar maybe? That's kamun. Oh, it's cumin. Oh, beautiful. I'm going in the cumin side first. Love it. Got a good deep dip in there. Oh, that looks very super smooth. Phenomenal. Wow. No doubt. Pretty good. Dude, that is really good. That is good hummus, huh? You like pickles? I love pickles. Then dip them. All right. I'm up for the challenge. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, right there. Mm. What I'm excited for is this mayonnaise corn salad. I love corn, I love mayonnaise. It's one of my favorite salads to make. Mm. It's so simple, but so delicious. Beets and sesame. Oh, wow. Yeah, fantastic. Mm. Some, maybe some spicy with Let's some see. Put, yeah, some Whoa. <laughs> 
Whoa, the Magbuha is amazing. Mm. All right, Nablus, I'm feeling your vibe. I dig it. I dig it. Thank you, Abud, for the recommendation. The presentation is just amazing. Look how beautiful this is. So it comes with like these limes on top. Yeah, it's like some sort of puree of citrus and uh, probably peppers and stuff. I really appreciate the presentation. You know, that's awesome. And the rice is nice. It comes with some toasted almonds on top. I'm fairly certain that Lovlak is, is sea bass, if I remember correctly. The sea bass is one of the most coveted, delicious fish on planet Earth. It's amazing. The sauce is really nice. With wow, the sauce is amazing. You got a nice grilled tomato on top as well. Forget about it. <laughs> go there and forget about it. Good, the huh? Sauce. Yeah, the sauce is really good. Cook the fish perfectly. What a delicious fish. Look at this sea bass. I want to hear that crack, that crunch. Ooh, a little dip. Oh my god, it's way better. It's so soft. Oh my god. Mm. Oh, so soft. I like this. Right? No. It's good, Abu. It gets, uh, gets your approval, Abu? It does. It does. Yeah. Mm. So soft and yummy. Huh? It's like a really buttery fish. I was <laughs> about to say, it feels like there's nice butter. Yeah. Mm. That sauce is phenomenal. Too. Sauce is amazing. This is, this is great, this is an amazing meal. All right, my friends, so we have left the restaurant. We're gonna continue our exploration of Nabilis right now. I'm very, very excited for it. I'm taking a, like a little drive. Oh, look, maybe it looks like peanuts or barbecue. Oh, uh, it's barbecued it's vegetables. Barbecue, yeah, it is. Look how busy it is out here. It's gonna be very cool to walk these streets and see what it's like. Oh, here, there's more stands here. What kind of stand is this? Oh, this is corn. You wanna go for it? No, no, I'm all good, I'm, I'm pretty full. I like that they have a TikTok account. Look at these shawarmas. Whoa. Toasty shawarma. Shawarma on every corner here. Chicken hut. I like the idea of chicken hut. Does it look for you guys a little bit at like the older older city area here? Nablus. You can see this. I mean, it's very reminiscent of Jerusalem. With the way the style of the buildings are. Very old looking. The Samaritan Museum here also, or that's pointing towards... Wow, we're like in the clouds. It's so cool. All right, so as we're driving across Nablus right now, we've come across a wedding and people are honking their horns. It's interesting, people are just honking their horns going down. Of course, when I start recording, they stop. <laughs> there you go, you're gonna hear that. So Abu was telling us this is celebratory honking. Sometimes younger people will join and just start honking too. <laughs> but if you want, we can go along. Look at this view of Nablus, guys, wow. Incredible. We got like a caravan of cars behind us that are part of a wedding party. Wow, look at that. Wow, dude. Wow, dude. Look at that, dude. That's a ball with the dome in the middle. Minaret. This is called a minaret. I remember that from Egypt. Listen to that. That's the last prayer for the evening. 8.30 p.m. And we're getting hummus sandwiches. I don't think I've ever gotten just a pita with hummus before. Really? Yeah, like just like buying one. I don't think I've ever done. Wow. I've eaten it at home before, but I've never bought like a pita with hummus. How much did that cost for three sandwiches? Seven and a half shakes. No wow. way. I'm joking. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That's really great. I know. That's the equivalent of what? Uh, two and a half bucks. Yeah. Wow. Look at that. Pita filled with hummus. All right, little quick roadside snack. Let's take a bite. Mm. It was great. Tastes like something my mom would have made me for school. You know, <laughs> I really love it. It's really good. I, I want to show you guys a little look here. Abu just driving us by. What it feels like the little America of Palestine and Nablus. Check this out. They've got a Hardee's, like <laughs> full-on Hardee's, and then right down here, there's like some food trucks. Look at that, a Husky. Look at that, there's a VW bus. And then a Popeyes and a freaking KFC. Look at that. In Nablus. In Nablus, I was not expecting this, Abu. Shocking, actually. KFC and Popeyes. 
All right, Abud, where have you brought us to? As Samaritans, we're not very famous for knowing uh, many restaurants. Yes. Uh, but my Palestinian friends always swear about this place, uh, sweets. Basically. Abu Sa'id? Abu Sa'id. Yeah. So we're coming to get some kanafe. One of the best sweets uh, in a uh, Nice. Look at this place. It looks gold. It's amazing. Yeah. So fancy. Oh my God, look at that. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Whoa, look at the ice cream flavor. Oh my God, look at this. You know what I love? What? Pistachios, bro. Yeah, same. This is some of the best looking baklava I've ever seen in my life. This is amazing. Look at how many sweets there are. Look at the knafe. Wow, look at this place. It's like a golden zone for desserts. Okay, so this is the knafe. Looks phenomenal. All right, Abud's getting us some uh, knafe here. It comes in like that, like nice squares on a plate. It's got that really stretchy cheese as well. Dude, this is the fanciest, like... <laughs> I'm getting excited in places I shouldn't be excited. This, my friend, is called Masab or Zena. One more time? The fingers of How? How do you say it? Zena. The fingers of Zena. Fingers of Zena. Exactly. Wow, that looks amazing. Yeah. Want to try it out? Yeah, I kind of... I kind of want to get a box of sweets for my family. So Musa's getting a box. This whole box was 120 or 70, something like that. Because we got the 10 extra shekel one that's like more expensive. Yeah, it's a beautiful box. Shukran. Wow, look at that. Woo, we just got the knafe. I'm so excited, look at this. Look at how much oil is seeping out of this. That looks good, I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm so excited for this. this is my first try of Palestinian kanafe here in Nablus. Look at that. Oh my god. Oh my god, look at that stretch, it's not ending. Whoa. It's gonna be good. Also, this is the most different kanafe I've ever seen in my life. It's like a like a flour rather than a noodle. Okay, let's wow, it smells amazing. It smells like buttered popcorn. Oh my god, it's so good. Look at that guy. They say that it's also like a little bit salty and a little bit sweet. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect combination. This is different than any knafe I've ever had. In my, I've had quite a bit of knafe, especially on this channel. Oh my god, this is the most different knafe I've ever had in my life. Well, this is the where it originated. Mm. Better be good. It's so good. Wow. That's legit right there. That is grade A. <laughs> That's damn good, no? That is wow. damn good, my boy. That is so good. It's just a flavor blast. Complete flavor blast. You got sweet, sour, everything on here. Wow. Also, like, yeah, look at this water. Look how they... This is like water that they bring you out in an airplane. I really like this. It makes me feel like a little kid in school. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I got that on camera. That's great. <laughs> Oh, that's a good rib. Dude, that's unbelievable. And that's a really high quality knafe for six shekel each. That's unheard of. That's like insane, actually. So cheap. That's awesome. This place was fantastic. Abu Sayyid. Look at this beautiful corn stand. Oh, they sell uh, fava beans. That's awesome. Wow. That's amazing. So busy out here on the street, too. All right, so we're continuing this little walking experience here in uh, Nablus at night. It's exciting to see the uh, how busy it actually is. This is a Saturday night. We got cars everywhere. People hustling, people bustling. There's, there's a side of me who wants to indulge in every single food that we walk by here just because I don't know when the next time in my life is going to be when I'm back in Nablus. And I want to try everything, but I'm so full. <laughs> like, I can't. <laughs> But it's just one of those feelings of just like wanting everything that I smell over here. Right, some nice merch you got you're rocking over here. Yeah, yeah. Look at him. You can get one so, yourself too. Oh, what's this? Like, Barbecue? Like, uh, one sikh. Oh, like a kebab? Yeah. Oh, kebab. Hey. Kebab. It is actually kebab. Right? It is just kebab. Right. Cool. I wasn't sure. I smelled kebab, but I wasn't 100% sure. It looked a little different than the kebabs I've had in the past. Yeah. It was like, I was like, kebab? He's like, yeah, kebab. <laughs> what do you think? What else is it going to be? <laughs> Here's a look at a Palestinian ambulance here in Nablus. 
Kabbalan taxi. Let's say you wanted to take a taxi from here to where we parked the car, which is what, like uh, two minutes, right? Yeah. How would that cost in Israel? In Israel, at a baseline, that drive would probably cost at least like, I don't know, maybe 15 shekels? Right, so here it's two shekels. Two shekels. Yeah. We're in one of the most notorious Palestinian cities. So obviously there's going to be some art here about the conflict. So this looks like, if I could tell, this is either the old city here or the old city in Jerusalem. That's the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, Dome of the Rock. I'm assuming that's an Israeli tank. And then we've got, this is a recent reporter that was killed by the Israeli army. I don't remember her full name. I don't mean to be doing injustice, but I remember this was something that happened recently. Is this Abu? Is this like a high street here? Is this considered like a like a big uh, main street in yeah. Nablus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, this is one main street. For yeah. Sure. See the Arab bank here. Is uh is the Saturday night as well like a pop and night to be out in town or is it? It's one more busy night, but not like Thursday. No, Thursday is the bigger nights. Oh yo yo, you want to see really something really cool? Yes, always. So you see that place over there? It's called the Green Hill. So what's cool about it is that they love Samaritans and they kind of like did this kind of like almost like kind of like a sponsorship. They did a sukkah, a Samaritan sukkah inside. Really? People have no idea what it is. It went, like the one you saw in the museum? In the museum. Like there. You want to see it? Yeah. yeah. So what is this? A supermarket? It's a supermarket. It's I thought it was a fried to... chicken shop because of the chicken. Well, they do they have do. chicken there. But... Most, you know what that chicken is? <laughs> I just realized what that oh chicken is. Oh my gosh, is. should I know what it is It's too. Mama Off, it's bro. Mama. No way. Yeah, 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 it's a product. It's a famous character, really? It's yeah. a that's my favorite like freezer chicken. Yeah, wow, look at that. That's amazing. This is a little look at a Samaritan uh sukkah in Nablus. How cool is that? Oh look, do they have dragon fruit? Oh yeah, that thing. Uh grape leaves. That's a, like a pitted eggplant, yeah. I'm I'm kinda of at odds of how many Israeli products there are here. Oh yeah. I'm kinda of shocked. There's a lot. Yeah. Oh wow, these I haven't seen. I love these. These are great. I have Cadbury chocolates in Israel also. It's unbelievable to me how in like one night how much can change in my mind. It's like, you know, my only impressions of Nablus have been on the news from a very outside perspective or seeing it on Instagram. Never seeing it like this alive and thriving. With people happily walking across the street, lights everywhere. It's actually it's very, very exciting to see it like this. Super cool on supermarkets like this is a 24 hour service center it's shocking and amazing at the same time you know this whole experience this whole trip has been very eye-opening seeing you know palestinian areas like this for the first time in my life on the ground it's exciting look at this this is a mercedes g-class wagon look at that this is a really fancy car that's awesome that's what i'm used to seeing in miami beautiful vehicle i like this little thing and I like that it has a New York license plate. <laughs> I saw this earlier. This also, there's a child driving it. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a child driving. <laughs> this is really happening. <laughs> I love it. It went. Wow. It, it got better and better. It was like, oh, small car, <laughs> New York license plate, child driving. <laughs> oh my god. PUBG snack. I really like this. There's a lot of little snack stands everywhere. Abu, do you know what that is? The entrance of, or is that just an entrance to the neighborhood? Basically, for a shahid. For Shahid. Yeah, um, a pallet for a Shahid. His name is Yusuf Sunnah. So it's basically like an honor, honoring of a Shahid. It's a place okay. honoring a Shahid. So. Okay. We had the beautiful Dr. Hot Dogs. Some really nice designs here at the stores, too. These stores are actually like beautiful. Really good lighting. Really nice design everywhere. Very modern, you know? Like this flooring is beautiful. It must be like brand new. It's cool. It's like an outlet store for uh, sporting goods. This is pretty great, too. Look at these little coffee stands. This is awesome. Look, they got a dragon fruit, fruit juice. Yeah, I would not mind if we found a, a cheap juice place. I would not mind a fruit juice right now. We can't get it. We can go on the way back. Cool, that would be but sweet. Save time. We can get a taxi to take us out to the car. Oh yeah, that'd be great actually. Let's do it. No, we just want to grab a taxi. None of my wildest dreams would I imagine I'd be in a taxi in Nablus. <laughs> this is so crazy. <laughs> like, I know it's just people living their normal lives, but this is so fascinating to me. It's so cool. This will be the most famous taxi in Nablus. <laughs> <laughs> Shukran. Shukran. Abud, how much was that? How much was that? That was like two shekels. Two shekels. It's unbelievable. Mango, yeah, mango sounds good to me. So we got Pirate Shawarma, CPR Mobile, and then we've got this beautiful Mandolina place, which has a Volkswagen bus on the inside. That's so awesome. You see, originally it was a food truck. 
Yeah. Then they kind of expanded and they made a store that has a food truck. That's so cool. They just shoved the truck inside. We can try this one? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's so good. Oh, my God. Wow. It's the same thing. No, it's different. Wow. Very good. That's amazing. This is such a cool concept for a shop. I love it. It's exactly what I was looking for. The flavor that we had is perfect. And I love, man, the Volkswagen bus is one of my favorite vehicles on planet Earth. This is so cool. Okay, wait, we're guessing the price right now? Usually the price like this would be 30. 30 or 40 check out. 30 for a large. 30 for a large. Yeah. I'm going to guess it costs around 10, 10 each. 10 each for the large one? Yeah. For the medium ones? Uh, yeah, 15 for medium. 15 medium. That's pretty good. It's really good. All right, we got our shakes. Three shakes for 45. Really not a bad deal. Actually, pretty amazing deal. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers my boys. Mm. Blueberry is really good. Wow. Can I try yours? You're very blueberry. You want to try this one? Yeah. That's like the one that we have before. Mm. It's good. Absolutely amazing. Wow. I don't think I've ever had a blueberry passion fruit shake until right now. Great way to finish off the night here in Nablus. That's beautiful. Shakes in a view. That's like a really beautiful city from up above. It's gorgeous. All right, the adventure with Abud is over. Uh, that's Abud over there. He's going home. Make sure that you subscribe to his YouTube channel. We are heading back into the car now. And that is because we are leaving the West Bank back to Jerusalem. We now have about a two-hour drive in the yep. darkness through the West Bank in some, uh, I don't want to say dangerous, but like definitely not safe for Israelis uh, areas, which will be exciting. So we're gonna we're gonna pass through them and uh, try to get back to Jerusalem, hopefully inshallah in one piece. That's the goal. I do want to say right now, thank you so much to Abu for touring us around Nablus. This such an amazing experience for us as two Israeli Jews to be inside of that city is a very special experience, and I don't take that for granted at all. I don't know how amazing well, that was for you, but very very amazing. That was uh, that was incredible for me. I really really enjoyed it. So we're gonna route back home now. Uh, hopefully we'll get to Jerusalem in one piece. Make sure you also check out Abud's information down below in the description. He's also a tour guide. He also has his own YouTube channel and he's an amazing guy overall. If you ever come to this area of Israel and you want to hang out with him, you can find him down below in the description. Let's hit the road and get back to Jerusalem. All right, so our first uh, stop through is in this uh, Palestinian town of Huwara. We actually passed through here on the way up. Supposedly it's very peaceful with no problems. So we should be fine. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, a, it's always an interesting experience to pass through these areas in an Israeli marked vehicle in the middle of the night. Wow, is that like uh Oh, that one? Is that KFC? Oh, that one? Oh, we're just wow. saying that it's KFC. We're not actually gonna- We don't need to stop there. No, absolutely not. It's not like I wanted to or anything. No. So this is Tzomit Tepuach, also known as Tepuach Junction. One of the most notorious places in Israel. It looks like a war zone, which it is technically. You got people hitchhiking, you got soldiers, you got barbed wire, checkpoints, people being held up. There's an army Humvee right there. You've got uh, signs for uh, Bibi Netanyahu's Likud party, which is like the right wing party of Israel plastered everywhere. And this is just like a big line waiting for a checkpoint to get into Nablus, I guess, which is kind of weird. But the Czech people going into Nablus. Yeah, look at that. Wow, that's a huge line, Jesus. Wow, that's crazy. I'm happy we are not going in right now. We are in the city of Ramallah today and I am joined by a friend of mine, Corey. Hi. Corey, How can are you, you tell the people actually what you do? Because I, I want to, I don't want to snub it. Sure, sure, sure. For those who don't know, um, I'm Corey Gilschuster. I have a YouTube channel called The Ask Project, where um, I ask Israelis and Palestinians questions that you, the viewers, send in to me. And we're here in Ramallah to ask questions. And I have, I've literally been watching Corey for, I think, the better part of eight years now. A uh, very long time. I've loved the channel. I've really believed in the message. It's super, super cool. Just like hearing and learning about people. So I'm actually doing a little bit of a follow along today. It's kind of like a buddy cop movie where I'm going to I'm gonna see what he actually does. <laughs> and we're actually going to explore the city. I'm really, really fascinated by it. So let's head in and see what we find. Who are we actually going to meet right now? We are meeting my translator known on uh, YouTube as Mona Meek. She is Palestinian and she translates uh, for me for years, actually. She's an amazing translator. So mm -hmm. If you need translation, she's your... She's your gal. And obviously due to the, you know, there's a, there's some sensitivity to everything that we do here. She won't be on camera. We won't be filming her at all. You yeah. might hear her voice here and there. Yeah. But if you want to hear her voice, especially in the translation, 
department, you can go over to Corey's channel right now. And I highly recommend you go anyways to check out the channel because it's amazing. The reason you won't see her and you don't see her is I don't want people misinterpreting her involvement in this or me hiring her as normalization. There's this concept of normalization amongst Palestinians of anything related to Israel, recognizing Israel in any way is called normalization. Mm -hmm. it is, this is not a normalization project. This is about understanding each side as much as possible, challenging each side as much as possible. Uh, and I hire her as a translator and I don't want her getting into trouble if somebody misinterprets what I do. Well, they, they can blame me. That's okay. The beautiful thing I, I think about your project is exactly that. It's just learning. It's a learning experience. So cool walking around with Corey. He's like a pro here. He's been here like a million times. Look at this big moss. We're checking out right now. I should also mention it was an early morning here in Ramallah. We drove from Jerusalem. Actually, we started our morning in Tel Aviv. We took a van bus to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem we hopped on a public bus to get here. And it's a Saturday morning today. Very, very exciting to see this place early in the morning. So we're in Ramallah. I have a list of questions. This is how I do things, by the way. I bring a list of questions. I ask one or two people in mm -hmm. each place. We're just going to go randomly find people. I sometimes ask my translator or the person with me to just pick a random person who they think would be an interesting someone to know their opinion. All these questions on the sheet, these are all things that are brought to you by viewers, right? By viewers, yes. Viewers and patrons, questions. right? These are patrons right. to your channel. That's right. So that's so cool because it's not Corey that's coming up with these questions. This is the people who want to know these things. Yeah. So sometimes what I have to do is people ask questions in a very like American or European way. I have to change the question a bit so people, um, Palestinians or Israeli people understand the question. But other than that, the, the core of the questions is what people ask them. Cool. So should we head out into the we streets are. and do this? I'm going to put in bits and pieces so you guys understand, but I want you guys to go ahead. Just kind of think about it of a collaboration. Go to his channel and watch this video. Uh, who knows when it'll actually come out. It might yeah, it takes a while. A while. Now. It takes a while, but there's already a thousand something videos, a thousand questions that I've asked uh, Palestinians and Israelis. And a lot of them are super years. interesting. They're like really, really deep topics. So go ahead, but I'll show you guys bits and pieces in this video, but definitely go to his channel to check it out. How do you explain that there's so much Jewish history here that they find through archeological finds? <laughs> Okay. Uh, but do you um do you recognize that there was Jewish sovereignty here along? So we're going to go buy um, little bis uh, uh, cookies, uh -huh. I what they're called, lotus cookies, um, and it's a good way to just give either bribe people to speak or to give them a little prize after. It just leaves them with a, with a nice uh, feeling after they've answered questions. And you just interviewed like your first person for the day. That was like our first person that we found yeah. on the street. Usually do you get so lucky with getting somebody who answers so... No. It's hard to find people who have an opinion uh, and have thought about these things before and he obviously uh -huh. had done that. So right. that was great. What is a Shaheed? Overpopulation in Palestine. So it's not the overpopulation or the density of population, it's because of there not being work opportunities. Sometimes I sense people are really hesitant to answer. So I'll ask a more general question, yeah, yeah. a nicer question. <laughs> and then if they answer it well, maybe I'll get into like a, a, a harder, what they would term as a more political question. Yeah. But it depends. It depends on who I noticed are. that lady was a little bit hesitant from the beginning. Yeah. So you like, like right, let me give her well. an easy question, yeah, see yeah. how she answers. Exactly. It's interesting the psychology behind it, because you really have to be dynamic with this, no? Yes, exactly. Because well. I don't want to, you know, because chances are if I asked her two political questions, she'd go, no, 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 right. walk away. Right. So, wow. So this is amazing. I can't believe we found a Popeyes. I saw one of these in Nablus, which was so exciting, but like right across the street, they have a KFC, a Pizza Hut, and a Popeyes. That's so cool. How cool is Palestinian Popeyes? It says Yala Popeyes. I love that. 
what should happen to someone who insults the Prophet? If So this is something that should happen, honestly. We shouldn't offend him, we shouldn't insult him or say some bad things about him. This person should be punished. So I said, what kind of punishment? She said something, a punishment that would be severe according uh, to the person that, that insulted them so that they won't do it again. Because if the punishment is light, people will do will do this. Is the punishment imply also violence? Uh, I have numbers next to how many to ask in each place. So right. the idea is, I don't want to be accused of asking too many people in the same place the same question. Right. Because then people say, ah, well, you only ask people in Tel Aviv or in Ramallah. Well, of course you're getting that answer. Or the opposite, so like a more conservative answer. And the truth is, I don't find there's any difference anywhere, even in Tel Aviv. I don't find them that liberal about certain things. Um, but still, I want to, in each video, it to be at least three or four different places when possible. If someone comes here from Morocco or the Emirates, would they be welcome? Yes? Okay, even though they normalized with Israel? So, in some cases, so there are differences. If the government normalized, the people don't necessarily have to normalize. Do you think the government, is, the Israeli government, is spying on you? I don't care about that. I okay. never thought about it. Okay. I don't think so. I never thought about that because I'm. We do the uh, right. I, I'm an ordinary people, so we don't have to to take care about these things. Just discussing getting like extreme answers. What we would, you know, meaning because look, to be Americans. fair, there was there was a question yes, there, and I don't want to give my input too much because this is yeah. a, it's a difference in culture. But there was a girl there who looked very unassuming that he interviewed. She looked like very modern. She's in a big city. So we, I asked if you insult the prophet, what should happen? violence, death, and she said yes, and she looks so sweet and nice. So for us as Westerners, this seems shocking. Right. And sometimes uh, my reaction, you can't tell because I'm behind the camera, is I'm like, ah, crap, really? <laughs> like, another one? And everyone claims that I'm, I'm, I'm purposely finding extremists. I'm not. These are she, regular she's people. A, she's a 20 year old. Me and, and she's a 23. Me and my colleague here were kind of shocked. You didn't expect that. I was personally shocked she by that. She studies in a, like, in in a museum, top in university. A and she's, she's an architect. Like, so he's asking, how much is that what she has to answer publicly? Yeah, that's what I'm and how much is the belief? In my opinion, this is something that she believed in. Because really? She, yeah, because she used her own words. Nothing formal, nothing fancy. You can feel that it was really heartfelt. Like the way she looked at me, right, right. she stood at us. That's why it was shocking to us. Oh, even to you yeah, as well? Yeah, okay. I guess okay. Like, the key is you just and this you is can't a judge a book by its cover. Wanna, like, yeah. You have no idea. Yeah. So if it looks think. like more modern or less she religious, look, yeah. like it doesn't doesn't matter. Doesn't you never yes. know. Exactly. Wow. You know, it's helping with like, education. You know, would be great. Like meaning funding the universities yeah, or funding scholarships. You know, scholarships. Right. So I don't want to get when I was in English. Is Islam more similar to Judaism or Christianity? So we've come into like a random strip mall seemingly, yeah. but there's a reason for it. So there's a bunch of them and this just happens to be a place where, I don't know why, but the people are from villages around Ramallah, they're not from, or they're from other cities. Um, it's also near the bus station that goes to other cities, so maybe that's part of it. And it's a cheat for me, so I don't have to go to small villages to ask questions. Uh, they come here and then we can ask random people. It's crazy to me how well you know Ramallah. You know it really well, no? Sort of. All right, so we found a little street food cart. This thing looks like a giant falafel, and I'm really interested in it. It's a giant falafel ball. So this is called kak. Kak. Which I think the word cake comes from it. 
I think. I don't know. We have to look up look the how etymology. This is. It's a giant falafel ball. So there's a giant cart here selling all this stuff. This mm -hmm. fresh falafel. It's not um, hot anymore. Yeah, it's good though. Yeah. It's dry, mm -hmm. but it's really good. Like the flavor is good. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna try this little sweet bread thingy. I think it's got some date spread inside of it. For any Palestinians watching, let me know again, please, what's the name. I don't know what it is. Maybe it has a traditional name. It's pretty good. Maybe with a little bit of butter. Could be yummy. We're approaching Minara Square, which uh -huh. is one of the main squares of, of uh, Ramallah. Uh, and it's uh, famous because of the lions in the center, which is a symbol of this area. Um, and there's a we, La, we are Ramallah sign. Oh, nice, yeah. These lions were actually destroyed by somebody, uh, an unhappy Palestinian, uh, a couple of months ago, and with a sledgehammer. Really? He was very unhappy, and I don't remember the reasons, but he was uh, frustrated with something to do with Palestinian uh, government. What is it? Coffee? Arrug. Juice. 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 Fresh. Juice? Okay, one. Fresh. Fresh carob juice. Don't they use carob as like vegan chocolate? Isn't that... But if you've ever smelled a, a carob tree when it's flowering, it smells like semen. Whoa, that's so good. But it's good. Yeah. It doesn't taste like semen. I can attest this does not taste like semen. It doesn't taste anything like semen. Not that I not that I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh my god, it's ridiculously sweet. It's like syrup sweet. Oh, it's so good. Wow, that's I don't know if I can drink this whole thing. I'm gonna get that. Look at diabetes from this. Exactly. So this is a big square, Manar Square, he said, right? Yeah. And of course we have the We Ramallah sign. Mm -hmm. Al Manar Square. Why are you happy? Because I live in... Okay. The way you think, you can turn everything negative uh -huh. to positive and move on. Okay. So you're just a positive person? Yes. Okay. Oh my okay, god, yeah. top shawarma. It smells so good here. Yeah. Wow. Like I want to I want to get it, but I don't need shawarma. I, I want to go a little bit more exotic. I've, I've been having shawarma every day yes. for the last 3 months. I need we're, something a little bit more We're going to look for something a little more interesting than yeah, shawarma. Something a little more local, you yeah. know. Yeah. Like we're shawarma is obviously that. Palestinian as well, but it's like it's also Arab in general. Yeah. It's a whole the whole region here. So I definitely want to try to find something a little bit more exotic to show you guys on camera. Like maybe potentially Popeyes? That's kind of exotic. That's pretty exotic. <laughs> Popeyes Obsession. chicken sandwich. Could be a... But I will try his Popeyes chicken sandwich because I've never had it. Could be a good shake. I just wanted to show this off because it's an interesting thing, obviously, for the two of us being wherever we're from. Yeah. This is just like a coffee stand. But on the coffee stand, maybe you know better how to explain this. These are well, these shahids, are posters right? these are shahids of, of martyrs for the Palestinian cause. Right. Which means usually, I mean, I don't know these people, but they have guns. So I'm assuming... They were involved in what we would call terrorist attacks, uh, terrorism against either Israeli soldiers or Israeli civilians, and they were killed while they were doing that, right. usually. There are, of course, cases of Palestinian civilians being killed, yeah. of course. Which also will end up being Shahid. Which are also Shahids, yeah. depending on how it's contextualized in Palestinian mind. But most of these are usually known fighters. It's understood right. that they are known fighters. But yeah, there's there's usually a seal, there's usually a picture near the Al-Aqsa Mosque or the Temple Mount. Yeah, so the perception is that anybody who's in an Israeli jail uh, outside, by Palestinians, or outside people, uh, are he's a political prisoner, meaning he gave a political opinion. It, um, Israelis, I don't know very many people who are actually what you would call political prisoner in that they said something. Almost everybody in Israeli jails, from my knowledge, committed, either tried to or did commit violent acts either against soldiers, which some people may say is legitimate, or against civilians, which I think most people would say is illegitimate outside. But uh, that's my understanding of the about 5,000 political or prisoners in Israeli jails who are Palestinian. And this is common. I've seen this around many of the Palestinian cities. I've been to like Bethlehem and Nablus. Like you will see pictures and photos and, and, and like uh, posters of Shahids yeah. in businesses, on the yeah. streets, wherever it be. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's always an interesting thing. It's a, a major component of their culture. Yeah. Of the idea of the Shaheed, the person who dies for the cause of Palestine, or who's in prison for the cause of Palestine. Right. So we came into this uh, Lukum store, which is like a Turkish delight store. Mm -hmm. Look at this. We got a bunch of Turkish delights. This, I'm just getting a couple pieces of this. It's like blue. I don't even know what this could be. It looks amazing. This one's like a transparent orange. That one looks like apricot, but the blue has no idea. Ooh, apricot could be good. The blue, I have no idea what it could be. 
Look how beautiful the selection of what, what is this? Turkish delight it is. It's amazing. Nine that was $2? Uh, yeah, two, three dollars. Are you $3? kidding me? On the yeah, other $2. side. That yeah. would have been like, I don't know, 30? Yeah, 20, that. 30? Yeah. Whoa, that's yeah. insane. I, I heard, she said nine. I was like, no, nine? Yeah, not everything is that much cheaper here, but something's very, yeah. That's definitely. awesome. And this is like, a, it was a very nice looking brand too of, uh, of Lukum. I'm excited about that. Yeah. Wow, look at this place. Which one is the best? Here's with the green zaka. I don't even know. I kind of want to get something. This is super local, huh? Yeah, these are delicious. I love this. This is just called the Palestine. Look at that one. What is it? It's literally just called Cheese, the Palestine. Cheese, tomato, mint. 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 I'm a, kind of interested in this one. Armenian. Yep. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Wow. 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 Yeah. It's so nice. Yeah, thank you. Wow. Welcome anytime. Thank you. Okay, we take Palestine. Try this. Oh, what is this one? Try Cheese. Cheese? Yeah. Here, here cheese, you go, brother. Palestinian, yeah. Okay, we try. Cheese, white cheese. Mmm. Yeah. Wow. Very good. Two Israeli Jews were trying Palestine. That's the name <laughs> of, the, of the. All right, rip us off a little piece of Palestine. Okay. We got to get some cheese in that. This is amazing clickbait. Okay, I'm gonna have this. It's really similar to this. Yeah. Supposedly with mint. With mint. I don't taste the mint yet. No. Here's the Palestine. I'm gonna try to just bite it like this. Go ahead. Mm. Oh, amazing. It's got some black sesame on top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar to what we just had. Yeah. But, oh, so delicious. Wow, that is yummy. The bread is amazing. Palestine, very good. Mm -hmm. An Israeli Jew gives an approval of Palestine. That's, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that, that's good. That could make peace right there. <laughs> it's a little look for you guys at a Palestinian bank. Yeah. Jawel. So that's their uh, uh, cell phone. Oh, that's, I thought it was a bank. No, no, it's a cell phone. Oh, okay. okay. Kitani is the name of a uh, electronic store. It's all it's in Jerusalem, Ramallah. And oh else. wow! But it's it's big in Palestine. There you go. And they are they are uh, authorized resellers. Of, uh, authorized uh, Apple uh, resellers. I also wanted to show this off. They got some they got some different snacks here yeah. too. These are like Palestinian snacks made in Egypt. Oh, okay. So the Egyptians. What's interesting is like the Rambo chips. Look at the Rambo chips. Yeah. Some language we don't understand. Yeah, that's interesting that that's there. There you go. A little look at a Palestinian supermarket slash snack shop. Corey was saying we're entering now the Christian neighborhood. Is yeah. it still Christian though? It's mostly, I don't think it's only, but uh -huh. it's, it's, it's known to be uh, Christian. We're gonna go in. There's some churches we can go to. Oh cool, that'd be cool. Yeah, and I have some questions for specifically for Christian Palestinians. Nice. We really can't be open about who no. we are or where we're coming from in this, in yes. this place. Yes. Even no matter what our, our views are yeah. about Palestinians, and I can safely say we very much support Palestinians. Mm -hmm. um, just the fact that we have citizenship on the other side um, makes us suspicious. But it is interesting because I'm seeing cars with Israeli license because plates. Because they're, they're, they're Arab Israelis. Who come in here. Muslim, who come here. Yeah. yeah. yeah they come also, here. look at this car for a second. Oh, uh, cool. A Vox, Vox Hall. That's so, I didn't even notice it. So cool. That is cool. And it's got like a legit Palestinian license plate. It's freaking awesome. It's like a vintage collectible. Ramallah Martyrs Martyr, so Memorial. Martyrs of Ramallah and a martyr obviously is uh, a Shaheed. Like we somebody spoke about earlier. We were, I was asking about it. So a Shaheed is obviously somebody who dies in battle for Palestine. They're trying to regain Palestine. Um, and by Palestine, it's usually, most people uh, define that as what is Israel today. So yeah. Jaffa, Haifa. Akko, so that's usually how they define it. So to be clear, like we're not talking about the West Bank yeah. or Gaza. Like that's we're right. talking They're about not, the, the occupation to most uh, Palestinians means all of what is today Israel. Like the modern state of Israel as a yeah. whole. Yeah. And liberating Palestine is liberating the entire country. That's right. So, For most people. Yeah. Some will agree to compromise on 67 borders, um, but they still recognize that the other side, the Israeli side, as Palestine, but they're willing for the sake of peace to find a compromise, but it's the minority opinion and mostly with older people. It's a little weirdly mixed message. So there's like, you know, the, the dove of peace and the going back, I see, assume that that's symbolic of going back, the return, like the horse and going back to Palestine, the, the villages of 1948. Um, and then someone who died for the cause. There's a, there's some weird, yeah, you know, contradictions and all that, in my opinion, I'm Canadian. So anything violent <laughs> to me is a little, I don't know. Uncomfortable. We're also entering the Christian quarter or the Christian area right Christian as area? Yeah. right as the Muslim call to prayer is happening yes. here in the background. We're on a bit of a mission right now. A Palestinian friend of mine two days ago told me that there's Palestinian breweries and beer. Yep. And I really love trying beer around the world wherever I travel to. 
So we're on the lookout for Al, Al Taibe, I think it's called, right? Uh, Taibe beer. Taibe beer, which is a local brewery apparently really close to Ramallah. It's an interesting falafel. Oh, shepherd's. shepherd's beer. Look, another Palestinian beer. Handcrafted beer. Oh, Korean interesting. Pa product of Palestine. That's wow, cool. that's interesting. So we're on our way to search for beer. <laughs> Not an easy thing in A little in bit Palestine. of day, day drinking in Ramallah. In a, right? in a Palestinian Muslim place, yeah. there are very few places that allow you... There are stores that sell alcohol. Yeah. Only Christians are allowed to sell alcohol. Um, and we are looking for like a bar, an actual place you could just sit and have a beer. And there aren't very many. So we're looking for a place. Yeah, a Palestinian friend of mine from the West Bank told me I gotta try Taipei, so it's good. They actually told me that right around this time of year, they actually do a whole beer festival, like an Oktoberfest. Outside of Ramallah, it's yes. a Taibe festival. Yes. It was canceled for a few years because it was considered inappropriate. Oh, really? By Palestinians. It was big for a while. Mm -hmm. And then when, from, from what I remember, don't quote me on this, I could get it wrong, a lot of Israelis were coming. Yes, you told me Which the Christians that. didn't mind. Yeah. And Palestinian Muslims were a little uncomfortable with this, so they said the whole thing is inappropriate. Yeah. And I don't know if it started back again. I think it's an excellent idea. Just yeah. for tourism. It's amazing. Oh, and bridging gaps? Yeah. Oh, it's Who, amazing. It's the best way to bridge gaps drunk. <laughs> the best way to do it. Get everybody drunk. Sorry, Muslims. <laughs> sorry. But um, I've been to Taibe. It's the only fully Christian village left in Palestine. Really? Yes. Because Muslims uh, have moved to uh, other villages which uh -huh. were traditionally Christian. And uh, so it's the only place that is still Christian. They won't sell land to uh, Muslims either, or Jews for that matter. Oh, it's just um, Because it's Christian. trying to keep it Christian. Yeah, they I feel, and, and understandably, I get it. They feel, although, you know, the democratic side of me is like, come on, anyone should be able to buy land anywhere. But um, I kind of get when you're a minority and you feel a little bit overwhelmed by the majority. So I, I kind of get it. Now, I have an interesting thing to point out. Mm -hmm. Those guys, the, first the guy that we spoke to, yep. and the other two guys that were smoking shisha next to him, uh -huh. did those guys not look awfully Ashkenazi Jewish to you? <laughs> I was looking at them and I was like, yeah. I don't know if this happens to you when you're interviewing yeah, yeah. Palestinians. Sometimes I, I see Palestinians, I'm like, some Palestinians look very Jewish. Like, yeah. those guys, I well, would... not typically Middle Eastern, not yeah, dark like, skin. And I would say that overall, my perception is that Palestinians tend to be a bit darker than Israelis, uh -huh. but not by much. And it's very funny how Palestinians who are very light skinned will look at even Moroccan Israelis and go, ah, oh, they're from Europe. And I'm like, no, you guys look the same. You all look the same. I don't know what you're talking about. Now the cultures are very different, that I guess, but in terms of looks, it's pretty people similar. kind of look the same. Yeah. It's not that different. Yeah. So here's another giant, we are Ramallah sign. We Ramallah. So this is the city hall over here. Ramallah right down city there. Hall, and it's like a community center. And it's surrounded by sort of fancier Western type restaurants where mm -hmm. you would get, where I go, for cheeseburgers. Because <laughs> I love the cheeseburger. Um, and you get more Western food. It's our, You can find some things that are Palestinian, but it's more where the, um, the uh, wealthier Palestinians eat and a lot of foreigners. Mm -hmm. Um, and I kind of make fun of them because why would you come to Palestine and just eat here? But I'm in Hardy, <laughs> so I shouldn't speak. We're going to check out this place called Stones to see because I don't know how I feel about trying to down a beer in a shop. Like, yeah, it's a little weird. And yeah. it's not appropriate to drink it on the street. So that's why I'm like, maybe maybe we'll just check it out in here. This is an interesting place. We've definitely come up into a little, you know, this is a goal of uh, exploring Ramallah in a day. We're trying to show you guys not just the local spots, but also this is a little more fancy, I would say. It's definitely a lot more fancy. Yeah, there's a, mostly in Ramallah, but there's a, like this in every Palestinian city. Mm -hmm. There are more you'd call Western Eye, you know, uh, type places. Yeah, and I'm excited to try type of beer, Palestinian beer. I didn't, I didn't think that existed until a couple days ago. We're trying out some type of beer right now. Oh, nice! They even have their own uh, cup for it. Type of the finest in the Middle East, golden beer, Christian Palestinian beer right here, brewed in Al Taibe. Wow, I love it. It's not too strong. I'm a basic bitch when it comes to beer. I love like a, just a normal classic wheat beer, and it's as as clean and as cut as it comes for a classic wheat beer. It's really, really good. It doesn't have any of the like punchiness that sometimes you get when you drink a beer. Like for example, a Corona, I would say. Like sometimes, just because it's probably have a long shelf life and it's sitting out for a long time in a bottle, sometimes it gives you a little punch when you drink it. This is just super crisp. I'm also sure it's right off the tap right now, so it's a lot better. Mm. I love it. It was great. And they give us some salted peanuts on the side. My beer is Coke Zero. It's my drug of choice. I have two drugs. Really good espresso, uh, like in a latte sort of thing. 
and Coke Zero. Oh, I love my Coke Zero. Amen. Uh, cheers. Cheers, okay. brother. Hi. <laughs> All right. Get a little controversial. I like to make Palestinians feel a little uncomfortable. I like to make Israelis feel a little uncomfortable, too. Don't worry. It's I don't cool. think there's anything more uncomfortable for people than watching two Israeli, Israeli Jews saying L'chaim, L'chaim over, over a Palestinian beer. beer. Yeah, sorry, guys. Sorry, Muslims. We like you, too. We do. It is what it is. We had to do it. Yeah. Mm. That's good. Love it. All right. Palestinian beer mission is over. So cool to have drinking right by the Ramallah City Hall. Here at Stones. So next up, we're going to be looking for some msachen, which is my favorite. It's become my favorite Palestinian dish to eat. Uh, we're told I got to try it in Ramallah as well. I've heard it's very good here. Uh, so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to be walking around the Christian Quarter, looking at cool stuff, but also trying to find some of that msachen. I'm very excited for it because it's going to be very delicious, I assume. If well, if any Arabs are in the comments, please let us know. So something happened in June 22nd, 2006. Yeah. What words are, the, are similar or the same in Hebrew and in Arabic? Like, should we say them in English or in English? Say them, say them in Hebrew. In Hebrew. Uh, wow. Can you think of any? A few, yeah. What? What are the same, the same <laughs> words? Or similar, right? Or similar or same, yeah. Like, salam and shalom, they're kind right. of similar. Yeah. yeah, but we don't use salam in Arabic. You don't? That's the original Arabic. Oh, oh, oh like Mark. okay. I just wanted to show this off. We just got some water. Two shekel each? Two shekels. Which yeah. is insane because I'm in, in Israel. It's a Coca Cola company. This yeah. is eight shekels in, in, and it's like $2 in Canada, $3 in Crazy. Canada. Crazy. Two shekels, 50 cents. So cheap. And I just wanted to review real quick. We just interviewed this seemingly looking hipster guy. And I asked him, do you want to expel all the Jews? And he said, yeah, basically. And he doesn't believe in a peace agreement because he thinks the Israelis want to expel him. And the reason, and then at the end, he started talking about how he's from Jerusalem, from Lifta. Lifta was a village at the entrance of Jerusalem when you're coming in from Tel Aviv, uh, which was depopulated in 1948. And it's still actually there. There's, it's one of the few uh, villages where there's still, it's still original. Um, and he got mad at me because I stopped recording when he was talking about Lifta. But I was like, well, that's not the answer to the question. It's just he wanted to talk about it. And then he got very paranoid that I'm an Israeli um, and that I was doing something mischievous, that's right. how it's framed in Islam, against the Palestinians. And I was like, eh, like I was trying to avoid saying I'm technically an Israeli citizen, but I'm not against the Palestinians. That's a funny thing. We were talking about this earlier. It's like you and I have to kind of be careful because when we pronounce words in Arabic yeah. or in Hebrew, sometimes it can be, yes. you'll, you'll immediately tell that we are from there from from the other side and their perception is therefore we must be against them which is not true it's not, not true, true at, all. at all part of the reason of making this video is to show actually the exact opposite is like i wish there was a reality where was, people yeah. like me and poor could come here freely and openly like, support local businesses yeah. eat enjoy yeah. dine have a good time at the end of the day we're just people you know when we don't talk about politics well it's you actually... said you said that on the way they said you said what a shame that we don't have an agreement where regular israelis who don't you know don't want bad things for Palestinians can't come here. And I, and I said, from my experience with Palestinians, most of them don't want that because it's a symbol of the occupation. Right. And they don't, so the idea of lo supporting local businesses, they don't seem to care. Some I'm sure do, but at least officially, publicly, they're gonna say no. They don't want Israelis here at all. Mm -hmm. Like that guy would be the guy. Yeah, he would not want. And he he seemingly on the outside, he got if I were to judge that book by a cover, yeah. he looked like a hippie. He looked like <laughs> total hippie peacenik. You would think he was. He had like, a Norwegian uh, Norse god, like Viking necklace, and he had dreadlocks. So I was like, his you know, wife had blue hair, which is really not. She's not in the video, but like, just stands out in Palestinian society. People do not have colored hair. Yeah, but then it goes. We harks back to that girl we saw earlier that said she would kill people if they insulted, if they the, insulted prophet. the prophet. Yeah. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, this is crazy. <laughs> All right, so Arabs and Palestinians generally really like fried chicken, which is something really cool because I'm American and I love fried chicken. So here's a little fried chicken spot. Got this for a chicken. Love the fried chicken. Oh, so jealous. Mm, it's good. Good? Yeah. We're gonna go to Popeye, so I'm gonna eat there. Yeah. Oh, very good. Great fried chicken for a check. I'm happy with that. That is yummy. Ah. The street is Shirin Abu yeah, Akhlet. That's yes. a new street? Yeah. Yes. It's a new street. Yeah, so since she uh, was killed. Yeah. Uh, so they named this street after her. They did that really quickly. That happened just a few months ago, right? Of course, of course, because she's an icon. For, yeah. for people who don't know, this is Shirin Abu Akhle was the journalist who was killed in, in Janine. Uh, Al Jazeera. Yeah, a couple months ago. 
She got shot by a uh, Israeli soldier. All right, we're heading back to where all good things start, Popeyes. Popeyes in Palestine. That is not something I expected to ever be saying. I've never had Popeyes. First time Popeyes. Yeah. Wow, looks phenomenal. Okay, they nailed the sandwich, I have to say. This is the wonderful thing about Popeyes, is having that crunchy, uh, sort of kernely fried chicken on the outside. He talks too much. <laughs> I'm a YouTuber, that's my job. How is it? Mm, good? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh really, really, god. yeah, tender chicken. Wow, mm. a little salty, but I'm okay with that. No, they nailed it. That's and mine's spicy, mine's really good. Wow, Palestinian Popeyes. This was nailed 10 out of 10. I would even say this honestly tastes better than the one in America. Wow, that's really good. Palestine, don't try Popeyes. Yeah, who knew? <laughs> Straight up, it's yeah. better than the US one. We, we are now in Cooper which leads to Kalandia refugee camp, which leads to Kalandia checkpoint, which leads to Jerusalem. So we're gonna walk. <laughs> Here we go. Salamu alaikum everyone and welcome to Kalandia, Kalandia refugee camp. Well, we're not actually, I don't know if this is technically Kalandia. We're about to enter Raqqa, it, or... We're gonna get towards it. Yeah. Another couple of so we're, we, we've been spending the day in uh, Ramallah, in the Palestinian city of Ramallah. This is uh, Corey Gil Schuster. He has an amazing channel called The Ask Project. You guys can check it out. I'll leave a link in the description. But basically, he goes around and he asks Israelis and Palestinians questions. Mm -hmm. And we had a pretty successful day today in Ramallah. Very successful, very good. Very yeah. uh, typical of what I go through. Yeah. Crazy stories we have. That was fun. And it's been, it was my first time in Ramallah. And now we're gonna be walking through this refugee camp and seeing, uh, well, I mean, we're both two Israeli Jews and yeah, we could get in a lot of shit for this. Yeah, we're not technically supposed to be here, but you know, the whole goal is to learn from the other side, and I think the only way that you can do that is on the ground. So, we're gonna take this brisk little walk. We got about 10, 15 minutes to the border with Israel, and then we can cross back in. But uh, I just want to show you guys what it actually looks like on the ground here. So, here we go, unfiltered, unedited, just raw. I'm gonna show you guys the whole experience going through here. And the Israelis, uh, the right wing people, are all gonna get mad that you called it a border. They're gonna be like, no, 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 this belongs to us too. Well, there's a border but, checkpoint, there's right? A checkpoint. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. I mean, I guess it's like it's a border for me. I'm not, I'm not trying to make any political statements with this video, by the way. This is just a human experience here. Yeah, they got a BMW of uh, Kalandia here. So, uh, Corey, in the past, you've told you've been here before, and you told me you've had problems with filming here. It's a little high tension here in Kufaraka, but it went mostly in the Kalandia refugee camp. People got very upset at the questions I was asking because I asked very challenging questions. Challenged the Palestinian narrative, challenged the Israeli narrative, of course. Um, and people felt very offended. And there was this idea in, from my first experience, in uh, refu Palestinian refugee camps of lawlessness in a sense, uh -huh. that people could take it in their own hands to not allow people to even come into their camp. And by camp, well, you'll see what that means soon. It's yeah. buildings, not tents. I've never been to a Palestinian refugee camp. The one thing that I do know about Palestinian refugee status is that the UN sort of labeled Palestinians as refugees in a lot of places around the world. And this is also part of them. And these camps are set up in part by the UN, right? With UN funding? Yeah, they're funded by the UN. So health and uh, schooling, education up to grade 12 is funded by the UN. It's an interesting construct because I, I always expect a tense, kind of like a tent city, but that's not the case at all. It's actually, I mean, it's densely populated, but it's actually pretty nice building. Be fair, yeah, we're not in the camp yet. That's true. This is where I was. I was. There was a wedding going on. It was right here. Uh -huh. And there was a guy with an M16 firing in the air. I have that video on YouTube. Wow. Well, um, so I can share it with you if you want. Yeah, that'd be cool. That was intense. No, actually, go to his channel and check it out. That's the main goal here. I think, public. I, think I use it oh. for, like, when people play. And Palestinians have no weapons. And I'm like, well, the guy in Kufaraka had an M16. So. <laughs> wow, look at these cool alleyways. Wow. Pastel Cosmetics. The logo is new meat. It's an Israeli um, HMO. Um, because you were explaining technically all of this yeah. is still Jerusalem, so right? Up until Kufar Akab is technically part of the Jerusalem municipal boundaries, but Jerusalem, the Israeli government, refuses to give services because it's across the checkpoint and it's chaos here. And for, I don't know how many, how much service the Ramallah or Palestinian government gives this area, but not much. You can see from garbage everywhere. As soon as you cross over into Ramallah, which is down there, suddenly it becomes a little cleaner. A lot cleaner, I would say. Uh, yeah. A lot cleaner. There's still garbage every so often. I mean, but there not is. Not as much. Yeah. And there's no here, like everything is just chaos. Yeah. Or feels like chaos. Anyway. 
So there you go. So Sama Medical Centers. Yeah, it's the and it's run by Israel. It's funded. It says Lumi. Funded, yeah. It says Lumi. Yeah. So Lumi is a Hebrew word for yeah. national. Right. So and here you go. This is something that we've been showing off in Ramallah in the last video. If you haven't watched it, but these are uh, pictures, posters the of the Shahids. Shahid. Yeah. Martyrs. We don't need to spend too much time, I think, lingering here, but there's there's like pictures or posters of them everywhere. Yeah. Have you ever done this? Have you ever walked across the border? Like this? Like walk to the checkpoint? Walk to, not the whole thing. Oh, that's I it. did right over here. Though. That's an interesting one. I want to show that one up. That's a cool one. That was a big uh, Shahid oh, poster. <laughs> uh, there was a mural once and it was all about Palestine. Now it's about like trees or uh -huh. something there, but I filmed that, but that's about it. We're going to be crossing past what is regarded to as the apartheid wall, right? At some point here, or we're not going to see sure that? Not. Yeah, you see a bit of a wall. Yeah. It's not like Bethlehem. It's a little bit different. Uh -huh. But yes, it's part of the extension of the wall fence. Uh, technically, 90% of that is, 90, is, is fence, not wall. But um, yes, anywhere you're around people, it's wall. I so. just want to clarify, by the way, when I said apartheid wall, that wasn't me taking a political stance for either side. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just what people regard it to. Yeah. I see it as a wall. I don't care how you call it. Yeah. That's just my personal standpoint. I, yeah, I also in my videos try to use um, the most internationally accepted phrasing. Yeah, and if it's known as an apartheid wall, it's yeah, that's, I'm okay. Yeah. It's fine, whatever. Um, I think this is Kalandia. We're now in Kalandia. This Pretty is it. Sure. We're in here. I'll see if I can read it anywhere. I should be able to recognize the words. I don't know where the actual start is because it kind of blends into each other. Yeah, it just it looks like it. Are we technically in Kalandia? Provide a real experience. Should we buy some carpets in Kalandia? Some Kalandia I carpets. Got a turkey. I got a turkey for that. <laughs> Might be better quality. Because they get the Iranian stuff. Yeah. Now, do you think do you think this line, like this traffic, is all trying to cross the, the checkpoint? No. So the problem is, we'll see soon. Yeah. Is that there's one, two lanes, and to the right it goes to the crossing for Jerusalem. So uh -huh. there's always cars with the yellow license plates trying to go to Jerusalem because they're Jerusalem residents, and then it it goes off to. Uh, the east and to Beth like to get to Bethlehem, uh -huh. for example. There are other places, but that, um, and so they get stuck at this area where it's uh, just traffic, and the traffic goes all the way back to Ramallah. So it can take a long time, mm. like twenty minutes, half an hour, just to just to cross back over. Just to cross, yeah. And are, are we going to be? From, are we expediting pretty... the process by walking across? Like no, no, because you can see the buses further. Ahead oh. of us, so no. The bus is still faster than us walking. I can see why this is very frustrating. The question is, what do you do? First of all, who's in charge of this area? Um, <laughs> the Israelis refuse to take responsibility for this area. The Palestinians refuse to take responsibility for this area. So and right then, even if somebody did, what's the plan? You have, uh, you have apartment buildings and stores up against the street. So how could you make this a wider a street to get from Ramallah to Jerusalem? So people, the residents of this place are genuinely screwed. Like they yeah. are just not in or a good- if you, Or if you live in Jerusalem, you're screwed. Right. Because you're always in traffic. It's dirty. Yeah, and if you're a resident here, it's disgusting. There's trash everywhere, which by the way, they throw their trash, but you know, still. Um, yeah, you're screwed. And nobody wants to take responsibility for it. There is, I gotta say, for this area, there's a lot of trash everywhere. It's very dirty, unfortunately. Yeah. Look at this car, this whole back window's busted. Oh yeah, it's a little sketchy. Calling <laughs> yeah. in holes. Yeah, these little, uh, looks like a subway grate. Uh, a wedding. Oh, it's a wedding. All right, it's not my first time around a Palestinian wedding. <laughs> That's cool. Wow, look at this rusted over garbage. Whoa, looks old too. Wow, it is chaotic out here. Really reminds me of the border crossing between Tijuana and San Diego. Yeah. Very similar. Oh, really? Whoa. Jeez. <laughs> oh my God. He's in a hurry. Got somewhere to go. I had to get some gas right now. Right, I'm running out. I might have been an impediment to him getting gas. That would have been an issue for me. What I do have to say is as much as Palestine or the Palestinian territories are their own place, the influence of Israel as a whole on here is massive. Like, there's so, like, even if you want to escape it, and again, I'm not taking a political take on this in any way, yeah, but even if you want to escape the conflict in a lot of ways, if you're here and you're living in here and you want to get away from it, you can. There's always going to be a reminder to you that Israel is a part of your life here. 
And if you despise Israel, for a lot of people, that's the reality. It's very interesting, you know, there's like, there's Israeli license plates everywhere, there's flags, there's Hebrew in a lot of places. It's an interesting dynamic, you know, it's very, very interesting. Look at this, this is cool. I don't know what this is, but it's cool. A little tea shop? Coffee shop? And he sells plants. I always respect people that sell plants. It's really cool. Okay. This is the wall? No, the wall that I, they had a mural. Oh, oh. About freeing Palestine. Uh-huh. Who covered it up, though? Israel? No. 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 Uh, my guess is, just guessing, but the UN, uh, people might have gotten criticism. For oh, here's some stuff. Uh, these are, here, this is more religious uh, Quranic stuff. Uh, but it was more about the story of Palestine, if I remember correctly. It was more about the story of Palestine, and of course, it was like about the return, the yeah. right of return for Palestinians. So. I mean, there's some, there's still some stuff here. I don't know if that, if this is anything to do with it, but my guess is yes. It's definitely a cool uh, Palestinian plaque. I really need to read Arabic better. I can't. I wish I could read it. Oh, there you go. Kalandia Camp Handicraft Cooperative. We saw these earlier. I remember we passed we passed by here earlier. Oh, here's like a memorial, probably for Shahids as well, right? Yeah. I don't yeah. know who they are. Maybe one of your viewers can tell us who they are. Yeah. I am sorry if I am walking fast. I definitely don't want to linger or draw any attention to myself uh, yeah, we're, here. We are told by Palestinians who are not from the camp that uh, a camp is very dangerous. Yeah. We're very uh, suspicious yeah. of anybody who would be filming. Yeah. And I get it. I, I also want to be like respectful towards the sensitivity of people living here. Like I, I definitely don't want to bother anybody with a camera. That's why I everything that you're seeing right now is being recorded with an iPhone. It's very like raw, basic, unedited, it doesn't feel like it's a camera. This is some, this is kind of what do the streets look like down the camp? One of many. Do you have any idea about like statistics of how many people are living per house here or no? No. You could look on uh, Wikipedia. Oh, I think that's a mosque in there, that's interesting. On Wikipedia you can find statistics for all these places. Yeah. Where, where are the people of this camp were from uh, originally and what's today Israel? So the people, the people of this camp is the people who got displaced. Place from okay. the 1948 war, which means 1947 to 1949. Right. What's known as the Nakba, right? For Palestinians, yeah. as the War of Independence for Jews. I oh. don't remember. I've read all this stuff, but I have no memory. So I don't remember exactly where they were from. Uh, my guess is, like, Jaffa area, mm -hmm. other parts of... Oh, that's interesting. Jerusalem. The road here, it's actually in Hebrew, the signs yeah, already. That's from the time when Israel controlled all this. Oh, wow. Pre... What was that thing? About 1990 something? Yeah. Fascinating so to be this here. This is an UNRWA school. There's a sign up here. And then it's just funded schools. They got their own way that they teach, right? A curriculum that they, they teach? They their own curriculum, yes. It is supposedly Czech internationally. Uh, Spoli, there's a lot of criticism for being very anti-Israel and anti-Jewish. Oh, it's anti a girl school. Yeah. It's Public girl school. This is the closest thing you can come to in this region as like the hood. This would be like the equivalent of the hood in the US. We're down Ramallah Road, Alley 216. Yeah, kind of. It, it feels very like much like the projects in the states. You know, when it's like government-built housing that's meant to just squeeze as many people in a small area as possible. I mean, I haven't been to many places. I've been to Egypt though, so I'll, I can compare it to Egypt. That the living conditions in Egypt were much, much worse, in my opinion, uh, than the West Bank. I'm talking only about the West Bank because Gaza, I really wasn't in. I was in once 30 years ago, and I don't really remember much. But I, even in a refugee camp. I, it's worse than, for example, South Tel Aviv, because there are places that look like this in South Tel Aviv. Not as bad. Yeah. This is in much worse condition. Um, I do also, like you said and asked uh, about is how many people live in a house. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it could be worse than in Israel. But I would assume it's similar to if you were like Yemenite, Mizrahi, uh, in you know South Tel Aviv 40 years ago. Would you be down to go in this bird shop real quick? Oh, I love a bird shop. Should we go in this oh, bird shop? Of course. Are you kidding so I just came across a bird shop. I'm gonna ask them respectfully to film before I go in there, but there's a bird shop with seemingly a lot of birds. Okay. YouTuber. Thank you so much. Welcome. Wow, this is cool. <laughs> oh my God, there's a lot of birds in here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a Palestinian bird shop. In my life, did I ever think I'd be telling you this on video? No. Looks like we got finches. I can see if I can recognize my birds. Canaries. Canaries? Yeah. These these are Indian ringneck, I think. Exactly. Right. Very good. They're they an invasive became, species they're here, right? Invasive species yeah. here. They're usually caught in the wild, which I feel kind of bad. Yeah. Here, I don't understand why people are taking them as pets because they're very difficult to tame. Yeah. Trust me, I tried once. I've you actually know, seen I've seen these in a lot of places out here, and I know that there's been this new initiative of people in Gaza catching them and selling them because oh, yeah. like to, as a way to make money, which has been yeah. interesting. Yeah. But that's what they look like: Indian ringneck parakeets. So these are all canaries? These are finches. Finches, okay, that's a finch, yeah. 
Adorable. Wow, I wonder where I wonder where they get all these birds from. Well, these are not wild, obviously. You have to. Yeah. Have these are to. budgies, little Australian budgies, right? They're not, they're not hey, bud. Let's go see. Also, you have to. Look at these. It's like big chickens and turkey. What is? Oh, is that a peacock? That's a peacock. Oh man, this is crazy. It does. It does smell horrible is, in here. This is a place that's going to breed a new COVID. Whoa, we've got crazy pigeon species. There's a lot of pigeons, mostly. Does anyone in your family raise pigeons or raise? No, but I have a species of chickens in the Philippines myself. Oh yeah, I have some really cool chickens, like a special breed of chicken. So I'm, I am obsessed with this type of stuff. I've always loved birds. Okay. Wow, this is uh, that's fascinating. It's Some very fascinating. Very nice. I just can't believe there's a peacock in here. Where was that peacock? It was yeah. down here, right? Yep. Look at that. That's a yeah. whole peacock. Look at him. Very, very interesting. You got these big chickens. All right, so we got some cool information in that bird shop. I asked the store owner. His name is Abu. Cool guy. Uh, I asked him a few questions. Uh, he didn't want to be on camera. I did ask if I could film him. So he said that... It's typical that around like any Arab household has around six to seven people. I tried to clarify if that's the same here. And he said that that's what it is. I, I, do, I don't know if to take it for face value if you understood my question or not. No, sir. But regardless, six to seven people in one house, even if it's a little apartment like this, is kind of crazy. And he also said that he's 45 years old. He's been in this refugee camp for 45 years. So he's like been living here for the last 45 years. I don't, again, I don't know if that checks out or not. But Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. This place has been around for since 1948. 48, something yeah. years. Yeah. I see what we're coming up on right now is the apartment. Do you want to wall. go to that side of the street? Yeah, definitely. Let's go to that side. Crossing the street in Kalandia. It's crazy. It'd be crazy out here. Thank you. Yeah, man. The conditions here are not great. This is uh, a lot of garbage everywhere. Specifically, this area of Kalandia, where the checkpoint is straight ahead, is technically under Jerusalem municipality control. But Jerusalem municipality workers, who are mainly a lot of them are Jews, they just refuse to serve this area because it's just chaos. And they're probably going to be attacked if, if, uh, even if they're not Jews, even if they're Arabs, would might be attacked as a symbol of the occupation. Yeah. Um, but technically, they're responsible uh, for water, electricity, uh, maintenance, roads. Um, so how does that, I'm not sure what happens, meaning they're renovating this area. It's been about two years since the start of COVID, I remember. We were talking about this. Uh, who actually is responsible for it? Is it Kogat? Is it like the army? I, I don't know. That I don't know. But it's a mess. We're coming up right like, now. For example, here. It, it, yeah, look at that it. building. It's like a building. Somebody owns it. It's collapsed. It's just collapsed. Yeah. It's been that way since 2000. I was here in 2011. It was exactly the same. Wow. Because I was watching stone throwers on that building. They are standing with people. Standing on top of it. And I was thinking, someone's going to fall. <laughs> they were throwing stones over the other side of the wall? No, no, no. Here, like straight ahead oh. is the uh, checkpoint. Uh, the Israeli soldiers were shooting tear gas. I wasn't sure if it was bullets or tear gas. Should that be tear gas? And we were here, and there were Palestinian stone throwers here, and I was at one of these stores across the street. Wow. Uh, that was intense. I was actually uh, shaking, and I asked somebody, is shaking a side effect of tear gas? And he said, no, you're scared shitless. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's, that's true. To be fair, yeah. <laughs> Only time I've ever seen violence here. I got to point out something else, but in this whole, like, imagine wearing a keffiyeh, only seeing eyes, stones throwing Palestinians. I mean, like 150 Palestinian youth doing this. There was also something very theatrical about it. Of uh, like when one guy got hit in the foot by a, a canister or leg with a canister, everyone started screaming, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And they raised him up on up and they brought him to an ambulance. And I see the guy and he's like drinking water. He's absolutely fine, or I assume fine, don't know. But it was like a lot of theater almost of, uh, of like, look, we're the heroes, we're courageous, look what we're doing. And uh, I don't know what the Israelis are doing because there's too much smoke. And I was thinking, of, my, my army is shooting at me, uh, along with these Palestinians. I know, I'm not making it about me, or I shouldn't make it about me. <laughs> but you can't, I mean, what is interesting about being right here is that you can see remnants of uh yeah all this black is from fires tear gas, yeah. fires, things like, like that. can we walk up to the wall or is that not a good idea i think i wouldn't get too close yeah because i don't know yeah you know you don't know with israel who's actually looking yeah because i was over there see where that guard tower is yeah. and i started walking towards where the cars go and i hear in hebrew and i understand hebrew i couldn't figure out what they were saying to me and i was like oh shit i'm gonna get shot and they're not gonna know who i am they yeah. think i'm a palestinian yeah, it is actually kind of crazy. There's a, you can see the Israeli flag over it, right over uh, 
Arafat's face. Uh, that's insane. Like, this is all really crazy. Nuts that we're walking across Kalandia back into Israel. This car is completely uh, destroyed. That's all remnants of fire, tear gas. Again, there's that mural of Arafat, the PLO leader. Now, when do you think it'd be a good idea for me to put away my camera? Oh, when we get indoors. Okay. You can't really legally film there and uh, they may have a way to uh, erase your hard drive <laughs> if you're in there filming. The unfortunate thing for me today is like, I haven't been able to use my American passport right now for reasons where I had to basically renew it. So I'm only on an Israeli passport right now. And as an Israeli, you're not technically supposed to be here. Kind yep. of illegal. It's illegal. But I know I can't be prosecuted for it. It's just, they're gonna give me on the border. So I'm like not excited for that, but Corey's a pro and has done this billions of times now. So hopefully we just sweet talk our way out of it. That's what I'm hoping. There's so many pieces of art here. This, by the way, this art was not covered in black last time I saw it. So oh, really? So this, this is, is new. new. Yeah. yeah. I don't know, maybe there was, I, I don't know. I haven't been paying attention to the news actually. Yeah. So that's part of it. So we're coming up right on the border right now, huh? Yeah, I can so see the Israeli flag up there. So this is driving through checkpoint. We have to go through the terminal part, which is the walking through. Uh -huh. Which uh, every Palestinian under the age of 40, I think, that doesn't include tourists, by the way, uh, has to get out here and walk through. Every single Palestinian? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sure. none of them can drive through? No. Well, um, oh, no, no. If, sorry. Sorry. If, if you have a car, you're allowed to go through. But if you're on a bus, you actually have oh, to get off. Oh, if you're taking public transportation. If you're taking public transportation, you actually have to get off wow. and go through. I gotta be honest with you, like today has been pretty laid back. This is the only place where I felt a little bit on edge. Yeah, okay. Are you okay? I'm just getting into that terminal. Yeah. See, this is another thing. So you're a, a Palestinian youth, or even, you know, up to 40, and you have to get off the bus here and walk across the terminal. There's no convenient way to do it. Yeah. This is crazy. Like this is, you're, you're hopping walls, you're going around things. Like it's nice. not set up, and it's been this way supposedly under construction for years. Wow. So, which, yeah, it's not fair. It's not you know if they're gonna have this rule of a checkpoint, which I actually. But to be fair, like Israel has had a lot of issues. Like it's. Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's the whole situation's messed up, but like being you know, an Israeli, it's like I can kind of I can obviously understand a lot from our side why things yeah. are done from the israeli side and i was living in the second Intifada in israel there were bombs going guard towers filming us or something that's okay yeah there were people every day blowing themselves up during the second Intifada. right so it, as someone who went through that it makes sense wait it says no pedestrian that. crossing here yeah, yeah. Oh, okay so that's the thing where are the pedestrians supposed to go unless i'm missing something oh i love your car that's a hot that's a good car <laughs> nice one <laughs> I think Sorry. we're going, are we going the wrong way? No, we're, we're good. Don't worry. I am so on edge right now, I don't know why. You're okay, don't worry. I do this all the time. So I can't, I can't imagine myself doing this by myself. <laughs> so, okay, so there's different buses, right? Some buses go in and right. drop you off over there. Some of them just end like right there and you're expected to walk through all that chaos. All of this. Yeah, which is crazy. Wow. Uh, you, probably get, oh, you can't see it very well, but the hills at this time of day, beautiful. Yeah. You get like a pinkish yellow hue. Yeah, it is. Is that still Ramallah over there? That's uh, me. Good question. Don't know. Oh, here we are, guys. Look at that. You can see right there. Welcome to the Kalandia Crossing. Yeah, we're going to go around. We have to go around. Wow. Corey does this frequently, so for you, it's not it's crazy not, at all. Yeah. But for me, this is... It's very intimidating, though, because I'm always thinking, am I going the wrong way? Like, yeah. am I getting too close to the guard tower and they're going to shoot at me? I it's don't know. definitely not built efficiently or, like, understandably. Yeah, different. not at all. No. And the, the Israeli response is always like, they understand. They understand. And I'm like, I go through this all the time. And I'm like, no, they don't understand. <laughs> I have to argue with Israelis about this. And we're, we're going to be taking another, like, Palestinian bus after. We're hopping on yeah. the bus that we took... Yeah. So even like once we get through the border, we're taking another technically same bus, it's technically. like the same yeah. Palestinian bus. Or there bus might be a different bus, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. To Damascus Gate, Damascus which is still Gate, like a Palestinian, a Palestinian area bus, but it's run through Israel. So right. uh, I'm a little less, you know, a little, a little less on edge. Again, uh, I, edge. I hope I hope that if there's any Palestinians watching this, I'm gonna only assume that there will be. That you don't take this as like trying to be offensive in any way. This is my raw, honest thoughts of experiencing this for the first time. And I can almost start, like, I can't relate to you, obviously, but I can understand what you're feeling when you come through here. Very intimidating. So my, as I was saying before, that on the one hand, I don't want to end it there. On the one hand, I lived through the second intifada, and it was, it was, it was bad. It was really bad. It was scary. Like living in any situation. 
uh, war situation. So I understand the need for checking Palestinians, I understand the need even for checkpoints. But if you're going to do it, if you're going to do it, do it in a way which is humane and easy right. and not like, well, what, what does it matter? They're Arabs. What does it matter? They're Palestinians. And I'm kind of channeling what Israelis say to be like, well, they already suffer. Eh, what's the big deal? Right. And truthfully, it's not like we had to walk around. It was chaos. Okay, it wasn't in the end of the world. But it's, it's, I don't even see it as the de demeaning part or dehumanizing. That's not my, my thing. My th thing is, that it's not, it's just not right. Because as a Canadian, that's how I think about it. <laughs> well, I can definitely say, Sometimes. like, it's raw, honest feelings. It just doesn't feel safe. I can understand from their perspective already perceiving Israel as the enemy. It's like just not a comfortable place to be. This isn't like something I would ever want to do, especially not have to do every day. So like when we go in, yeah. Yeah, you have to balance your phone. You think I can film the sign again or no? Probably shouldn't. No, I'm gonna put my phone away here. Okay. I'm putting my phone away here. Let's see what happens when we cross the border. We'll, we'll update you on the other side. Yeah, wish us luck. Oh man. You okay? There's a lot of hype for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> so it went fine. She, she, you gave her your Israeli yeah, she just license. Went her. And she no, went, my, my, my ID. Your ID. My official ID. And she went, okay. And then she, I was like, all right, here we go. Yeah. I showed her my Israeli passport and she just goes. Yeah, she kind of gave you a look. I thought she was <laughs> going like, to say oh, something. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I guess it's legit enough, you know. The reason I was a bit nervous is A, he's younger. I'm an older person, so I'm kind of like not a threat yeah. to them in their mind. I think this is all supposition. I don't know. He's younger and he's using an Israeli passport, which Jerusalem residents were Palestinian also, or even uh, Israeli Arabs, and some, about 10%, 15%, I think it is stat, um, have an Israeli passport, but it seems odd because they usually have their ID on them. And he doesn't have an Israeli ID. And just to mention again, like that was. Not just easy, that was like beyond easy. That was yeah. like, yeah, one, yeah. one second. Like, Truthfully, because I go through these things all the time with Palestinians, because people always think that suddenly I'm going through a settler checkpoint, like it's magical, like it's yeah. different. I'm like, I'm going through a Palestinian checkpoint. I've only seen issues very rarely, very rarely, and they were usually ridiculous. Like a woman who doesn't speak any Hebrew, speaks Arabic, says, This is my son, Ibrahim. Yeah, and Ibrahim in the ID shows to be 13 years old but the kid was obviously eight and they were like why how is this possible <laughs> and maybe she was just lying like meaning she'd have an id for the kid one kid she, it could have been i don't know maybe he really does look like an eight year old i don't know so those are the type of things that i've seen also like i haven't I, seen abuses but I, I wasn't here in 2000 2005 when there were abuses i don't mean to like be holding the camera just way, one way, but I'll twist it around a little bit. Yeah, I, I definitely don't want to film the officers, but it's interesting. Like, you get, there's there's walls. There's the there's the thing. Beautiful sunset over there, and the more walls, and then you can see Kalandia, Ramallah over there. It's interesting, and you can see the border down there. That's a checkpoint. Not really the border, but the checkpoint. It's right down there. Fascinating, riveting stuff, my friends. Riveting. Again, right in front of us, you can see the border. Then we've got. The bus terminal down here, it looks like. There's a bunch of parked buses. And we are going to be hopping on a bus to Jerusalem. Here we go, guys. And it's, they now have shelters. They didn't have this last time, too. Yeah, that's nice. It's actually, it's like, kind of... I'm not going to say the idea is nice because there is a giant... Oh, and they have new bathrooms. So before... The bathrooms look nice. The bathroom was over there. Yeah. And you walked in and there were all over the floor. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, it was lovely. Lovely. Because, <laughs> of course, who's going to take care of it? Israel doesn't want to take it. They don't want to take care of it. I wonder who built these restrooms, though. These are new. They will be awful within, I assume, a yeah. few months. But, because I don't know if anyone cleans the stuff. I don't know. I'm all about, you take responsibility. You clean things. Cana the Canadian way. <laughs> you don't litter. You take care of bathrooms. I don't care who it is. Somebody. You see the wall? Like, the wall, like, segments off. It's really interesting the way that it's set up. Like, look at the wall just breaks open here. And then it breaks open again. And then you have the guard tower. Thanks, man. We did it. We're on the bus. What do we got, like around a 20 minute ride now? Yeah. We're back in Damascus Gate. What a day. All right, my friends, I'm back in Jerusalem, back in the crib. I am going to give you guys a quick taste test of my five shekel. That's like $1, and these cost like maybe another eight shekel together. Turkish Delight, or Lukum taste test that I bought in the vlog we made in Ramallah. Turkish Delights are one of my favorite things ever. I grew up eating them in Israel. And I've never had this blue flavor before. I've never seen it before. It's literally like a vibrant blue. It's super cool. It looks like it has some nuts in it. So let's try it out. Mmm, it's got pistachio. Mmm. Oh, it's minty. Oh, no. 
Ugh. I don't like it. It tastes like toothpaste. Yeah. Ugh. That's gross. <laughs> oh, I was not expecting that. Okay. Not my favorite to begin with. But here we got like a whole bunch of ones that I'm hoping are not mint flavored. Let's try this pink one maybe. Mmm. That was rose water. This one's a little green. Mmm. I don't know what that is. Is this red? I can't tell. It's hard to tell what these flavors are sometimes. This one maybe it looks a little green. Maybe it's pistachio. Mmm. It's brown. No idea what this is. Mmm. Really good though. Wow. It was very spicy. Oh, too spicy. Oh, God. We are right now in a place called Beit El. This is crazy. I've actually never been to this area before in Israel or Palestine, whatever you want to call it. And it's early morning today. We're going to be doing something a little peculiar. We're going to be meeting some people who are referred to as the West Bank settlers or Jewish settlers within the West Bank. That's what we're here for because this is a Jewish settlement. I wanted to show you guys a little look into what life is actually like here. Because I personally don't know everything that goes on here. And I wanted to learn myself. So we've come to Beit El to meet some cool people to, uh, to introduce us to this lifestyle. Oh man, I just noticed down here. You know, the West Bank is sort of like Israel's, this region's like uh, Wild West. It's a very, very complicated area with lots of Palestinian enclaves and Israeli cities, uh, Israeli settlements like based within it. And it really is like a wild west, you know? It's like, it's very um, underdeveloped still, but this is Israeli territory with army support, um, Israeli buses reach here, but the drivers of the buses are Palestinian. It's, it's super, super interesting. Oh, here we have Bible quotes. Bereshit, Genesis. Um, I think this, has something to do with Jacob's dream. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself because I don't know this place yet. And I'd like to explore it in depth with the people who actually know it today. But yeah, we're deep in it, folks. Welcome to the West Bank. All right, my friend, so this is Yehuda Cohen. We're gonna be following him around today. He's a, a local resident of the area. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and where we're about to go into right now? Yeah, my name is Yuda. I live on a mountain just next to this town. We're in uh, Betel, and uh, we're here for Shachrit. We're here to uh, for the Tfilot of the morning. Uh, you know, it's also Elul, head of Rosh Hashanah. And right. You see that uh, we'll hear the shofar bezvat Hashem, and because uh, it's Monday, we'll also get uh, Kriyat the Torah. We're actually in the period of of the high holidays of Judaism right now, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur which is the, the Jewish New Year and the Day of Atonement, like literally the most important holiday in Judaism. So we're heading into a synagogue right now to do uh, Shacharit, which is the early morning prayer. I'm not the most religious Jew, so it's not something I do every single day, but I'll show you guys what this looks like. Yeah. 
All right, we just uh, wrapped up Shacharit. Yehuda, is this something you do every single morning? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah? It's uh, it's like your morning ritual. Uh, it's my morning routine. It's uh, most people's morning routine here. Yeah? Is this place, is Betel considered a very religious place? I'd say that most people who live here don't think in terms of those um, uh, social constructs. Uh -huh. like, I don't think anybody here or probably very few people here, maybe some who come from, uh, there's like a handful of people here who come from uh, more uh, like English speaking countries, but most people here actually don't speak English. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, I'd say probably like 75, 80% of the people here probably don't know English. Wow. Um, so the people who come from like English speaking countries might have that idea of like a religion called Judaism in their heads. But most people who live here don't have that. It's like for them, it's just their folkways. We're back in Yehuda's house now. Something interesting is about to happen. I wanted to ask you what what are we what are we about to do right now? A uh, group is coming. They were just in Ramallah. Um, they're coming to us. They want to hear the perspective of a Jew living in the West Bank. Um, then they're going to head over to Bethlehem, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. They're right now driving through Bethel. They're going to come up to the mountain. And we'll uh, talk to them. I guess we'll give them the perspective of a Jew living in the West Bank. Is it something you do frequently? Is having like groups of tourists come here and talk to you? Uh, yeah, it happens quite a bit. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, it depends who. There are, I think there are a lot of Palestinian tour guides who like their groups to hear my perspective. Mm -hmm. And the, the tour guide of this group is Palestinian? Yeah. So how did he even get in contact with you? Like We met, uh, I don't know, where he and I met, I guess, a couple of years ago, maybe. Uh -huh. right? Um, he's, you know, he's been doing this a long time and, uh, he felt that, uh, my perspective is a good one to share with his people. Hey man, hey. I'm going? having a guest and camera, what's up? If it's okay, uh, you ask the group. How are you? Okay, how nice is to meet you guys? Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, he doesn't around? shake hands with women. Yeah. Okay. Just so sorry I didn't mention that. You know, when you have a whole, uh, generation now, I would say people who are now, uh, in their twenties and thirties, uh, living in communities like this, they grew up in a time when there was like real violence and drive-by shootings and buses blowing up and and neighbors being killed and teachers being killed and, and relatives being killed. It's like real. It's not like a, it's not like somebody who has like a political opinion living in Texas. And I don't think it's just the Jews living in the West Bank. The truth is, I think all of Israeli society has this issue where where we've been living in the context of this conflict um, where and. It's very hard. It's very hard. Like I, I experience it just in the course of my work. Um, and it's not just Israelis. To be fair, it's Palestinians too. Um, it's very hard to overcome what I would call like a principled resistance to even understanding the identity and narrative of the other. And I think that's part of the problem. We're not fighting each other. We're fighting our fantasies of each other. I'm also very careful when I give uh, dual narrative tours of Hebron. I often tell the group, you know, let, you know, they have a Jewish guide, which is me, uh, in some cases, you know, when I'm speaking to them, it's me, and they have a Palestinian guide. And I try to tell them in advance that the, the goal here is to really hear the Jewish story from the Jewish guide and hear the Palestinian story from the Palestinian guide. And the exercise that I think is helpful for participants on these type of programs is to really try to put these stories together um, and see if they can create a a bigger story that's inclusive enough to encompass both ostensibly rival stories. And that's really, I think, uh, for me, you know, I'm involved in a lot of different kinds of work. One of the projects I'm focused on is applying uh, post-colonial theory to Jewish issues. Anyone really outside the Jewish people or like, or even Jews who are like living outside their own people's story, it's a hard story to tell. Because most people are used to, oh, are you a colonizer or are you indigenous or like, well, what do you do with a people that existed thousands of years ago, was destroyed and displaced, yet actually managed to survive, like maintain its identity in kind of like portable form for many, many centuries, and then eventually like succeeded coming back using tools of colonialism. 
the Zionist movement as like an indigenous people's liberation movement? Are we looking at it as a colonial project that came out of Europe? And the truth is, we're complicated. And, uh, and there's no other example of like an ancient people that was destroyed and came back to life 2,000 years later and went back to its land and took possession of it like through war. Like, you know, we fought the British for 10 years. You can't achieve peace by forcing either side to compromise on something that's fundamentally important to us. The only way to achieve peace is to make both peoples fully experience themselves as winners. And it's therefore helpful, that's where I said I apply some of the, um, some of the worldview and logic of our ancestors to actually say, well, what's like a unique, like authentically Hebrew approach to dealing with this? You know, I believe there's an objective capital T truth in the world, but I don't believe any of us are wired to grasp it. Like, I don't think any of us are capable of really understanding that. I think we all have our subjective truths and our lives are journeys of trying to come close to this objective truth. And the best way to do that is to be inclusive of other people's subjective truths. And so uh, could you, I mean, sorry to yeah. be, but could you, is there any kind you of... You want concrete. Yeah, I yeah. want something concrete. <laughs> sure. even, if it's, even if it's, you know, like, no. you have these two cups, and yeah, I sure. want one cup, and no. I want the cup you want, and you want the cup I want, okay. but we each have our cups, and we're not willing to share. Right. You know, so I think that, in, look, again, I, I can only speak of my experiences with Palestinians. And the, the Jewish character of our state is very hard, but very shallow. If we can make it deep and soft instead of hard and shallow, then those Jews who are looking for a deeply Jewish state would see it. They would just like happen to see it in all the policies and institutions of the country. And anyone who doesn't have that, who doesn't have that Jewish education, doesn't know what to look for, will just experience a democratic society where everybody has full equality. That was uh, that was interesting. Yeah, how so? I, I, I don't know. I felt like, uh, it, well, the group was comprised most, it was all Americans. Yeah. And uh, the way that you speak to them, uh -huh. the way that you're able to get intimate with them and really convey your ideas, man, I got to say, it's something that as a Jew, mm -hmm. I it's super inspiring. Like, I listen okay. to you talk and I'm like, I feel like I need to do more of like a better job at explaining who I am. Ah. You know, it's a... Uh, you think I did okay telling the story of our people? I, I think it's like, okay is doing it a disservice. It's okay. like, I think you actually taught these people something. Uh -huh. And also, I like, again, being American, it's like, you come with such a wrong mentality about this place. Mm -hmm. You really do. You come on the ground. And even some of the things that they said to you, it was like, right. yeah. I was like, these questions are rooted it's in... Okay. Right, in, in applying the wrong framework to our country and our social situation, etc. And it, it might be the Mizrahi Jew in me that just gets fired up immediately. It's like, yeah. I, I want to get up and say, who, who do you think you are? Right, right. But the way that you explain those ideas... It's, yeah, it's beautiful. I've done this a couple of times. But yeah, I think it's important. You know, one of them, uh, one of the women uh, who I guess worked as a psychotherapist and social worker, counselor, she said that um, that it's important, I guess, in negotiations or I guess she's dealt with a lot of divorce couples. She said to me as she was, as we were walking out, she always tells people you need to do three things, you know, when entering into negotiations. She said, uh, number one, know yourself well. Right? Like know who you are, know your identity well. Number two, communicate clearly. Right? So the other person, I guess, can know where you're coming from. And the third is compromise carefully. And I think she's right. I think that, that that's like actually a good, I'm glad I remembered it. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's a good framework, right? Like you need to know yourself well. That's why it's so important that the, um, that those like driving reconciliation efforts on the Israeli side should be the Jews most deeply rooted in our identity and our land and our national story, etc. Um, it doesn't help for some like westernized Israeli from Tel Aviv to talk to Palestinians about like, you know, what Ben Gurion said, because that's not our like deep story. It All might right. be a, a piece of our story, but it's not our real like story that we need to be living. So we need to know who we are. We need to comp we, we need to communicate clearly and then we need to compromise carefully meaning know what we can and can't compromise on right and i think there's a, a lot of room for compromise but uh but certain things are are obviously you know like like very firm lines in the sand okay my friend so this is sharona yuda's wife and well i'm just gonna let you explain what <laughs> what you do especially when it comes to dietary requirements here sure okay so um we keep kosher mm -hmm. obviously um and kashrut, there's a lot of different rules when it comes to, to keeping kosher um, that don't just have to do with separating meat and dairy. In our house, we, we actually don't eat meat or dairy. 
um, were what's were what's called parav, um, which is all food that's not meat or dairy, but it also includes fish and eggs. So we eat egg whites and and some certain kinds of fish. It's for, uh, for health reasons. Uh, so today I'm gonna make for you. Um, this is I don't eat gluten, and my daughters also don't eat gluten. So this is fermented buckwheat bread. Is that out of choice, by the way? Gluten free, like out of choice, or is um, it because it's of a for health? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So that it has just three ingredients: um, buckwheat, water, and salt. That's awesome. Um, I've never had buckwheat bread. Not that I can think of. I had a lot of buckwheat, like oats, when I was in Russia, but I never had buckwheat bread before. Right. So it's actually a really cool. Faux grain, mm -hmm. not real, um, but it, it can act like a bread. Hopefully, this one came out tasty. <laughs> yeah, it kind of looks like a sourdough on the inside. Well, yeah, fermented is it is sourdough. You'll taste it. it has like some tang. And since we don't eat dairy, I also make all my own almond milk, and from it, I make almond all sorts of almond cheeses. Parmesan cheese. So this is almond cream cheese. This is almond cream cheese. That is so exciting. Yeah. Where where do you get like all the ingredients for everything from? You just go to like a normal um, supermarket or is it like do you make a the the buckwheat I buy there are a lot of there's actually a really big growing um community here of i think israel has the highest per capita number of vegans in the world mm -hmm. um and there's a lot of health food stores there's been like a health food store explosion in the last let's say like 10 years so i buy i buy a uh, organic buckwheat the almonds are just from a regular store but i soak them for eight hours um before i blend them and even here like in the west bank and judea samaria you can find like health food stores, health food stores easily yeah. yeah i go i also like to go to the shuk um uh, in Jerusalem. Okay. Um, but there are health food stores. There are two health food stores about 15 minutes away. Oh, amazing. And there's a small one in Beitel itself. Also. That's sweet. Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm going to give this a shot. Okay. I'm just going to eat this here standing. So buckwheat and almond cream cheese sandwich. That's exciting. Mmm. <laughs> wow, it's insane that you can make almonds taste like that. Tastes like cream cheese. Wow. Yeah. yeah, the bread, you know what's funny? The bread is like, I ate Ethiopian food yesterday. It's just kind of like in between an injera and a sourdough bread. Everyone says it tastes like injera. It tastes almost yeah. exactly like injera. And it almost has the same color as well. And the consistency too, like kind of The consistency, it's like a little spongy. Yeah. Mm, it's really good. And it's nice too that it forms a crust on the outside. It's really cool. Man, this uh, this part of the world like literally never gets old to me. It's just like if you, I seriously, when I think of the Bible, I think of stories of the Bible. It's like just this looks so legit, and that's kind of the part of the reason why we're here is to tell you guys a little bit about this area. So uh, when I moved to this mountain, it was actually naked. There was no fences, there were no signs, no benches, no structures really, except for the ones that look fairly old, right? Um, in recent years, there are people who put fences and benches and signs up. I think trying to make this more of a tourist attraction. We'll try to walk through and see what's here without relying on those signs. Okay, sounds good. I like that. This looks like a tomb. Yeah, so I'll, uh, it's called Kever Sheikh. Kever Sheikh? Kever Sheikh. The burial place of Sheikh? The burial place of the Sheikh, of the Sheikh. Of the Sheikh. Of the Sheikh. Of the Sheikh. Yeah. Basically, the Crusaders when they ruled this land, they built this capella, like a chapel mm -hmm. there. And then later the Mamluks, uh, when they ruled this land, they built a mosque here on top of the chapel. Both were acknowledging that this mountain has some unique significance, right? That there's something important about this mountain. Also the Ottoman Empire, by the way, when they um, built their railroad, from uh, Syria to Egypt, they chopped down trees, both to make room for the tracks and also to have wood for the tracks. And their practice was to leave a tree standing in a place considered holy, like a holy site. So this is actually one of the oldest trees in Israel. It's an oak tree. It's one of the oldest trees in the country. The Ottomans left it here. Th that sign actually was here when I first came, um, right? But that wood sign. But th this whole like 
structure holding up the tree, the fence around it, that's all new. So we have the Crusaders, the Mamluks, and the Ottomans all recognizing this as a holy place. This was an ancient mosque at one point. The Mamluks built it as a mosque. Wow. This whole area used to be a forest, mm -hmm. but the, um, the Ottomans chopped down most of the trees when they built the railroad, but that one they left here. This is most likely an ancient mikvah, which means that the ancient Israelites also considered this to be a holy place. A long time ago, during the first temple period, after the reign of Shlomo, uh, Solomon in English, the kingdom split into two. There was the kingdom of Yehuda and the kingdom of Israel. Okay, Now, uh, within Israeli society, there are different tribal forces. I think this is a, actually a much better way to understand Israeli society today and the broader Jewish world than kind of imposing these like Western framings, like liberal, conservative, right, left, secular, religious. Like those are very Western social framings or political framings that have a lot to do with the development of Western civilization and the experiences of Western civilization, very little to do with us. And when you try to apply those framings to Israeli society, you end up you, you end up getting things wrong. And there are obviously groups in the society that don't fit in to like, for example, like a linear Western political spectrum. You look at all the parties in our Knesset, some will fit neatly and some won't. Because that's not exactly uh, a good method of understanding Israeli society. So a better way, I think, is the tribal identities, right? There's all these different tribal identities that used to be biological, right, in the time of uh, Yaakov's sons, you know, the tribes of Israel. Today, I think it's more uh, different ty personality types within the Jewish people, different inclinations. So we can say that the two leadership tribes are Yehuda and Yosef. Yehuda, Judah, uh, is more focused on what's unique about the children of Israel our unique identity, our unique history, our unique destiny, our mission in history, our Torah, our temple, Jerusalem, what makes us unique, what makes us distinct, what makes us different from the other nations of the world. That's Yehuda's focus. Yosef is like also a leadership tribe, but is very much the opposite. Yosef is focused mostly on the material well-being of our people, things like uh, our economy, our security, defense, right? Yosef is very focused on what we share in common with the rest of the world, with the other peoples of the world, especially the most dominant civilization of any given period. So in Yosef ben Yaakov's time, it was Egypt, right? Yosef was very into Egyptian culture and eventually ended up in Egypt and became a ruler in Egypt. And even his brothers, thought he was an Egyptian when they first met him. They couldn't even tell that it was their brother Yosef. He looked, he resembled an Egyptian. So Yosef is like the part of our identity that kind of like looks like the dominant civilization of any given period. Today it's obviously Western civilization. And therefore when it comes to Yosef and Yehuda, um, because Yehuda for the most part is very much looking at the world through the lens of Jewish identity and Jewish history, um, he, you know, if you put a social or political issue in front of him, he might come to conclusions based on lessons of our people's past, our values, halakha, etc. Yosef can look at those same social or political issues and go according to what's politically correct right now in the most, like, civilized, enlightened, quote-unquote, part of the world. So th these are very different types of identities, types of leadership roles, and Yosef is very much... Even though he's more connected to the rest of the world, he's more easily influenced. So to make it practical, when the kingdom split after the death of Shlomo, the kingdom of Israel was for the most part ruled by somebody from the tribe of Ephraim, which was one of the sub-tribes of Yosef. So Yosef, for the most part, the most important kings of the, tri of the kingdom of Israel were from Yosef. Whereas the kings of the tribe of the, the kingdom of Yehuda were from the tribe of Yehuda, were from the family of David, right? So the kingdom of Israel was bigger, stronger, economically stronger, militarily stronger, diplomatically, was more connected to the rest of the world, was more relevant, like 
to current events at the time, but was also more susceptible to the influences of other nations, was also more easily influenced by the cultures and ideologies of the outside world. Whereas the kingdom of Yehuda, the kingdom of Judah, was for the most part a landlocked desert kingdom, you know, in Jerusalem with the Torah, with the temple. And it wasn't just Yehuda, by the way. It was also Shimon and Levi, who were like the extreme expressions of, of Yehuda, in the same way that the tribe of Dan is an extreme expression of the tribe of Yosef. And also Binyamin stayed with Yehuda, which is very important because Binyamin represents the future. Binyamin represents the next generation. The fact that Binyamin stayed with Yehuda and Shimon and Levi um, shows or allowed or led to our people's history continuing with that kingdom. That's why we're called Jews today. We're called Jews today because we are for the most part the descendants of the tribes that stayed with Yehuda under Yehuda's leadership. That Ju Judah's leadership. Mm -hmm. So we're called Jews today. I'm from the tribe of Levi. I'm a Kohen from the tribe of Levi, but I'm called the Jew often because my ancestors were part of that Judean kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, the kingdom of Yehuda. Um, now, the king of Israel at the time, Yeravam ben Navat, uh, from the tribe of Ephraim, which is one of the sub tribes of Yosef, he had a problem. Even though he was the stronger king, more relevant on the international scene, uh, just more powerful by any real measurement at the time, three times a year, his legitimacy would be challenged. Because on Pesach, on Shavuot, and on Sukkot, we go to the Temple Mount, to, you know, on what's called Ali al Regel, pilgrimage to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And on the Temple Mount, there's only one human who is allowed to sit down, and that's the King of Israel. But it's not Yeravam ben Navat, the King of Malchut Yisrael, the King of Israel, it's his rival, Rechavam ben Shlomo, the son of Solomon, from the Davidic line, uh, from the tribe of Judah, who happens to be the king in, in Yehuda, in Jerusalem. So even though he's the more powerful king, he would be shown to be less legitimate three times a year, and therefore he decided, you know what, no more going to Jerusalem. He made it illegal for his subjects to go to Jerusalem, he put guards on the border, between his kingdom and the kingdom of Yehuda, and he said, I'm going to make you an alternative site to serve the Creator. And that's what this mikvah is doing here. Because right over here, people would dunk in the mikvah and they would bring their uh, korbanot to the priests here, and then they would. Right here, this is where the korbanot? They would bring the for preparation, mm -hmm. most likely. Those are sacrifices, by the way. All these English translations often get the meaning of these words wrong, but yeah. Here, um, these are the ruins of Yeravam's temple. He built here a temple with a golden calf as an alternative to the temple in Jerusalem. And he said, you want to serve the Kedosh Baruch Hu? You want to serve the Creator? Don't go to Jerusalem. It's illegal not to go to Jerusalem. Instead, come here to this golden calf. He built another one in the far north of his kingdom in Dan. He said, here's the golden calf, this is where you come. And, the, and throughout the rest of the first temple period, for the most part, um, the people who were part of the kingdom of Israel that saw themselves as loyal to Hashem in the Torah would come to this golden calf on this mountain and bring their korbanot uh, instead of Jerusalem. Not the prophets, obviously, they were mm -hmm. against. But you had a situation where the kingdom of Israel was very influenced by the different idolatrous practices of our neighbors that um, this became, even though this is very problematic too, this became like the quote-unquote legitimate uh, way to worship Hashem, to serve Hashem. And, uh, and all those other things were obviously idolatry. They, but most people didn't realize, like the average like farmer or tanner or whatever, didn't realize that this is kind of idolatry too. Um, what's interesting about the golden calf in general is that it's um, it's a form of idolatry that actually comes out of our identity, as opposed to like things we picked up from the Phoenicians or the Canaanites or the Moabites or Egyptians or anybody else. This form of idolatry was actually comes from within our own identity, which makes it more dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, so the question though is, why would Yeravam do this? Why would he build a golden calf on this mountain? Yeah, like what's significant about this mountain? Why here? Right. That's the question, because if you go deeper into his territory, if you go 
past Harbal Khatsur, that huge kind of twin mountain over there, mm-hmm. that's called Harbal Khatsur. That's the border between Judea and Samaria. We're still in, we're in northern Judea right now. Other side is what's called the Samaria region. On that mountain, by the way, is where Avraham, our ancestor, did what's called the Brit Benabitarim, the covenant between the parts. Um, and now, actually, inside, it's an Air Force base, hmm. uh, responsible for our eastern front, if I'm not mistaken. So, just over Harbal Khatsur is a Jewish town called Shiloh. And for 369 years, Shiloh had been our people's spiritual capital, before Jerusalem. And at this point, when Yeravam becomes king, Jerusalem was really only our spiritual capital for roughly 40 years. Mm -hmm. So instead of building a golden calf on this mountain, why not rebuild the tabernacle, the Mishkan, deeper into his territory in the town of Shiloh, this is a place that everybody knew had been our spiritual center for 369 years. He could have told the people of Israel, you guys know, your grandparents knew, this is where they would bring their korbanot. This is where they would serve the Creator, not Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a creation of the Davidic family. Right? It was a very easy argument to make. If I was advising him, I would have told him, do that. Rebuild the Mishkan in Shiloh. More legitimacy, more credibility. Come on. But he did this instead. He built his temple, this golden calf, right here on this mountain. And I think the reason he did that is because we already considered this to be a holy place at that time. Okay? If you walk this way, we're going to take a look at what his temple is facing. A few years ago, we brought a geologist here who confirmed that this rock is what we call a conglomerate, meaning that this was once upon a time several rocks that at a certain point in history became one rock. Okay? Uh, the story goes that our ancestor Yaakov had to flee from his brother Esav and he went to a place called Luz. Okay? Luz today is just right around this mountain, it's called Bitin. Okay, so he goes to Luz, but he doesn't sleep in the inn at Luz because his brother would have found him there. Instead, what Yaakov does is he walks up to this mountain, roughly a kilometer outside of Luz, and he goes to sleep on 12 stones. He has a dream, that's a pretty famous dream, that there's a ladder with malachim, uh, spiritual forces, often translated into angels in English. I don't know what that means, but malachim, like these like spiritual forces, climbing up and down, ascending and descending the ladder. That's his dream. In the morning he wakes up and the 12 stones underneath him have become one stone. And we believe that to be this stone. When he wakes up and realizes that he's in a place of Kedusha, right? He's in a place of holiness. He renames Luz Betel. And this Mm. becomes known as Betel. Decades later, when Yaakov returns home from exile, uh, he, after two of his sons, Shimon and Levi, conquer the city of Shechem. Uh, he and his family are brought back to this mountain and he's renamed Israel. Like that happens also on this mountain. Yaakov is renamed Israel. Yeah, this is a guard tower. This is a guard tower from the second temple period. Now, after one of the Judean kings destroyed the golden calf on this mountain, we didn't like calling this Betel. In the second temple period, we called this Gofna. Um, like Gefen, because the, some of the best wine in the country comes from this area, right? Gofna. The story basically goes that when the Seleucid Greek Empire ruled our land and they started to outlaw our culture and they started to impose their culture and their ideas and their practices on us, there was a group uh, really led by a family from Odin of Kohanim, Matatiao and his sons, that revolted against Greek rule. Now, the, the revolt started in Modin, but they couldn't stay in Modin. They came up here to Gofna, and this became the partisan camp of the Maccabee underground for the first roughly five years of the revolt, right? It was a 26-year war, um, but for the first few years before we conquered Jerusalem, this was the headquarters of the Maccabee underground. Matityahu, who started the revolt, he died on this mountain. Uh, he put his... Uh, second son Shimon in charge of the family and his third son Yehuda in charge of the war. Uh, Yehuda becomes known as Yehuda Maccabee, Yehuda the Maccabee, Judah the Maccabee. Um, he actually ends up being killed down in that valley in the Battle of Bachiris. He faced um, 20,000 mercenaries and 2,000 cavalry with only 800 fighters. Yehuda actually invented what we call guerrilla war. 
uh, using the land, using the terrain as a weapon against a more powerful enemy. Uh, he would lure the Greek mercenaries into narrow passes where their cavalry wouldn't be able to help them too much, where their phalanxes wouldn't really work, uh, where they couldn't fight according to their training, and where their superior weapons and armor would also be worth a lot less. We'd fill the skies with arrows, what the Greeks would call Judean rain, and those arrows would pour down on them, and uh, whoever that didn't kill, we'd charge down the mountains and pick off. And that was basically uh, how we, after 26 years, how we won our, our freedom. Um, but this was the place where it really began. This was like the partisan camp of the Maccabeam. This is um, their main guard tower. Uh, for me, it's actually very, a very powerful experience to live here because I really uh, experienced myself as a character in a later chapter of the same story that they were characters in. And as much as somebody wants to dispute whether or not there was Yaakov, whether or not he had a dream on this mountain, it's not a dispute that this was the partisan camp of the Maccabim. Meaning that is easy to prove. Um, whereas, you know, a lot of the biblical stories, I believe it's true. I, b I believe for sure that Yaakov had his dream on this mountain, but I can't prove it to you scientifically. But it's beyond question that the Maccabim had their partisan camp here. This mountain is full of caves, going back a long time. This is where a lot of the fighters would sleep. But it's really up here that Yudha Maccabi had the task of transforming a group of teachers and tanners and farmers into guerrilla fighters. It's in one of the larger caves, but it's flooded. It's interesting that it's flooded. Why, why is there so yeah. much water in here? Summer. It's summertime too. No, no, the water for some reason the water stays. That's interesting. Wow, look at that. Oh man, this is cool. Whoa. So this cave uh, was actually the the nerve center of the Maccabean revolt. This is where most of the officers' meetings probably took place, where a lot of the uh, shiurim took place, where people learned Torah, where people uh, engaged in tefillah, uh, where people made their olive oil. You have a bunch of olive presses here, different kinds of olive yeah, presses wow. here. Look at that, that's definitely an olive press. Mm -hmm. Most of the ideas driving the revolt were formulated here. There was a very deep machloket, there was a very strong difference of opinion between the Maccabim, like the family of Matityahu, the Hashmonaim, and the Hasidim. The Hasidim uh, were the majority of his soldiers. Like the majority of fighters were from a group called the Hasidim. The Hasidim were fighting for our folkways, for our culture, for our identity, fighting so we can have Shabbat, so we can have Brit Milah, so we can have uh, uh, our calendar, all which were outlawed by the Greeks. Right? The Greeks outlawed a calendar, they outlawed Shabbat. They outlawed circumcision, Brit Milah. They outlawed the study of Torah. They would take our brides on the wedding night and let her go, it's called prima nocta, right? Like let her go with the Greek governor or Greek general before she could be with her husband. So that's what the Hasidim were fighting for. And that might have been what the Maccabim were fighting for at first. But very quickly the Maccabim realized we're not just fighting for our culture and our identity, we're fighting for political possession of our land. We're fighting to keep our homeland free from foreign rule. Because that's also uh, like a value in our society. That's also a commandment in our Torah, right? That we should possess the land. And uh, over that, the Maccabim were willing to fight 26 years until they eventually won under the leadership of Shimon, the last surviving son of Matityahu. Uh, whereas the Hasidim withdrew as soon as the Greeks offered them cultural autonomy in exchange for stopping the revolt, in exchange for accepting imperial rule. And it was for that reason that Yehuda found himself alone with only 800 fighters facing off against 22,000 because the Hasidim had already withdrew from the revolt and were back with their families and farms, etc., leaving the more, I guess what we can call, extreme Maccabee faction to fight on its own. Listen, this is one of the most cool-looking caves I've ever been in my life. The roof is, this is what's <laughs> was screwing with me. This looks like it was a small cave and then somebody came here and carved it out. You just took me around on a mountain that you live really close by to, or no, pretty I, much this, on, I yeah. Live on this mountain. 
and you showed me a bunch of sites that pertain to our people's history yeah. like that's like some solid proof evidence that tracing back our people existed here lived yeah, here not that I think anyone could really deny it well that's what I'm curious about you know like okay within the context of this video mm -hmm. you know in the title of this video most mm -hmm. people probably clicked on it because they saw the word settler oh. right and that's what a lot of people will have an image of you as a colonial settler somebody who's coming in from the outside right, right. to claim land that's not theirs uh -huh. so I'm curious like when you live so close to stuff like this or, or on a place like this mm -hmm. like how does that make you feel well, f first of all before I get into how it makes me feel I think that um, you know uh, from a material perspective from a structural perspective I don't want to be a settler mm -hmm. right I want to be able to live here I want Jews to be able to live in the West Bank which also happens to be the cradle of our civilization without being settlers, without living according to the structures of settler colonialism and without um, disenfranchising anybody. And these are the hills of Gofna mm -hmm. because the best wine in the country comes, like Geffen, right? Like, oh, is that where the word comes from? Gofna, right? The best wines in the country come from here. Mm -hmm. yeah, Geffen is, is vine, actually. Yeah. Also, when you don't sift the wine, you get all the nature of, uh, of the wine itself. Mm -hmm. it, you don't need to clear it. Look at the color of it. It's very pretty as is. I'm not looking for something that is diluted. You say diluted? Is that the word? Diluted, yeah. Diluted. Yeah. I want something thick. I want to fill it. I want to know that I'm eating a fruit here by Jews. There's a special bracha, a special blessing for wine. Right. Right? Because wine is something special. It's not like every fruit. It behaves different. And if you leave it open uh, uh, long enough, you get different aromas coming out, different flavors coming out. It's changing all the time. And you can keep it very long and so on. Something that is uh, full of mystery. I want to show you in their winery here, uh, just in the backyard. I feel like I may be a little drunk already. <laughs> I'm drinking some wine right now. Um, they have uh, this beautiful fig tree, massive fig trees. We've talked about this on the channel multiple times in extensiveness. Figs are one of my favorite fruits in the world. And they have a massive fig tree back here with uh, just, man, just the smell of this tree alone can drive someone crazy. Look at that fig. Pick a nice big one. The owner just gave me an invitation. I didn't just uh, pick it for no reason. I'm gonna show you on the inside. Usually when you're picking these wild figs, you do wanna give a little check for worms just in case. You pop it open like this. See if anything's moving around in there. You can just eat the inside. Mm. Wow. Oh my God, it's amazing. Look how beautiful that is on the inside. And this is the first fig I've ever had that like the skin peels off easy. It's really like interesting. So you just brought me over now to a, a bakery called Herbie's Bake Shop. It's a killer donut. <laughs> Oh man, but who, who would have expected and how here to have amazing donuts? Seriously, that's amazing. Really, really good. Mm. Better than the Krispy Kreme, I swear. That's a really fresh. Coming out here to the sort of border of the community of uh, Bet El. It's amazing seeing this place. It's just so, so, so beautiful. Such a fascinating place. With so many moving parts, so many different elements, and so much, honestly, so much to learn here. Uh, I think the one, the biggest thing that I've been learning throughout this whole adventure of being in the West Bank more often now is, uh, is how complicated it really is. And trying to paint it with one single brush does it a big disservice, you know? Um, nothing productive comes of that. Trying to actually get to know this place, get to know the people that live in here, learn their struggles on both sides is the most important most important thing you could do. It's the most important part of this video is like the relationship between us and the Palestinians, right? Mm -hmm. It's trying to understand our identity in this conflict, what we believe in. Earlier in the video, I was saying things about Judaism, mm -hmm. about ethnicity, about religion. These are things that you don't subscribe to and you don't think- Well, well I think we, I think the people of Israel predate all of those social constructs, mm -hmm. like religion, race, ethnicity, nationality, 
culture, we exist before all that, I'd say the closest thing to what we are is a civilization, kind of like the Aztecs, right? We have a spiritual component to our identity. We have a legal component to our identity. We have a national component to our identity. We have a territorial component to our identity. We have a spiritual component to our identity. But we're not just limited to any of those things. And I think uh, part of what happened to us in exile is uh, we were colonized, like layers and layers and layers of colonization. Um, if if you're interested, you asked earlier how Jews living in the West Bank see ourselves, mm-hmm. right? And I use the term West Bank intentionally, by the way. I know there are a lot of Jews who live out here who would say Judea or Judea and Samaria. Um, the truth is there are parts of Judea that are not in the West Bank. There are parts of Samaria that are not in the West Bank. And there are parts of the West Bank that are not Judea or Samaria, like the Jordan Valley. So I think it's like technically problematic to just use Judea and Samaria as like a synonym for the West Bank. When I say the West Bank, I mean the piece of territory that we took back from Jordan in the Six-Day War. They took it from us in 1948, we took it back in 1967, and it's really one of the most integral parts of our homeland. And I'd say that the Jews living in the West Bank, even though we're not ideologically homogenous, there are many different types of Jews who live in different parts of the West Bank, I think the ideological common denominator is that we see ourselves as a proud ancient people from this land that was forcibly displaced by the Roman Empire against our will, somehow managed to maintain our identity in exile for roughly 2,000 years before, against all odds, coming back to the land we'd been displaced from and uh, taking it from the British in an almost decade-long arm struggle, right? For roughly nine years, we were engaged in, a urban, in an urban guerrilla war against British rule here. Uh, they left in 1948, citing Jewish terrorism as the reason uh, for their withdrawal. Uh, we revived our ancient language. We uh, came back in 1967 to the most important parts of our land. I think we experience all international efforts at a two-state solution as the world trying to displace us again after we worked so hard and fought so hard to come back to this land. Uh, So we're determined to resist any partition of our land. Um, The best method of struggle we figured out to resist the international community so far is to build as many Jewish communities as we can in different parts of the West Bank. I'd say some of these communities do function as settlements, meaning they are structured according to a settler colonial model, and some of these communities don't. And I think it's important to differentiate. I think it's important we learn to live here not as settlers. Like Jews should be living in the West Bank, but not according to the structures of settler colonialism. We should be living here as a native people on its land. Um, And also at peace with the other native peoples of this land. That's obviously the most important point that I want to hark on is like, how do you see your relationship with Palestinians? Well, like, I personally have a good relationship with a lot of Palestinians. Uh, not everybody here does. Uh-huh. Um, but it's also partially because I view reconciliation between us and the Palestinians, specifically us, meaning like the Jews who live in the West Bank, the Jews who are deeply rooted in our identity, the Jews who are really living the national aspirations of our people, the national story of our people, uh, who are like deeply rooted here. I think those Jews, Jews like me, need to be at the forefront of reconciliation efforts with the Palestinians. Uh, And I do see such reconciliation as an objective of Jewish liberation. I do believe that at this stage of history, Jewish liberation and Palestinian liberation are very much intertwined. And you can't really have liberation for one without the other. They, they come hand in hand. They have to, because part of what we need, part of our decolonization at this point, right, is uh, psychological. Uh, for them, decolonization is very material, mm-hmm. meaning that uh, part of, you know, dismantling the colonial features of Zionism uh, require us to also re-indigenize into the land in our own heads, like like part of us freeing ourselves from what you can call uh, our colonization or an exile mentality or whatever terminology you want to use, but really healing ourselves from roughly 2,000 years of like traumatic persecution, uh, that's not easy. And I think right. the, the more... 
successfully we engage in that project of, of Jewish decolonization, uh, the more we'll shift how we relate to Palestinians and, uh, and also our own fears and our own need for like control, security, etc., and be able to live here like as a normal people with other peoples here. And like to put it into actual like, you know, like I think where my problem seats with the whole situation, especially with how it's treated online, is people's um, feeling that like they all need to speak up, especially people who are completely outside the conflict. And and for me, like when I when I'm here with you and I'm standing with you right now, like right behind us, I don't what's the name here? Uh, Jifna. Jifna. Like I, you can see the minarets, you can see the mosques yeah, over the there. Mosque, well, also there's um, Jalazun. There's Jalazun. There's Jifna. There's a lot of different Palestinian communities around here. But yeah, okay, you see minarets going. You know, it's like this is you're living where we're standing right now is what's perceived to be by the international community a settlement. Like when when you hear those words, when you have people online telling you, I'm sure you get it because you do a lot of work online. Is like like you're the one who's actually living side by side with these people. You're the one who's having these interactions with people. Like if if, if there's a message for people internationally. That, that are not Jewish, that are not Muslim, that are not Palestinian or Israeli that are watching this video. Like, I'd be curious to hear what you'd have to say to them. Well, I think that as Israeli society continues to develop, right, meaning and the um, forces within Israeli society that are more connected to our true identity become stronger, um, largely through birth rates, by the way, just because we've had more kids, and the forces within Israeli society that just want Israel to exist as some kind of uh, outpost of Western civilization become weaker. Um, I think the opportunities for different kinds of relationships will begin to manifest. Uh, of course, they're also dangerous. Meaning, I think that as like what we can say, the stronger Jews, right? Like the Jews more connected to our identity, more willing to fight, kill, and die for what we believe to be important to our people, become stronger in Israeli society. There's also a danger that we'll just, you know, take out the Palestinians, right? Or like try to defeat them decisively. Uh, I think that uh, it's important to do whatever we can to build relations between specifically Jews like me, Jews who live in communities like mine, and our Palestinian neighbors before we reach that tipping point. Before we get, and, and that's without even factoring in the rapid growth of the Haredi population in this country that is that, that might develop into something else as they become a dominant force within Israeli society. So w what's important to understand about this country, Israeli and Palestinian societies, is that they're very dynamic societies, uh, especially Israel. Um, that it's, you know, what, what Israeli society is today is not going to be Israeli society tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like there's just like rapid changes taking place and a lot of, you know, cultural conflicts beneath the surface that need to be understood in order to really understand uh, our conflict with the Palestinians and where things can go, what possibilities exist for a better future for both of us here. Do you see a path to f for peace? Like, yeah, do you see sure. a way? Yes, yes. Yeah? Yeah, but it requires us to be... Look, I, I think, first of all, because the power dynamics favor us, Israel, we need to be the ones to make the first move towards building trust. Uh, I think we don't trust each other right now. We're both essentially playing the role of antagonist in the other's story, and we both have this like principled resistance to understanding the other as the other exists in his own story. So we're not even fighting each other. We're fighting our fantasies of one another. Right? And... Uh, so I think in order to overcome that principled resistance to understanding the story of the other, we first need to build trust. I think Israel needs to be the first one to make those moves because we have the power right now. Um, and I think that the more Jews who are really living our true story and are really connected to our real identity uh, and have like a clear understanding of what our people's story is about, what our history is about, uh, where we hope to go with this state of Israel that came into being in 1948, those Jews need to be the ones to drive our relationships with the Palestinians uh, and not those who live in North Tel Aviv and just want to be a satellite of the West, <laughs> right? I, I think it's a, a very, you know, very different possibilities exist when you, um, when you put different uh, camps together, and etc. Um, but the future to you is not bleak. It's not hopeless. It's no, the not... future is not hopeless at all. I, th I think that, uh, but again, it takes work. But first, we need to get past the greatest obstacle, which is the two-state paradigm. Mm -hmm. As long as people are thinking in terms of separating our peoples into two separate nation-states, it's very hard for us to come together. 
I think uh, as soon as we understand two states is not the future, we're not going to partition this land, this land is going to remain whole, then we start to have real conversations about how to bring people together in a way that's healthy, in a way that's productive, in a way that's good for both peoples. It doesn't mean we're going to melt into one shared civic national identity. I think we're each going to maintain our, like, independent kind of tribal identities, but we can be strong allies in building this country together. So you you actually do a lot of work on mm-hmm. the ground, not only with Israelis and Palestinians, but empowering Jews like me who mm-hmm. don't really... I mean, I would say I have a good sense of my identity, but the way that I speak to it around the world and tell people my identity, it probably doesn't line up exactly with what you preach, and I really like what you preach. Mm-hmm. So where can people find you if they're more interested in like work that you do? Uh, well, you can find me online. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. I'm kind of on Twitter. I barely use it, but <laughs> I also am one of the leaders of the Vision Movement. That's visionmovement.org, and we also have an English-language online magazine, visionmag.org and you can subscribe to the magazine or become a member of the movement and of course uh, I encourage your viewers to uh, and you to uh, check out our educational programs we have a lot of online courses that I think you can benefit from especially when it comes to Jewish identity um, really applying post-colonial tools to our identity and our history um, understanding the Palestinian perspective from Palestinian voices and learning how to tell our story better to the outside world because the truth is the story of the Jewish people is a very difficult story for anyone who's not a Jew to understand. Um, We're unique in history. There are very few examples, I can't think of any besides us, of an ancient people that was destroyed yet managed to come back to life 2,000 years later in the homeland it had been displaced from. Um, That's one of the reasons why one could look at the Zionist movement as an indigenous people's liberation movement or as a colonial project from Europe because both are technically true because we're unique in history and our story is therefore very difficult to tell. So if anyone is interested in learning how to tell our story better, um, if there are Jews interested in understanding the Palestinian story from their perspective, uh, or if there are people interested in applying post-colonial theory to Jewish identity, I encourage you to take our Atid online leadership program, which you can find at visionmovement.org. All right, so I'm uh, making my way out of Beit El right now, out of the community. Going to be heading back to Jerusalem on a bus. And again, you know, like this is uh, its one of those videos where the concept's a lot deeper than me eating the best yada yada food in whatever country or showing you guys a really uh, cool travel location. These are deep political societal uh, concepts that you need to think about. And hanging out with somebody like Yuda and getting an explanation from him and his family about their lifestyle and the reasons that they're here, it adds so much more context into my life to deal with. It helps me rationalize and deal with the things that I've dealt with my entire life and then my family's history with trauma. Um, Again, for context sake, I'm standing here in a Jewish settlement, quote-unquote, and over there is a Palestinian village, like an enclave of Ramallah, one of the biggest cities um, and most important cities to Palestinians. And it's, uh, it's just overall, it's very fascinating. It inspires me a lot to be able to sit down and have conversations with people like him, and know that at the end of the day the intentions uh, deep down I can tell are are genuine you know the way of finding a confident Jewish people and finding a confident Jewish nation here in this land the way to get there will not be easy and this is what I drew from the conversation it's not going to be easy and uh, and there's a lot of a lot of obstacles in the way, especially with finding peace with Palestinians, with our neighbors, which I've come to understand is so important and so valid. And their desires for nationhood and independence is so valid and so important as well for our happiness. Making all that work is going to be difficult, but but it's so worth it. When I stand in a place like this and I'm able to look out and see our country, see our nation. And I, when I say our country, I mean for Israelis and Palestinians together. When I look at places like this and I see the potential to build something great here together, it's really, 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 really inspiring. And overall, it just makes me happy to think that there's people out there like him who are trying to help us and them. Help us and what is perceived, what I've perceived to be the enemy my whole life. And I'm sure that that's the same way that a lot of people on the other side feel. And I'm just talking off the cuff right now. I know this is scripted. 
This is just raw emotions from, from being in a place like this. It's powerful. It really is. And uh, I mean, the biggest thing that I could recommend, especially for people who are watching this, who are not involved in this conflict, who have no stake in the game, is quietly observe. Ask questions, but never assume. Never dictate. Never come out and start stating things with confidence. Come here, come see this place with your own eyes. Understand the situations that people are living in. That's the biggest reason why I'm creating this series in the first place, is to come here and document this stuff, to show people what it's actually like here on the ground, to understand this stuff. That's the reason I'm making it. And I'm hoping that this just adds a little bit more context for you guys to see the other side of a quote unquote Israeli settlement. We are right outside of the mega settlement city of Ariel in the West Bank. This is a Jewish settlement. So all of this right here it is by far the biggest city or settlement in the West Bank of Judea and Samaria. Uh, you can see here a little map. Usually you'd be looking at it like this. And this is right where we are right now in between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Uh, it is a really interesting town. I've never been here before. I'm actually gonna introduce you guys right now to a, a person who lives here and is from here. And uh, she's going to be sort of walking us through and showing us around in Ariel today. Hello. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> guys, this is Natalie. Hi, she's guys. a local from Ariel. So can you tell us a little about where we are right now and what we're about to see? Sure. Well, first of all, welcome to Ariel. Um, it's a wonderful city. I can't wait to tell you all about it. Um, we're actually here at the grave of Ron Nachman. He was the original mayor of Ariel. And he was a man with, with passion and a dream. And it's so amazing to me to think about somebody who, who started here when he came to Ariel in 1978. He came with 40 families. They were on a hilltop with nothing. There was nothing on the hilltop. They had um, no running water. They had one electric generator. And from that, 40, what is it, 44 years ago, we built this amazing city. So it's just, I mean, for me, it's very inspirational. Um, he's buried here. We didn't have a cemetery for a long time. Now they're building a cemetery here. But he wanted to be buried here on the hilltop looking over his city. Um, so here we are. I'm going to take you to a couple different places today, introduce you to a few different people, hopefully try and get you a feel of what Ariel really is, as opposed to what you hear or what you assume that it is, because I really think we're going to blow your minds and just change a lot of these um, misconceptions maybe change these misconceptions you know what what a lot of people think about the Jewish people who live here in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank um, so welcome we're gonna be talking about a wide variety of things today especially trigger words for a lot of people like settlements and Palestinians and Israelis in the conflict this is gonna be a, a really interesting deep video so I implore you guys to strap in and get ready for the whole thing as we as we explore this amazing place okay Natalie so where are we right now all right, so we're coming to my office, uh, the Ariel Development Fund, American Friends of Ariel, and we're located in actually what used to be the the old, uh, the original housing uh, in Ariel when they first built houses. So this used to be someone's house. Um, down this path, you have the mayor's office, and down here you have the uh, the security and the Magin David Dome, the ambulance services. So come on in. Let's go on in. Here we are. This is Ophira, hiding behind her computer. Hi, Ophira. <laughs> so this is the office space where you come to work every day? Yes. Welcome to my office. I've got all my little, you know, fun things around. Mm -hmm. My little tags of things that I've been to. Uh, notes to myself. So what do you actually do here on the day-to-day -day when you're, like, working on the computer, like, in your office? So a lot of it is social media, um, putting things up on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, our website. We're actually redoing our website now. Um, some days we actually have groups that come and visit Ariel. Mm -hmm. Groups of all, kind, all kinds of people. Uh, people who believe we should be here, people who believe we shouldn't be here. But we want to meet everyone. We want to tell everyone what it's like living here, why we're here, why it's important for us to be here. Uh, those are always fun because you meet all kinds of interesting people and get to go to all the different uh, places around Ariel. Uh, one of the things that we do as Ariel Development Fund is that we, we bring in the funding and we work on all kinds of projects in the city that will benefit the people of, uh, of Ariel and the area. So things from sometimes, you know, water bottles for kids going into first grade to huge things like the Field Center for Entrepreneurship and the National Leadership Center 
Uh, we have a ad young adult center. Um, all kinds of things going on in the city. Hopefully later today I'm going to show you around, show you what's, what's exciting here in the city, what we're involved in. And that's one of the things I love about my job is that we work very closely with the Ariel municipality, but we only do the fun and good things. All I do every day is good stuff for the people in the area. So it's really exciting and I really love coming to work. <laughs> Okay, who are you? Can you introduce yourself, please, sir? Uh, sure. My name is Alad. Mm -hmm. Alad I was born and raised here in Ariel. I'm uh, 30, almost three years old. So let's first speak about the location. So Ariel located just like here, on the corner between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. So you can see this is a topographical map of Israel and, you, and what people refer to as the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, the Palestinian territories. This is this area and Ariel is right here. I just have to say that we don't refer to this as the West Bank. Right. right. The West Bank is the West Bank of Jordan. Right. Jordan ruled these territories only for 19 years. That's it. After the British mandate uh, was over. Out of the green line. So this is our the, the promised land. This is our uh, homeland here. So Ariel is just located on, between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean. 30 miles from uh, the Jordan Valley and 30 miles from Tel Aviv and, and, and also 30 miles from Jerusalem. Here is the map of Ariel. We can see only half of our uh, lands. Uh, the very beginning was just here where we are speaking right now uh, in, the old, uh, in these old cabins. By the way, my family uh, lived in a kind of uh, these uh, buildings. So this is like the old town of Ariel right here. Yeah. In the east end, we can see the Ariel University. All what we have between is our neighborhoods and also this new neighborhood which have uh, under construction of 389 new homes. And I, I want to ask you some questions because you told me this is something that's very interesting in my opinion. You were telling me the story about when President Barack Obama took power and how everything stopped here. Could you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Fortunately, we have uh, eight years under freezing. And when I say freezing, not just, not just freezing of building, but even of planning. So it really um, blocked us for almost a decade and we still can feel how we are in a delay. But thank God and thank Trump administration, we were able to start this new neighborhood. And it, it's fascinating to me specifically because being an American Israeli, it's like you could see that the actual policies in the United States, like he was saying immediately when Obama took presidency, it was like all development in Ariel had to stop. In a few months. And then the second that Trump took power eight years later, all of a sudden, boom, you have a new swath of land being developed. And, and it's interesting because all this comes on the stem of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And when you look at the map, you can see this is a Palestinian Arab village, this is a Palestinian Arab village, this is a Palestinian Arab village. They exist so close to each other. And you had an amazing point earlier about Dukium, about coexistence. I have to tell you something first about sure. those villages. When Ariel was just established, the economics of those villages based on agriculture and they couldn't grow nothing here on, the, on this hill and uh, on this stony hill. And uh, you will be able to, see, you will have an opportunity to see what we did with this hill of death. Those empty lands was no man lands. Uh, when we're speaking about occupation and if you took something for someone, you have to understand the difference between a real university or Tel Aviv University was just founded on an old Arab villages, which is proud of both of them, okay? But you have to understand the differences. When we're speaking about coexisting, we believe that the only coexisting can, uh, can be based like in any coexisting in every peace agreement on a common interest. And common interest starts uh, uh, first with economics. Not by leaders, not by the Palestinian uh, uh, authority, uh, and not by governments, by the people on the ground. Every day, only in Ariel, workers work inside the city of Ariel and in our industrial park. These are Palestinian workers. Palestinian workers, only the Palestinian workers. They, they, um, they work shoulder to shoulder with Israeli, um, Israeli workers and they can have the same social benefits and the same uh, salaries. Um, your salary based only about um, how good you work and what is your position and what is your education. It doesn't matter if you're a Palestinian or Israeli. 
that's what makes a real coexisting. And when you can earn uh, three or even four times wages in, uh, in Ariel, in Israel, that makes a real common interest because you have an interest to, to keep the, the region calm. No, it's nice sometimes to see maps like this that label it as Judea and Samaria. Because one of the things that we explain is if, if we give all of this away, and then you have a country with a waistline of nine miles, that's not a defendable border. Yeah. And if you think of what happened in Gaza, and if that all of a sudden happens in here, Israel's gone. Yeah. Like, we need Judea and Samaria for security purposes. So I'm joining Natalie here at the Bro uh, Nachman Legacy Center, or the Ariel Pioneers Museum. We're going to learn a little bit about the founding of this place, because the story is very interesting. And uh, there's apparently some really, really cool pictures and stuff that we can see here of the founding, of the humble beginnings of this uh, mega city in the West Bank. Ah, uh, that's with Lowell Milken. He's one of the biggest donors mm -hmm. in the city. He's, you know, donated amazing projects. We have really low, owe a lot of thanks to him. And he's, this is the first mayor. This, this, is, this is Van Nachman. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, those are, you can see these are the small houses, huh? Mm -hmm. The cottages. Up here, August 17th, 1978. And you have the first people who came to Ariel. And this is what Ariel looked like. And they just had a few little, little buildings. Looks like they were celebrating 30 years must have been of Israel. So I love that picture because it reminds me of what we've, what we've built here. And then over here, you have um, the sign that shows you Ariel. Ariel is right next to a Palestinian village called Sal Salfit, Palestinian city even, called Salfit. And in the beginning of Ariel, there was nothing here. There were no stores, there were no restaurants. Um, so the residents of Ariel would go to Salfit they have the best hummus in Safid, I understand. They would go shopping there, they'd buy things there. There was total interaction. That's, that's what we did. And it's kind of a shame that now we can't do that at all. I cannot go into Safid. I cannot go into Kifal Haris. I have friends who live there and I'm not allowed to go visit them. And they're not allowed to come visit me unless they have the specific permit, permission to enter for certain, for certain time periods. So we're really, literally, we've got Ariel, we've got Kifal Haris, we've got Safid, where these cities that are right next to each other but we, we don't interact. We can't interact with each other. And that just causes the divide more and more because we don't know who the other people are as people. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm working to break and try and interact and, and uh, get to know uh, Palestinians that live in the area and talk to them and hear, hear their story and hear their experiences and tell my story so that we can, uh, I think once we start listening to each other, then we can get somewhere. People have a misconception that you are an American colonizer, specifically a white European colonizer to this land, that you're taking over Palestinian statehood and that you're ruining the opportunity for Palestinians to, uh, to, to have their own state, their own self-determination. Besides how amazing you are as a person, I've come to know you in the last couple of days. I want you to tell the people a little bit about the work you do, with, specifically with Shoashim, which is something that's very, very interesting. All right. So uh, clearly that is a, a question that... Um gets to me because um, I've had it. We, we meet with groups and I've talked to people and they love to ask the question, why are you occupying their land? Why are you taking them over? Why are you kicking them out? Why are you causing them such difficulty? And I know a lot of times it's not meant to be an insulting question, but it is very insulting. Um, obviously you don't know me. <laughs> you guys don't know me out there. And hopefully uh, in our conversation today, you'll get to know me a little bit better. Um, but I, I really don't believe that I'm a person who would ever want to hurt anyone else. And I don't believe that I'm a person who came. I mean, even the story of Ariel, the story of Ariel, we didn't come here and kick anyone out of their homes. It was nothing. This was just an empty, barren hilltop. The Arabs in the area actually called it Jabal Mawa, which means the mountain of death. Nothing, they didn't believe anything could be built here. They didn't, they were, you know, into, into agriculture and, and farming was what they did. And they looked at this place, this rocky hilltop, and they're like, it's not going to be anything. So, I, you know, one thing that I like to, to look at is, is that we came and we built this beautiful city. Please God, it should be something that, that is good for both the Palestinians and, and Israelis. 
Um, but, but I can tell you that I don't wake up in the morning and say, yeah, I'm gonna go occupy some Arabs. I'm gonna go hurt them and make their lives difficult. Like I really don't wanna do that. I really wanna find a way where we can live together, live side by side. And I think that's, that will be beneficial for both of us. Um, so for many years, I believed that most Palestinians just wanna live in peace and they just wanna go to work and make money, come home, put food on the table for their kids, enjoy being with family and friends, go out, just be regular people like me. And I believed that, but I had no way to prove it. I had no way to confirm it because I had absolutely no interaction with Palestinians. We live right next to each other, but it's as if we live on different planets. And so I never had a Palestinian that I could speak to and ask these questions to. I never heard their stories. They never heard my stories. They didn't know why am I here? Why do I live in Ariel? Why do I live on this hilltop? And about a year and a half ago, we started doing renovations on our house and we brought in a Palestinian contractor and he brought his Palestinian workers. And I can tell you that in the beginning, it was definitely out of my comfort zone to have Palestinians coming in with their power tools into my house. Some of us could communicate with each other, some of us couldn't, and it made me nervous, it made me uncomfortable. But I, I you know, knew that, that logically, they're just coming here to do their jobs, do what they need to do, and go home. Everything's gonna be fine. This happens all the time. You know, people are doing renovations on their on their house and they seem like perfectly lovely people. I really got really got along with the with the contractor. Um, so during that time it also happened to be during COVID and we were during a lockdown. So I wasn't going to work, my kids weren't going to school. This was the third lockdown in Israel, and I was like had no social interaction whatsoever. I usually play basketball. I didn't play basketball. I didn't go to work. I didn't leave my house. And I needed some interaction aside from my lovely family who are great, but I needed to talk to people. And so I started talking with the Palestinian workers and I started learning about who they are. What are their lives like? Um, we didn't talk about the conflict. We didn't talk about these big heavy things. We just we're people and I learned what kind of coffee they like so I could give them the kind of coffee in the morning that they liked and I learned what they like to do and I learned about their kids. And it was such a breath of fresh air to just be people meeting people. And we'd laugh and we'd joke and, and one of them was an amazing photographer and he'd take pictures of my house and then he'd show me how to take the pictures and I, I just, you know, he was so talented and was such a sweet, sweet guy. And from then, you know, and, and people kind of heard about this and they were like, oh, Natalie, what's, what's, what's happening? What's, what's going on over there? What are you doing? Why are you starting to talk to these Palestinians? And I'm like, why not? Why not? I want to hear their stories. I want to understand their side because we don't hear their side. And, and all we hear about them and see about them is what we see on social media. Um, and it's bad. It's bad. All we're hearing about are terror attacks and hatred and the education, um, their education, getting rid of the, the Zionists and how, how horrible we are. So it was so nice to see that that's, that's not really um, the way I think majority of them are living their lives or want to be living their lives. They're an amazing organization. They do all kinds of events for Palestinians and Israelis, specifically living in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, specifically for people living here, side by side, again, not interacting. Shorashim, Roots, Judor, and they do all kinds of programs. They have programs for high schoolers. They have art programs. They have programs for kids, pro for photography courses for women. They have um, discussions where they talk about religion. And I said, that sounds amazing. How can I get involved? He said, well, the only problem is they're down in Gush Etzion, which is about an hour and a half drive from Ariel. And it's not so convenient to take my kid to a summer camp there. He said, but in good news, they're trying to build a branch here in our area. Why don't you call them up? and see, you know, find out about it. So I called up Rav Hanan Schlesinger, who's one of the, uh, one of the heads of Shorashim. We had a very nice conversation. I was just fascinated to hear that was, there was something like this that exists and that they're trying to build something here in our area for, for our locals. And he said, you know, I'd love to come to Ariel and, and meet with you and talk about Shorashim. And we have a meeting that's coming up. So why don't you, um, why don't we meet and then you'll come to the meeting? And I said, okay, sounds great. So we came to Ariel, I met him, we had a lovely conversation. We also met with my boss, Elad Mitsuyanim. 
And he said, okay, you know, the meeting's in a couple hours. I'll send you the Waze location. And, uh, you know, I'd love to see you there. So I said, okay. I actually had basketball practice that night, so I wasn't even planning on staying. I was going to go check it out, <laughs> but, you know, basketball is, like, priority number one. A little, little bit of diplomacy on the side of your basketball. Like, like right. basketball's a priority. Okay. We'll do a little bit of diplomacy on the side. <laughs> I was going to pop by the meeting and then head over to basketball practice. So I pull off on the side of the road. I come outside. I can't really see anything. There's not really any lighting. I'm not quite sure where I'm going. I hear some voices in the distance. I start walking up. And then Rav Hanan comes out and he says, uh, oh, Natalie, you made it. So I feel better, I can breathe a little easier. He's like, come and meet the group. So I come and I see a group of people sitting around. There's about uh, 25 Palestinians and Israelis sitting in a circle together. And I get, I get choked up because I can't believe that I am so lucky to be able to participate in a meeting like this where there's Palestinians and Israelis, Israeli settlers, as people like to call us, sitting together and talking about how to, how to work towards a better future. And how did I stumble upon this? How did I get so lucky? And I hadn't even started any of the conversation, but I looked around and, 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 you know, and I could feel these prejudices that I, that I had. I couldn't help it. You know, I saw these Palestinians and I thought in some other environment, I, I would be nervous. I'd be nervous that something's gonna happen. Maybe they have a knife, maybe they have a weapon, maybe they wanna hurt me. Um, because this is a reality that we live with uh, and it is what we see and it, it is what we're hammered with and it's scary it is very scary but I know that they're here for for you know dialogue and understanding and working towards nonviolence and reconciliation so the topic of that evening was what is my connection to the land and we split into groups and um, they asked a few people to talk about what's their connection to the land and a young Palestinian starts telling his story. And he talks about my connection to the land. Well, I was born here and my parents were born here and I grew up here and it's all I know. And I've never left Palestine. And I hear that word Palestine and I'm like, what, Palestine? Israel. It's like this, this trigger word that I didn't even realize how much of a trigger word it is. Like he's calling it Palestine. What does that mean for me? What does that mean about who I am? What I'm doing here? Then he says, and I don't understand why there are people who come from Russia and come from South Africa and come from Canada and England and America. There's these Jews that come here to Palestine and they say, this is my land. I belong here. And they move here and they take my land. This is what this young guy says. And I had never heard something like that. And I had never thought about it that way. And it, it, it blew my mind. And then they want to hear an Israeli speak. And all I can think is, oh, please don't call on me. Please don't call on me because A, I have to do it in Hebrew. My Hebrew is kind of kacha kacha, it's okay. Um, and B, I'm that person. I'm that person that this young guy was talking about who grew up in America, Jewish, girl who grew up in America, lived my life there, and picked up and came to Israel and said, this is my land. This is my homeland. And I believe it. I believe this is my homeland. So of course, who does Rav Hanan call on to tell her story? He calls on, on me, on Natalie. And so I tell the story of what is my connection to the land and how I grew up going to Jewish schools and we learned all about Israel and we learned all about coming back to Jerusalem and we learned about our history and we learned all the Bible stories about what happened here, here, right, right where we are. 80% of the Bible stories happened here in Judea and Samaria, not in Tel Aviv, not in Netanya, not in Haifa. It happened here. All these stories that I've been learning my whole life happened here, right across the street from me in Kifal Haris, Joshua is buried. Joshua is the person who brought the people of Israel back into the land after Egypt. And, and for me, that's just amazing to, to be able to be here. Going back to you know, learning in school and all of our prayers all have to do with coming back to Israel, coming back to Jerusalem, um, being back here. We celebrated uh, Israel Independence Day growing up. There was this connection that we had from a very young age to the land. On the other hand, it was kind of this faraway land. It was kind of this place that I pictured 
like a desert with camels and uh, palm trees and that was it. There wasn't as much social media when I was growing up so we weren't seeing, we were looking on Instagram and seeing you know, what Israel's really like. So I had this picture of this faraway land that somehow I was still connected to it. Somehow it was, it was a part of me and a part of my history. In fourth grade, my parents got divorced and I lived with my dad. My brother and I lived with my dad and I was a daddy's girl. I was the apple of his eye. I could do no wrong. My brother was a little bit of a troublemaker. Sorry, Adrian. But as long as I, you know, didn't cause too much trouble, I was the golden girl. I was very close to my dad. When I was 17 years old, my father was diagnosed with cancer. And one of the things that we did when he was sick, aside from chemotherapy and aside from radiation, one of the things that we did was um, we made a plan. And our plan was to come to Israel that summer. He said, when you get better, when you beat this, we're going to come to Israel. He had never been to Israel either. He had a sister who lives here. Um, so we made a plan to come to Israel. When it became clear that he wasn't going to get better, I made him a promise that that summer I was going to come to Israel. I said, this summer I'm going to find a way. I'm going to come to Israel. We were not a family that had a lot of money. We didn't travel a lot. We certainly didn't travel internationally. I had no idea where I was going to find this money to come to Israel. But I promised my dad that summer I'd be in Israel. And he passed away in February of that year. And I was lost. I did not know what was going to happen to me, who was going to take care of me, what my future was going to look like, where I was going to end up. And, and I felt like I didn't even have a home anymore. Without my dad's home, I didn't have a home. So I found out about a youth group program, um, touring, learning about the land, five weeks in Israel, and I got scholarships and I came to Israel. And I took that long flight from America to Israel. And we landed and everybody clapped uh, as the plane landed. I don't know if they still do that, but it was very exciting. And I walk off the plane and I step outside and I get hit with this hot blast of Israeli air. It's hot, it was in the summer. And I look around and I see the palm trees and I see the Israeli flag. And I take that first step outside and I take a deep breath. And I knew, I knew that I was home. I knew without even stepping foot here, I knew that I belonged and that I had come home. And I made a promise to myself that I'm gonna do whatever I can to come back to Israel. And I'm gonna come and live in the land. So I told that story. I told that story to the group of Palestinians and I explained, you know, it might be hard to understand. It might not make any sense to you, but this is, this is us and this is our story. And it's, you know, we, we, we were kicked out of the land for 2000 years, but we've always, we've never given up striving to come home and striving to come back. Now, obviously, since I've moved here, it's complicated. It's complicated because there, there is a group of people and I do have Palestinian neighbors and we're not interacting and we don't understand each other and there's so much hatred and fear between the two people. But I can honestly tell you that that's not, that's not the goal. That's not the ideal. And it's not, it's not the Jewish goal either. Um, so what I'm doing is I've gotten involved with, with Shorashim, with this organization called Roots, and I'm working as hard as I can to facilitate meetings between Palestinians and Israelis where we can get together, where we can know, get to know each other as people, as just regular people. And it's, it's amazing and it's inspiring and it's a breath of fresh air just to be people with each other. That doesn't mean that we agree with everything. That doesn't mean that we don't get in arguments and, and we have a hard time, but we, we start to listen to each other and we start to understand each other's stories and where we come from and why we belong to this land. And then we can start to understand and accept each other for who we, who each other is and, and why we belong to this land. Well, I'm curious, like through, through your work at Cholashim at the moment, how do you see and like, where do you want to see the Israeli-Palestinian conflict going? Like, where do you see this progressing to? Okay. So on one hand, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is so big and it's so complicated and it's so problematic 
and I'm just one little person here in Ariel trying to, you know, reach out to the people that I can reach out. So I, if I think of it as like solving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, I get very overwhelmed. But I believe that peace and coexistence needs to come from two directions. And it needs to come from the top down. It needs to come from agreements and governments and signing papers and figuring out land and, and borders or open borders or no borders, however it's gonna work. It needs to come from the top down, but it also needs to come from the bottom up because you can have as many agreements as you want, but if the people, the people living on the ground, living in the land, experiencing this life, if we don't believe in peace and we don't want peace, then it's not gonna happen. So I'm trying to do my part as this person living on the ground. And I'm trying to reach out to, first I started with just reaching out to my closer friends that I knew would be on board. And I had a meeting of 10 people and I invited a Palestinian to come to my house and tell his story. And then I invited 20 people. I kind of reached out to people who maybe would be interested. And I had 20 people at my house for another Chug Bayit, another uh, event in my house where, with another Palestinian. And then we had a bigger event where we had, you know, I think 40 people to that event. So I started kind of branching out. Um, we have meetings, we have meetings about once a month right now. And we have usually about 40 participants, 40 to 50 participants in the meetings. Um, usually about half Israeli, half Palestinian. Um, a variety of ages and we also do meetings so we get together and we, we do different kinds of events sometimes we do a language night sometimes we, we've done a music night now we're in the middle of these workshops about listening to each other um, so we try and kind of do a, a combination of fun things and more serious things and the conversations we, we like to try and balance it out we also do events at a, a local um, stream Nachalkana we did a cleanup event in conjunction with the organization called Habayit, um, where we had Palestinians and Israelis getting, you know, on the ground, picking up garbage, because if this is our land and we each, each care about this land, then we need to take care of it. And that was a great event, family-friendly event. We've done barbecues there. And I, I really believe that if I show my kids and I get them involved in this, you know, these types of conversations, and they hear these conversations that I have with friends in my house and how complicated it is. But if they come to these events and they see me speaking to, to Arabs and we're talking to each other and we're laughing to get together and I'm giving her a hug and they're playing in the stream with a little Arab boy that maybe they can't communicate with because he speaks Arabic and they speak English and Hebrew, but they're just playing and this becomes something that's normal for them, then I believe that we have potential for a future in which we live side by side or together because the next generation they're going to be the ones who can actually make those changes actually make those changes higher up they're going to be the future teachers they're going to be the future religious leaders they're going to be the future parents the future politicians if they choose they're going to be the ones that can really make the change but they're only going to make the change if they believe that it's possible so I'm trying to change the people around me and I have a list you know, of tons of names of people who are interested in coming to meetings. People hear about this and they're interested and they're fascinated. And this is like, no one's ever done something like this before. It's new and it's scary, but it's kind of exciting. And it's, you know, we've, we've lived like this for so long and the situation has been so ugly for so long and the politics, lately haven't haven't been so great we haven't seen any uh great moves there so yalla we got to do it on the ground and that's where i think a big part of the change can be made so so even if i can't i can't solve the palestinian israeli conflict but i can do what i what i can to work towards that because it's really and, and doing videos like this and speaking to people and, and showing who we are instead of who you think we are i think that's really important i think when we start listening to each other um and understanding each other and if those of us living here on the ground, especially in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, if we're starting to talk to each other and listen to each other, then we can work towards a better future because that's what we want. We want a better future for all of us. Oh, I just need to give you a hug after all that. <laughs> I know I heard your I story. No, but I've I didn't hear your story like to that depth. And it's really, uh, it's really touching. And we were talking about this earlier is like, this whole this whole word settler and all this the whole context that comes with it 
is like if you hear Natalie's story and you still walk away with a negative mindset on Jewish people's connection to the West Bank, to Judea and Samaria, to the Palestinian territories, whatever you want to call it, then there's no convincing you otherwise. But the point of making a video like this, where you just talk for almost 30 minutes, is that's the goal. This isn't a snippet from the news. It's for you guys to actually hear the story, to dive deep into it, to get the emotional side. That's the point of this, to understand people's rationale for wanting to live here. This is not an easy place to live in by any means whatsoever. It's very complicated, but they're building something beautiful out here and it's worth sharing. So this area, these olive trees, I believe, um, I'm not sure the, the exact area, but the olive trees here are actually owned by Palestinians. And it's not a place that they can uh, come to any time, from what I understand, but during the olive picking season, um, I know that they make special arrangements where the Palestinians can come, they can pick their pick their olives here and uh, and go. So it's not like, you know, we've taken over and we're going to uproot their olive trees. This is, this is their land. These are their trees. They can come and pick the olives. Um, one of my dreams is doing some kind of like joint olive picking event with Palestinians and Israelis. I don't know if it, it would be here or somewhere else. Um, but I thought that was something interesting to point out. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting whenever you travel across the West Bank, there's weird restrictions, both on the part of the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government, that restrict the movement of our two peoples from basically interacting and being with each other. And again, this is not stuff by the Palestinian Authority, this is stuff by the Israeli government that puts this up. Alrighty, so we are, again, in an aspect of this video to show you guys what Ariel is all about. Ariel is kind of known as in the West Bank being like the, the place of innovation, and modernism in uh, in between all the Israeli settlements that exist here. So we have come to where exactly? The Young Adult Center and also the home of the Field Center for Entrepreneurship. Cool, and that's this building right over here. All right, my friends, so we've, uh, we've made it to a very cool location, but I have to introduce you guys to, well, this is one of the most insane things that's ever happened to me, I think, on my travels. This is Tzvika. Hello. And I have literally been watching him for the last, I don't know, a year or two, making videos about Flight Simulator which is a video game that I love. And he's, he's here. <laughs> he's a local YouTuber from this area, which is crazy. And I was, this wasn't planned. Like, it was just spontaneous that we met him today. So, uh, it's first of all, meeting you also. yeah, man, it's amazing. It's so, so cool that we got to meet. Definitely. So tell me a little about, first of all, how you're here, what's your connection to this place and, and where we are right now. Sure. Basically, uh, what I do here is all of my uh, editing work. I have an office, which is a shared office over here. And we basically have like a high tech community over here. It's called the Field Center. That's where people like me who uh, work in uh, different high tech fields. For example, I have my own YouTube channel, just like... Uh, you spoke about um, go check it out down below in the description <laughs> yeah and uh what i do here is edit my videos i also have a studio where i record my videos but each of the people you'll see around here is basically doing something else uh, many of them work in the different high-tech industries uh, whether it's programming or other fields that they are doing on a day-to-day -day basis Super cool. So let's take a little walk around. So this is kind of like, it's kind of like a co-working space in a way as well. Yeah, it's a co-working space, mm -hmm. but we have a big community of people here that uh, really try to integrate, whether it's for me, uh, for example, making videos with other people like right. I'm doing with you right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go have lunch, you know, and this is like a core high tech community in uh, Somalia. So, so cool. Yeah, because yeah. people imagine like this is the Wild West and you have this amazing... Uh, community of people who are living in a very modern facility. So what, these are, are these like shared office, yeah, shared this, cubicles? This is basically a shared office. Uh, you can rent out space just for uh, that specific day. And you can also have meetings on that uh, specific room. And if we are talking about secrets and big stuff that's going on, I'm also building a huge uh, simulator. Like you, you just spoke about that uh, over there, just around the street. So mm -hmm. we're basically uh, building an airplane so we can fly flight simulator and broadcast to the world. We have one of the biggest channels for flight simulator uh, in Israel. Right now. It's, the, it's the coolest thing. It's, it's, it's insane that I was, I'm actually meeting this guy because yeah. I have been watching his flight simulator videos because I love flight simulator and hearing somebody do it in Hebrew was always so cool for me. So when I was living in the Philippines, I would literally sit down for lunch and watch his videos. Yeah. And now that he's doing that here is it's amazing. So this is a little uh, idea for what like the conference room looks like, the meeting room. Uh, one, one thing you might want to add also, because we are talking about uh, Somalia, is that one of the things that I personally did is that I have had a chance to speak with Palestinians and uh, people from the area. And I actually started doing videos in Arabic 
just by cooperating with people who speak the language. So this is something that's a big advantage for people like me who live in this area. So beyond all the conflicts and all the things you see in the news, uh, one of the things that for me specifically was amazing about this place is that I could connect with people uh, that speak a language that I don't speak, obviously. And uh, we started making videos in Arabic, which really uh, got great views uh, just because it was in Arabic and reached the audience we wanted to reach. And that's a, that's a huge thing you have when you live in this area. You connect with more people. All right, so we're pulling into the community center in Ariel now, which has got some special, oh, nice. This is cool. So this was a historic radio station, one of the first radio stations in Samaria. It was basically broadcasted from here, and we had like the voice of the area here uh, for local people. Nowadays, we basically changed it into my simulator space, and uh, this is like a music center now. So you can come here, you can play some... Uh, music if you want and you can also change the lights because it's got <laughs> so wait hold on bro so this is this is where you record all your flight simulator videos they come this out of here i will record my oh okay okay i'm kind of building my uh, huge cockpit mm -hmm. over here but i do have another studio where it's basically more suited for making videos i got you this is cool hey this is a place that breeds inspiration and creativity it's it's a place like this Okay, so this is the amazing space that he's coming out. And this, again, if I haven't uh, implored you yet, check out his YouTube channel, Copter Deal. He's also got another YouTube channel. I'll link it with the flight simulator stuff. In Hebrew here, it says YouTuber, uh, social influ or uh, technology influencer. Uh, and this is kind of the space that he set up here. And this is so exciting. So you're going to make a space here for people to be able to use the simulator, huh? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, we basically plan on building here. Uh, we have a huge TV from Samsung. They lent this to us so we can create this community project. And uh, we also have a flight simulator seat over there. So it's basically going to be a cockpit. This side is going to be a big cockpit. And you can train um, your flight simulator skills on the left. So we have uh, two flight simulator seats and then another big one over here. And that's going to be like a community space for people who... Uh, one experience flying planes like kids and people with uh, uh, special disabilities, whatever, um, can come here, can train themselves into flying planes. This is a local place, small place, but we still want to make it amazing, you know? All right, so it's time to show you guys some of the food game in Ariel. We're going to our first restaurant here. This place is called Hummus Esh, which means Hummus Fire. And uh, Tomil, Tomil says it's a really good place, right? Good, good. So. A friend of mine, is the owner. This is Hamzi. Bad on Hamzi. So here it goes, the uh, hummus getting plated up. Looks great. When you eat hummus, you want to experience the taste of the hummus. One way is to eat it with the pita, obviously, right. with the pita bread. But I think the better way is to take onion, not cut like this, by the way. A uh, thick one. A thick one and just like uh, use the onion because yeah. then you actually feel the taste of the hummus and do it without the pita and also without anything else. You just peel the hummus, that's the way to do it. Exactly what Zviko was talking about. You take the onion, try to get a little spoon shape going. Peel it up. Just like that, a little spoon. Oh, <laughs> I'm not afraid. We'll try the hummus. Mm, phenomenal. <laughs> All right, so after a delicious lunch, having hummus, we're gonna take a little bit more of a somber note, but it's important because I mean, a lot of the uh, story of Jewish resilience and the, and the beginnings of this country are rooted in the, a terrible experience that the Jewish people experienced, which was the Holocaust. So where are we now, Natalie? We are at the Holocaust Museum and we're gonna go inside. I'm gonna let them tell you a little bit more about it. But basically it was a museum that was built in someone's home. Irena and her husband, Kuba, they decided it was very important to tell the story of the Holocaust and they collected all kinds of artifacts from the Holocaust, actual things, they would travel all over the world, bring things back and open up this incredible museum in their home. Um, not too long ago, they actually, we, we actually uh, moved the location of the, of the museum from her prior house to this new location, and we're gonna go hear about it. All right, so here we are at the Holocaust Museum of Ariel. It was created by Irena and Kuba Bodislavsky. They paid for all of the items that they collected with their own money. Uh, the story was actually what happened was Kuba was a, a stamp collector and he would travel all over and go to these uh, auctions and sales to buy stamps. And Irena would go with him. 
So at some of these auctions, she discovered that they were also selling um, items from the Holocaust. And she had you know, gone through the Holocaust. She, she had escaped, she wasn't in a concentration camp. She had gotten away as a young child and grew up in, in Poland with a family uh, until she returned to her, her father. But she discovered these artifacts that they were selling and she started buying them. And she'd continue to go with her husband to these sales and continue to buy, buy things. Um, and so together in their home, they built a museum where they would invite all kinds of groups, all kinds of people. There would be school groups that came, army groups, uh, police officers, and they would tell their story and the story of the Holocaust. And it was very important to have this museum here to remind us about how important it is for us to be here, to remind us that we have, we have a home, we have a place to come to, we have a place where we belong, and that nobody's gonna throw us out. So I'm gonna show you around some of the artifacts. Uh, I can't do it justice the way Irena could if she was here, but I'll show you some of the interesting things. Yeah, to me, one of the most fascinating things, we briefly looked over this earlier, was these two Torah scrolls. I mean, this one is just a page. This is like the whole deal. We're saying this one was four, around 400 years old. This one's around 800 years old. This one was found in Krakow, Poland. This one in Warsaw. And what was the story about somebody was lying on this? So what happened here is this was actually discovered. Somebody went to a garage, a car garage, and they noticed that what the, you know, the person's laying on the ground working on the car, and they noticed they were, this is what they were laying on. And the reason they were using this to lay on was because it's made out of... Like a skin, like a parchment yeah, or something. Yeah, so it's very, very strong. So it was very convenient. Look at that. It's insane. That's around 800 or 700 years old. That's like some real, real Jewish history right there that stems really far back. And then this one also, look how amazing the detail is. The scrolls are still there. The stems are still there. It's unbelievable. And they built this amazing display case to house it all in. And obviously we have some things here that are uh, a little bit more darker in tone. Maybe explain to the people the badges for a lot of people who might be watching who don't know what these badges mean and what these are. The badges were basically what were used to, to identify you as a Jew. And you had to walk around with a, with a yellow badge that says Jude, uh, obviously in different languages. Here's in, in France. You had to identify yourself. To show that you were in fact not European, to set you apart as a Jew from the rest of the people who you were living alongside. This is what Jewish people were subjugated to in Europe around the time of the Holocaust. And it's another thing for me that, that one of the things that I discovered um, in making Aliyah and moving to Israel is I feel like I finally found my place where I can walk around and be a Jew and be exactly who I am and be proud of it and not be afraid. And that's a big thing because I can't really do that anywhere else in the world. I don't feel so comfortable especially these days with the situation, it's not so safe out there to be Jewish. And this is, this is my homeland, this is where I belong, so I can be proud of my identity and proud to be a Jew. So these statues were all done by a sculptor and they're all different stories and experiences that he went through in Treblinka. So I don't remember all the stories offhand, but each of these are, are something that, that he went through. This is a woman who was getting her head shaved over here. This is the hair, which is one of the things that they did before they, they sent them to the gas chambers, uh, that they shaved their head. I know this woman was, was she was holding like her, her, her loaf of bread that she got, you know, they were allotted a certain amount of food, not very much food, and she was holding her, her loaf of bread. She's taking all the, the shoes of the people before they go into the gas chambers. They had to take off their clothes and their shoes and so he's taking them away. It's just crazy to me to think of this, this man who has all of these horrible memories. How does someone go through this? And yet he turns it into the, the statues and here it is in the Holocaust Museum where we can tell these stories because they're gonna be forgotten. And especially in this generation where like the, you know, we're, we're, we know the last of the Holocaust survivors and it's so important to keep these stories alive and to talk about what happened? Because it's a horrible tragedy. It's, it's, you know, an embarrassment to mankind that this could happen. And we have to make sure that uh, never again. These are actually clothes that were worn by people during the Holocaust. These were the ones dished out to people during the concentration camp time. Um, and over here on the back, there's actually a little hole. And that's, uh, that's theorized to be either a bullet hole or a bayonet that the Nazis would, uh, you know, kill uh, Jewish people with. So it's either when they were 
clearing people out to um, shoot them into their graves or bayonet them. That is a whole. And apparently what happened was somebody who found a dead body already with a Jew who had been killed on the ground had to use this to cover up as well because it was so cold back then. It was such a harsh winter. Um, had to grab this and, and wear it after a fellow Jew was just killed wearing it. So here you have uh, stamps that actually Adolf Hitler made on his birthday, the 20th of April, 1943. And what's usually you find stamps like this, the individual stamps. But in this case, Iran and Cuba were able to find a full sheet of stamps. They found three full sheets of stamps, which is extremely rare um, and possibly isn't, isn't anywhere else. So she bought them and, and brought them here to be part of the museum. To not like hark on the Holocaust too much during this video, because this video is at the end of the day to showcase our reality, you guys. I think it's important. I want to say one thing about this here, and I'm going to end it after that about the Holocaust. This is a shoe uh, shoehorn, and it's it depicts a Jew with a big nose and like a snake tongue. And this was like a funny thing. You know, this was like a thing that people back then probably like enjoyed using to, you know, just like a racist trope that's just like, okay, that's how much we dislike and despise Jews. We'll just use that. When we talk about as Jews, the importance of us being and inhabiting this area, a lot of people would like to say that we're, that Jewish people are colonizers and they need to go back to Europe. Uh, the, the settlers here are, are from Europe originally because they're white skinned or they're light skinned or fair skinned and they don't belong to be here. If there's any proof that you need within the place that breaks that stigma, it's a place like this. You can see very clearly when you walk around this room between the clothes, to the stamps, to the propaganda, to the newspapers, to the horrible photographs of how Jews were subjugated um, and have to literally to identify their religion or their race. Jews were never ever seen anywhere in the world as part of their society, never accepted. And that's why it's so important for Jews to feel comfortable in their homeland, in the place that they're actually from, the place that they're indigenous or native to. And you'll realize that if you look into it for more than three seconds and give it this superficial surface level wash of you're a colonial settler. Just because of the color of your skin, it doesn't mean that you're endemic or native to Europe. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything like that. And you can tell that no matter how long Jews lived in Europe, seemingly 800 years with the Torah that you have there from Krakow, Jews were never fully embraced and they were never fully accepted. And the proof of all of that is in this museum, in this house. You can see that in every corner of this house, horrible things that Jewish people went through. The proof is in the pudding and it's all here. Uh, and you don't have to search any further than this to get proof as to why Jewish people deserve a right to live in their ancestral homeland, in the place that they are native from. So we've actually driven away from Ariel now. We're in the Ariel industrial zone near the Balkan industrial zone, which are kind of like competing zones. This one is a little bit smaller of Ariel. And we're heading out to a factory that I'm so excited to show you guys. As you can see, the dynamic of the area has changed completely. It's no longer a city on a hill, but it's a bunch of warehouses everywhere. So we're hopping in a car right now. I'm going to take you guys to a really, really cool factory I'm very excited about. So as you can see, I'm in a boardroom now, <laughs> kind of like a boardroom, of the uh, factory of Akhva, which is one of the biggest I'm, I'm not gonna explain I'm, I'm gonna let you explain this is the right. CEO of the company correct right. tell us a little bit about Akhva Akhva is uh, one of the leading food factories in Israel we're uh, producing different kind of uh, products mainly sweets and sesame based products selling worldwide and mainly US Israel but uh, selling also in Canada Australia and many other countries and that's it basically it's a very exciting because I grew up i was telling him earlier i grew up with these products all these products is something i actually eat on a regular basis as well whether i'm in the united states or in israel so i'm very excited to take a tour of this facility so let's go check it out what's your name hadi hadi and you're gonna be showing us around today right it's okay no. let's do it okay okay hair nets hair net time my favorite part okay what do i do here oh both of them yeah there you go. There we go. All right. This is unbelievable. The smell in here. Wow, Hadi, it's amazing. How do you work here all day without getting super fat? It so, smells so good here. I'm working in halava. Oh, it's yeah. even worse. It's, it's more delicious. So, Hadi, I'm curious because uh, today's episode, we're kind of talking about coexistence between Palestinians and Israelis. And you know, you work here in a factory yeah. that is run by Israelis, but also has a lot of Palestinians in it. 
as well. What is it like sort of working in a place like this that has Palestinian as well? Yeah, as I told you before, yeah. here we like family. Like a family. And I think Mr. Yad explained to you, Palestinian, they need to work right. with the But they are in me. After that, day by day, they will be like small family. Daily, day by day after that, they will be big family. So I think the relationship between Israeli and Palestinian people, every day is going to be better and better and better. The people that work here with you, they're Palestinians from the West Bank, right? Most of them from West Bank. Everyone and there's, West there's Bank. people also, they call it Arab, Arab 48. Arab 48, Yeah, right. 1948. So those people, they stuck inside and uh, everything stuck. These Arabs that work here, and the Palestinians that work here. Yeah. Does everybody here work under Israelis, or there are Arabs who are supervisors? How, how does it work exactly? Most of the supervisors, uh, supervisors they are Arabic. Most of the supervisors yeah, are Arabic. It's like ninety percent of supervisors Arabic. Oh wow. Yeah. The remaining, you know, Israeli. There's one Israeli work under Shaukat. Means Shaukat in high level. Like, so the Palestinian yeah. is above the Israeli in the company. No, no, no. Equal, everything. Equal. Yeah, equal. But higher, like, position. Yeah, it's like position. It's like how many years you spend. Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like experience. It's like yeah. a proper uh, example yeah. of coexistence. Like, people really working together like a team here. It's like international cooperation. You right. know, if you are working in bank, something like day by day, they will promote you to higher position. And I'm curious because I think my viewers will be really curious to know about this. It's okay. What, what would be your incentive to work in, in, in Israel? Like, why would you want to work in, a, in an Israeli company or a company like this? Yeah, you was explaining me a little bit, but maybe you can yeah, explain yeah. to the people. Uh, when it comes to wages... Nowadays, nowadays especially after uh, COVID-19. Yeah. You know, the, before that, it, the situation was not that much bad. Uh -huh. But you can say bad. For people who studied here, who graduated from here. Like for not me, making money. Yeah, for me, I studied here four years. Wow. After that, I I traveled to UAE. I worked there four years. Because I know why, why I need to spend four years in my... In, in the college, after that I will, I will work for 1,600, 1,700 shekels. That's, that's how much you get paid if you work yeah. in Nablus, for example. Any city in West Bank. Any city in West Any Bank. Any city, yeah. Well, around 1,600 shekels. Yes. For, for uh, my sister, my eldest sister, she's a uh -huh. She has experience like we talk about seven years. Good experience. If she works in other countries, they will tell you just stay here and whatever you want, we will give you. Here she's working in a governmental uh, hospital. She get uh, around 4,500. And you talk about, what about engineer account? Right, even uh, less. Blah, 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 blah. They will get less. So when Maybe you... Maybe you will spend around 10 years and you will get the same salary you get in the first day. That's that, crazy. Yeah, that's the meaning issue we're facing. I know the living cost, everything in West Bank is very expensive. And so when you come and work here, you get paid. Yeah, here's more than triple. We get more than triple. Yeah, wow. for me, I'm telling you, I, I have certificate in accounting. Why I'm coming here, right? I can work in accounting. I, I can work in banks, but for what? For one thousand seven hundred dollars? For me, until now, I'm twenty-seven years. You ask me about, about my age, right? Yeah. Until now, I'm still single. We're around the same age, me and him. I'm twenty-six. He's twenty-seven. Well, so I'm telling you, if we keep working in this bank for the same salary, we not do anything. Right. What you will do? Only eat and sleep? You cannot uh, get married, you cannot uh, buy a car, you cannot uh, buy a house. So most people, most Palestinian people nowadays, they're going inside. It means inside, inside Israel. Like factories, uh, labors, whatever they will find there, they know they will get more pay. That's why they're going there. I'm thinking more than triple they will get. Most uh, here he told you the average around seven to eight. Or six seven to eight thousand. Yeah. yeah, wow. Maybe you will find eight to nine, uh, nine to ten. It's different from factory or company to other company. But I explained to you how the, the vibes and the nature with them. It's good, man. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hadi, you have an Instagram, Hadi? We plug your Instagram? Yeah, I have. Hadi. So we'll, I'll get Hadi's Instagram. Go give him a follow. He's a good looking man. This is Yuri, by the way. He works here a long time, right? And uh, he's showing us the rogalach. We got the bokeh. It's a breakfast cake. So I have to try it and say well. I have to say well. Wow. Wow, super good. Really good. Wow. When you buy these products, you usually package it up in a plastic wrap. 
from the supermarket. Here, it's all freshly baked. Totally different flavor, it's so good. So we're in the Khalva factory. And again, really important for you to mention, I grew up eating Akhva products. This is like, this logo has been with me my entire life. Specifically the Khalva, like I grew up eating these and I eat them even today on a regular basis. You can see people are packaging up products here. Oh man, this is heaven, heaven for me, heaven. So Yuli and Hadi are giving us a proper tour now of the factory. And this is the factory that you work in? Yeah. So Yuri was saying now 50% of the Khalva is made of a 50% trina or sesame paste and 50% sugar, Alan. So this is here, it's sesame, trina paste, and sugar. And you can see it's being binded right now. Oh my God, look at that. That's so exciting. There's a secret recipe going on here, so I can't show the actual machine, but I just want to, I don't want you guys to mix the texture. Look how amazing this looks. Yuri just gave me some hot, fresh Khalva. Oh my God, it's so hot. Whoa. Oh my god, the only way you can get the salva that melts in the mouth is when it's hot. Oh my god. You can god. never reheat it. You can never get back to this consistency. You can never get back to salt. It's now or never. Wait, don't go anywhere. <laughs> wait, wait. <laughs> Please don't leave. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. That's so good. It's amazing, yeah? Oh, I've never had a salva hot like that. It's phenomenal. Wow, it's mind blowing. So, Hadi is leading it over right now. So this goes out the packaging? Yeah. Ready. Opa. Opa. What's happening? I will pour that way. No, the 150 kg is 15 grams. 15 grams? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's so it's getting lifted up right now. Uh, 150 kilograms of kalva. Oh my god. Look at that, that's heaven. Now it's coming down here. Here it comes, the khalva. It's dripping. Look at that, dang. It's kind of amazing to see how things like this are made in a factory. You know, I don't really get a tour of factories often. But it looks like it's gonna get flattened again or something. It's gonna get flattened? Yeah. So what, it's cut into a very thin piece? Yeah. So beautiful. Okay, so here they're making a different type of khalva. This is like a pasta khalva. It comes out in strands. Yeah. By your own hand. Yeah. So you can see how they're putting it together, stretching it apart. I mean, this is uh, this is nothing short of an art form right here. This is amazing. This is unbelievable. <laughs> this is so cool. Now, when they finish, what's it to be called? There we go. Hadi brought it out for us. What, what is it when they finish? They call it like hair. Hair, yeah. yeah. But this is the final product yeah, here. It's doing the final. No. It kind of, this one like kind of melts in your mouth a little bit. Mm. So good. So these are some amazing Palestinians who are creating hair halva. It's a sesame dessert made out of sesame paste, stretched apart until it comes out to this. A beautiful, melt in your mouth, delicious sesame hair. So good. So amazing, huh? Uh, Natalie, that was, I think, my favorite stop for today so far. I think far. it's one of my favorite parts of the job. <laughs> Anytime anyone wants to come visit, so I have an excuse to visit this factory. Yala, you're, you're invited. Please. I feel ignorant and stupid too that I didn't know that one of my favorite brands in Israel was based in Oviedo. Yeah, I have no idea. So I'm so, so excited to... Uh... No, for me? So there you go. I just got gifted. Again, this is one of my favorite things ever. I love this. I eat this on a regular basis. It's so nice to come to the source and get it from the factory itself. Okay, so this is the employees of the month. They get a free box of chocolates. A trophy and a day off. How cool is that? They get, a, they get an Akhma trophy and it's written in Arabic. That's so awesome. It's really cool. Actually, it's very heartwarming to see that like the... Because I know I know from being a little bit in the Palestinian cities when I visited, I know that I'm speaking to some Palestinians. I've heard about working conditions there not being very wonderful. And uh, knowing that there's Israeli companies like this that are actually employing Palestinians in a, in a very ethical and... Uh, 
an amazing way to incentivize hard work. And yeah, it's just awesome. It's really, really cool. Natalie, we're hopping all over the place today. To the university. Let's go. I have a question about you have a group of who? Can you explain that? Because I feel like people might not understand just the level of dedication you have to explaining your story and your belong belonging to you. I got a phone call right before Rosh Hashanah. I think it was on Sunday before the new year. And somebody said she had gotten my number from somebody who lives in Ailey, who she was supposed to meet, but it didn't work out. And basically she's bringing a group, she's German, and she's bringing a, a group of mainly Germans to the area to meet with people. And they're actually going all over Israel and meeting with Arabs and Palestinians and some Israelis here and there, and they really want to come and meet with, as people like to call me, a settler. So she asked if she could pop by, and I said I wasn't sure because it's, it's kind of last minute and I had to figure out my schedule, and I, tomorrow's actually my day off of work. Um, but it turned out that she's going to be able to come tomorrow morning at 11 and bring this group of uh, 11 women. So I'm going to come in on my day off <laughs> to meet with them. Um, I'm a little nervous because I was warned beforehand that they are very leftist. And, you know, this, so this is a group who's going to come in and, and be up in arms about what are you doing here and, and why are you here? Um, you're occupying the land. And these conversations are always difficult for me because, again, I really don't see myself as being here as an occupier. Um, I do believe that it's it's my land as well, um, but but I'm really really don't ever want to hurt hurt someone. And and one of the things I'm doing, being involved in roots and shorashim and getting involved in this dialogue, is is really trying to understand the issues and the problems and the experiences that Palestinians are going through and trying to figure out. I know so many people get into conversations about what's been done in the past and the horrible mistakes that, that each side has made. But we dwell so much in the past and that's not gonna get us anywhere. So I'm really of a mindset of, okay, here's where we are. Here's where we are today. Here's where we're living. Ariel is a big city and Ariel is not going anywhere. Whether you like that or not, we're here. And I really wanna look forward at a future in which we can be here and the Palestinians can be here and we can be here together and we can live side by side and that can be beneficial for both people. I don't see, you know, a separation. I don't believe that a two-state solution is going to be good for either side. I think we really need each other and I think we can really benefit from each other. So I try to explain that and, and, and tell people that, but people are really stuck in, you know, what, what happened in the past and, and, and um, all the problems from the past. So hopefully I'll meet with this group Hopefully they'll like me and uh, I'll be able to explain what I'm doing here, why I believe that I should he be here, and why me being here doesn't mean that I want to kick out all the Arabs that are surrounding me, not in any way, shape, or form. And uh, it's a little hurtful to me when I hear about people who want to kick me out. They want to uproot me from my house and <laughs> send me packing. And uh, why? <laughs> is that is that something you find yourself having to do frequently, Natalie? Like justifying your existence in the place that you're actually native from like is it is it is this something you do frequently like uh meeting with groups of tourists who come here and like are questioning you so we used to before corona hit we had a lot more groups and we had all kinds of groups that would come to REL and there were people who support us and people who don't support us and and that was fine I really think it's important to meet with all kinds of people and and tell our story I don't want to just meet with people who support me um, even though it's more comfortable <laughs> and a little little easier I don't feel quite as attacked but um, as far then after corona we've had less groups so it's not quite as often as it used to be however I'm involved in a couple Facebook groups um, where you know they they claim to be for peace but in all honesty there's just a lot of anger and hate um, you know when they hear that I'm from Ariel they don't even want to talk to me and and I don't understand it because I feel like if you really believe that I am the problem and that we as settlers here are the problem then don't you think you need to talk to us don't you think that that's an important conversation to have instead of just denying our very existence? We exist, we're here, and we're not going anywhere. And I say the same thing to, to Israelis who wish that the Palestinians would, would just pick up and, and move. 
no, they're here and they live here. And I think uh, one of the things that I've really connected with as far as Shirashim is that it's very much about let's both tell our stories. Let's both talk about our connection to the land. Let's both recognize that we each have a connection to the land. We really do. And once we honor that and accept it, I think then we can talk about where we're going to go from here and how we're going to live together. When we both accept that we both belong here. Okay, so guys, this is Yerum. Hi. He works here in the university in the communications department. And he's uh, going to be giving us a, a little bit of a tour of the university. There's a lot to see today. But we're going to try to um, show you guys some of, some of the cutting edge stuff if we can. We're coming in at a very spontaneous time during the high holidays in Judaism right now. It's very difficult to get access to a lot of things. A lot of things are not functioning. You said a lot of people are on vacation as well, right? Yeah. So uh, we're going to try to show you guys what we can in this uh, beautiful university campus up here in Ariel. Where, where are we going into right now, Yerum? What is this building? This is the building. You can see... Uh... Electrochemistry. Electrochemistry. Renewable energy. And renewable energy. Oh, cool. Yes. Sweet. So we're, we're going to get a little, hopefully an inside look at some of the labs that are inside of here. Whatever, again, whatever we can see because we're coming in a very last moment. Yeah. Okay, guys. So we've come to the Institute for Personalized and Translational Medicine. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is Yael. And uh, you work here in the university as part of this program, right? Right. So can you explain to me a little bit about it as we walk through your beautiful building? Sure. Um, so my name is Yael Mazels. Um, I'm a PhD in cancer biology. And this is the Institute for Personalized and Translational Medicine. Um, and we have three different departments here in our facility. What basically we're trying to do is we're trying to harness a lot of the information that's been gathered in academia and bring it to practical solutions so we can start seeing unmet needs in medicine and solving problems um, that exist. So let me take you through our facility. And you can, this is basically our office space where the senior scientists sit and you know meet with the, the research associates and think about the planning for their, for their science. This is where we do tissue culture. Okay. Wow. So these are two our research associates who are doing um, cell culture. I'll explain a little bit about what that means um, outside so we don't bother them. Okay. What we mean in terms of cell culture is that since the 1960s, basically, we've been able to take human cells and grow them in the lab conditions. We're trying to make models for cancer that could be used for drug testing that are three-dimensional. So that's something that is more innovative because if you think about a human being, a human being is not one-dimensional, they're two-dimensional, they're three-dimensional, right? They're, they're a number of different levels and we're working on new solutions for um, being able to um, find new tools to find exactly the right treatment for, for cancer for an individual. Another um, department we have is a medical cannabis. Um, that's a a lab I can't take you into. It's oh. only for people who have approval. <laughs> I can't even go in. Okay. Um, so with the medical cannabis, it's a hot um, field in, in Israel. We're trying to work on um, new molecules um, from the cannabis plant and synthesizing new molecules, um, exploring new molecules. Um, and we're looking for all different indications. Oncology is one of the primary ones, but inflammation, antibacterial, different. Um, new solutions using um, molecules from the cannabis plant. Um, in addition to our labs, this is where we have, this is kind of after hours, so we don't have, this is where we have um, the molecular biology facility where we're working on um, extracting proteins, DNA, RNA from different tissues or blood. Um, that's what we do here. Here's where we have our 3D tumor modeling, which is you know, from when we get the tissue, when we prepare it, um, this just looks like a fridge, right? But inside of this fridge is all the different com components we need to grow different cancer tissue, right? If you're growing breast cancer, or growing prostate cancer, or you're growing colon cancer, you need different additions, right? Because you're growing them outside of the body. The incubators over there basically mimic the human body. The temperature, the humidity, um, the atmosphere that the, that the tissue needs to be able to grow outside of the body. So in there, you're essentially growing cancer? Yeah. Wow. Growing, and we can take the cancer and we can grow multiple small samples of the cancer. Um, and yeah, 
that's what we can do there. And as we can grow, we can take one tumor and grow it in a 96 well plate. We can then test 96 different drug combinations on that, on that tumor. The last thing I want to show you is our analytics lab. In our analytics lab, here we have like a chemical code. Um, and here we have LCMS, which is basically a machine that allows us to separate different elements. It's mostly used for the cannabis project to be able to separate out the different parts of the cannabis plant, the different molecules, and characterize them. And then once we're able to characterize them, we can identify different ones for different roles. The last project that um, I didn't talk about earlier, but maybe you'll find interesting, uh, is the Women's Health Project. And that's a new project that we're developing here in our university. Um, it's widely known that women's bodies are different than men's bodies. But much of the clinical research that's been happening for over 100 years has been on men. Um, and we're trying to identify research gaps and find re different projects where it's important to look how women react differently than men. Examples are endless, but one of the big ones is heart disease, okay? The symptoms of a woman's heart attack are different than the symptoms of a man's heart attack, okay? Um, Alzheimer's. More women suffer from Alzheimer's than men, and the question of how hormones can impact the effects of Alzheimer's on women as opposed to men. So what we're doing in the women's health department is, first of all, just identifying areas where there isn't enough information, second of all, proposing new research projects in those areas, and third of all, that has a large information component. We're just trying to get it out there and get the information out there. Um, so I'm currently working on a project having to do with menopause, um, looking at um, which questions are coming up to doctors in menopause. Maybe there are certain areas which need more research. A colleague of mine is working on birth control. We just um, are in the middle of a big study on, on why women in Israel use birth control, how they suffer from side effects, their patient experience, and different things like that. And the last thing that we are involved with in the Institute is drug discovery, which is discovering new molecules to treat cancer. So that's what we do here. And you do, the drug discovery happens in this room? In this room and also in the biological lab. Wow. That that's really like being on the cutting edge, on the innovative like like side of things, right? Like you're really... We're trying. You're We're trying, trying to, yeah, find new solutions for unmet medical needs. That's yeah. that's so cool. And do you, do you guys work in uh, collaboration with other universities across Israel? We work in collaboration with medical centers. Um, we're, we're working right now with Hadassah and Ichilov and Rambam Hospital. That's amazing. So, yeah, so cool. We have a wow. lot of different That's amazing. So Yerum is going to check for us, but behind this wall, supposedly, no, there isn't supposedly, there actually is one. There's a freaking particle accelerator. I'm not like a physics nerd or like a science nerd in any way. I like dinosaurs, but that's where it stops mostly. But that's so cool. Like the, the fact that there's one here in the West Bank in Judea and Samaria, like in a university, it just feels kind of random, but also so amazing that it exists here in Ariel University. So we're trying to see if we can gain some access to show you guys it. But if we can't, I'll have Yarum tell you guys a little bit of information because apparently it was so big that they had to build the building around the particle accelerator. Wow. Standing wave and traveling wave section and it accelerates electrons up to approximately 6 MeV, mega electron volt. And what's the purpose of using this machine? Like, you guys just smash atoms into each other? What I, what I, that's what I know as a dumb, <laughs> non-science person. So the main, part of, main uh, purpose is to extract uh, terahertz radiation. So we accelerate the electrons up to the undulator, uh -huh. which you can see over here. And that uh, part wiggles the electrons and that produces terahertz radiation, which is uh, 10 to the 12th. And it's used for the radiation? It's used for and like... Investigate the radiation. Um, okay. 
and it goes it, it goes the particles are being moved in that tube yeah they're moved in the drift the vacuum tube uh-huh these are steering magnets and these are focusing magnets the yellow one is a dipole magnet it's a bending magnet actually a spectrometer to use to uh, measure the we use it to measure the energy all right my friend so this is a particle accelerator in Ariel University in the West Bank how insane is this I've never seen a particle accelerator in my life it is crazy cool we're just learning about it right now this is unbelievably awesome to see this thing so we've gained access into the room where they house their particle accelerator look how insanely cool this thing is I was just given a very long-winded explanation to try to understand <laughs> to be honest with you I did not understand much but I know that somewhere here, electrons are being wiggled. That's where it is. And uh, in, in the front of the, of the machine itself, this is called a gun. And these cells house electrons. They change the form of the electrons. You can kind of see they have these cool labels to show us what it looks like. But this is insane to have access to see this thing. I don't think this is something that's typically given to random YouTubers that come here on the day to day, but really appreciate it, Natalie. Thank you so much. <laughs> This is amazing to be able to see this. Again, we were trying to show you guys the innovation in Ariel. We we're trying to show you guys the cutting edge. And this, I don't really think it gets more cutting edge than a particle accelerator. That's not, I did not expect to see that today. Like, that's so cool. Whoa. Oh my God. Look at that. So we've got an access to another particle accelerator. What the hell? This is so cool. Oh my goodness. Whoa. So apparently this is the older one. Uh, the newer one obviously is refined in design, so it's a lot smaller. Again, I'm not somebody who understands anything about anything to do with this stuff, but it's so cool. <laughs> oh my god, this is amazing, and it looks like it's operating or something. I don't know, I mean, there's a lot of sounds coming from in here. So that's just wow. Who would have thunk in the West Bank, in the Palestinian territories in Judea and Samaria, you'd have Ariel University, which has a freaking particle accelerator that's so cool so apparently 20 years ago when this thing was given to them by Weizmann Mahon Weizmann which is another university in Israel they actually had to build this room around it because it was so large they didn't actually have a place to house this particle accelerator so they actually had to build the whole room on just around this place so all of this was constructed just to house this insane mechanical device they even have 3d printers here uh, and I'm pretty sure these are the uh, resin ones so these are like the more advanced ones so cool. Look at that. It's a massive. That's like, I think, the biggest 3D printer I've ever seen in my life. It's huge. We just came out of this amazing building with a particle accelerator. There's a hospital being built. It's going to have surgical rooms and all, all kinds of amazing cancer treatment. And it's going to be a bridge between the gaps because there's going to be Palestinians and Israelis that are taking care of this hospital. It's going to be a hospital open to everyone. There's no segregation in this hospital. He was saying that this is basically going to be a zone where people can sort of make peace as well in the hospital wow look at this we're on our way we're taking a walk now to the library look how cool this is what a view it's a big change from what ariel looks like in town this is like this feels like a very modern futuristic university from the united states of america i would say i'm not expected to be in the west bank of israel right now all right we're pulling into the library right now look how beautiful that is amazing look at that i love i love the like all the plants growing on the side of the building it's super cool it's so beautiful to see that there's a university here too, like a massive university. This is this is awesome. So we're in the library now and it's absolutely beautiful. And apparently he was just telling me that Mike Pence got a uh, certificate of like recognition of honor, right? Something like that? Yeah. By this university, which is uh which is pretty quick, right? Look at that. Beautiful library. So you can see there's some basic workstations here. Really nice uh really nice view actually. On the outside of Judea and Samaria. It's beautiful. And I've got the library itself. <laughs> Damn, Natalie. <laughs> Damn. <Natalie. laughs> Damn. This guy's crazy. What a day. I was telling Natalie earlier, I don't think from any of the videos that I filmed in this whole series of getting to know people in the Holy Land, has it been this easy to cooperate with people? Especially so last minute. Usually some of these were planned like three weeks, a month in advance. I planned this with Natalie less than a week ago. <laughs> Less than one week ago, this was planned. We put it together and everyone has been super uh, collaborative and, and willing to work together. It's so cool. So it's just been amazing. I really appreciate the people of Ariel being so amazing throughout this entire experience. And Natalie, of course, for putting the whole thing together. My pleasure. <laughs> All right, now we're at um, basically the, the top of Ariel by the university. 
and we just we, the university is on our right side and the entrance to the city from the top from uh, Jerusalem the direction of Jerusalem is behind us over here we have the newest mall it's a little little shopping center um, we have another gas station which is a big deal because we only had one gas station in the city uh, for 20,000 residents and 18,000 students so now we have two gas stations some restaurants clothing stores and then over here these buildings this is actually the community or many of these buildings are the community of Netzarim and Netzarim is a Jewish community that was evacuated from Gush Katif from Gaza in let's see about 2013 if I remember correctly they were removed from their homes and spread around Israel uh, what happened here is that the, the, the mayor opened up his arms to them he said please come to Ariel you're welcome in our community we have temporary housing for you because we have the, the student dorms and we have caravans and we'll give you the caravans until everything is worked out and you can build houses. So they lived in the caravans for a number of years um, until their houses were built. It obviously was complicated because there was the building freeze in the area and just, you know, everything kind of falling into place. But they finally have their houses here. I think about half of the community of Netzarim came to Ariel and about half of them stayed and half of them left because for them, it was a big shock. They were coming from a very closed community, very religious, and they worked in agriculture. They were used to farming, and they came here, and they're on this hilltop, and that's not really what we, we work in. We're not working in farming, so they didn't really know what to do themselves with themselves, and they had a very hard acclimating. So some of them went down south, and there's another community of Netzarim down south, but many of them stayed here. I remember one of them, we had a uh, meeting recently with a woman who came from Netzarim, and she talked about the fact that they came here after they were kicked out of their homes and everything that they, you know, were used to and, and loved, kicked out of their homes, had no idea what was gonna be with them, and they came to the community of Ariel, they came to the city, and it was actually in the middle of the night, and they thought, okay, we're just, you know, we'll just go wherever they send us, and that's it. And they said that the residents of the city came out with pots of soup and said, you know, here, we brought you food, we want you to have a, a comfortable, as comfortable as possible landing, you know, in, in the city, we want you to have the, the best welcome that we can give you, we want to basically give you a giant hug. Uh, we know what you've gone through and we're so sorry for you, but, but we're here for you as a community and we're, we're welcoming you uh, with open arms. So that's the story of Netzarim. All right, so we, we've jumped off from the university to a more residential area of Ariel. Now, can you explain to me what we're actually looking at? Okay, so right here, this is a university research project in my backyard, which is pretty amazing, of grapes that were um, planted through a combination of genetics research and archaeology research where they wanted to find the wine of King David and of Jesus and you know the there's like Merlot and Cabernet those are all grapes from France and from other places all over but um, they wanted to find a grape that's native to Israel and so the Ariel University has had a research project where they're actually taking 50 different species of grapes seeing what grows here naturally and is like fit and um, and are finding grapes that are native to Israel to make Israeli wine, not Merlot or Cabernet, where they make plenty of those in Israel too, but to make wine that's native to Israel. Like something that they would have drank in biblical times, eh? Exactly. That's so, so cool. And it's happening in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's so awesome. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we've hopped on down to Abu Shukri restaurant. I don't know if you guys remember in the Jerusalem episode, one of the old city episodes, we actually came here. Here it's mar marketed as a Lebanese restaurant, Abu Shukri. Um, and uh, we're gonna pop in here and have a conversation about coexistence between the Arab owners of this restaurant and the Jewish people who live in Ariel because it's right outside of Ariel, right outside of Ariel. They also have a date drink. This is a famous drink I've never heard of before. A date drink I didn't know. So Natalie's pouring me a cup right now. Told us we have to try this. Okay, first impressions. It kind of smells like soap. Oh, I wasn't expecting this flavor at all. Whoa! I don't like bubbly. It's not bubbly. It looks like bubbly. Whoa! That's date? Yeah. Tastes like Coca Cola. It's so good. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. It's like sour and sweet. Mm. Wow, that's so good. Yeah. It really tastes like Coke, no? Or grape juice? I don't know how to explain it. It's really good. Yeah, it's, it's wow. It's fantastic. So have you frequent you frequent this restaurant? You come here often? I come here all the time. First of all, I 
first of all, because the food is amazing. I'm not a huge falafel person, yeah. but, but the falafel here is amazing. And the pito, he makes the pito, fresh pito. So the food is amazing, but I also come for the for the company. The uh, the owner of the restaurant, Iyad, is just has become a good friend of mine. Um, I actually saw his eyes light up when you walked in. I could see he was really happy to see you. So I'm excited to have his chit chat with him about you know about coexistence and living here between Jews and Arabs together and running a restaurant, an Arab restaurant inside of, a, of an Israeli settlement. It's super, super interesting to me. So here's one of those rare sites you can see in the West Bank only. This would be an Arab Palestinian with a Israeli Jew working together in a restaurant under one roof. I should also mention that this restaurant is kosher, which explains the reason for uh, a rabbi or a Jewish person to be working in here. They need to have somebody who is called a mashgiach or somebody who watches over the food to make sure that it's kosher. So that's the, it's, it's amazing, like it's coexistence in every term of it possible. The Jews and Arabs working together to have a restaurant. Toda, toda. So he hooked us up with some falafel balls, some fresh ones. Let's try this out. Oh, it's nice and hot. Mm. Oh my God. Whoa. I know you've been seeing my food reactions today, but it's like super buttery. I don't know, I don't know how to explain this. It's like, it tastes like there's butter in here. Oh my god, it's so good. Mm. That's amazing. Wow. Look at how beautiful that is. It's so crunchy. So fresh. Wow. It's amazing. All right, Natalie. So we've obviously had a crazy day today, exploring and understanding Ariel. But uh, it's time to get a, like, a little bit more deeper and just talk a little bit more about the experience of what it's like to live here on the ground from your perspective. So. I mean, especially when it comes to trauma and understanding that aspect of it, like, I'd love to hear from you some of the things you wanted to share. Okay. Well, I do love to focus on the great things about living in Israel and the beauty of living in this land and how happy I am here and how important it is for me to raise my, raise my children here. I do think it's very important for people to understand the reality, the reality that we're still living in, the reality that we're working to change, but the reality of what happens to a person when you live under the constant threat of terrorism. And I would break it up into a couple, a couple parts. Uh, the first is because we live in this tiny land of Israel where everybody's connected to each other. Everybody has some kind of connection. So anytime there is a terror attack, you generally might know the person, might know someone who knows the person or is related to the person, you might be familiar with where they were you know maybe they just maybe they were shot at a bar in tel aviv and you were there not that long ago maybe they were stabbed by waiting for a bus and your kid waits for that same bus every single day so it's kind of like every terror attack still affects you now, sometimes it's stronger and sometimes it's a little bit more removed but but it's always there because you're always so conscious of of where it happened or who it happened to Another thing that happens when you live under the constant threat of terrorism is that you you kind of make build this bubble around yourself, this like self-protection, where you tell yourself, it's not going to happen to me. I'm on a basketball team and I drive to a small town called Tapuach three times a week. And I drive through the Tapuach Junction. And the Tapuach Junction, it's a hot spot for stabbing attacks. Sometimes ramming attacks, but stabbing attacks. And I drive there three times a week. And I tell myself as I'm driving by, well, you know, the stabbing attacks happen to soldiers that are guarding there. And the stabbings attack happen to people who are waiting for a bus or waiting to hitchhike. It's people who are standing at the side of the road. That's who the stabbing attacks happen to. But I'm in a car and I'm driving, so I'm gonna be safe. I'm safe, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna hurt me because I'm driving in my car and it's not gonna happen to me. That's what you tell yourself. Another thing that happens is you make a plan. If you're ever in a situation where you are uncomfortable and you are nervous, you start making a plan. And I remember um, about eight years ago, I was waiting, I got, a, I got a ride to a bus stop and I'm waiting at the bus stop. And it happens to be a bus stop where there's a lot of Arabs coming and going because they're getting rides from Tel Aviv or taking a bus from Tel Aviv and then they're waiting for their rides. And I'm, I'm waiting there and this was during a time where there were a lot of stabbing and ramming attacks. Um, I've actually heard it referred to as the stabafada. It was, it was that intense. It was happening so often that people were being stabbed. And then standing there, there at the bus stop, I'm waiting for a bus. 
And I start looking around and there's a lot of Arabs around. And I think to myself, well, um, what happens if one of these uh, Arabs has a knife and, and they wanna attack someone? Well, I'm standing here and I was eight months pregnant and I had this giant pregnant belly and I start thinking to myself, well, if there's a terrorist that comes along and he wants to do a terror attack and he wants to stab someone, I'm like the perfect target because I'm a two for one. You've got myself and you've got my unborn child. So I'm standing there looking around. I have a backpack on my back and I start thinking, okay, what do I do if somebody comes at me with a knife and they're coming at my back? Do I keep my backpack on my back so that if they stab me in the back, you know, hopefully I won't get hurt. And do I cover up my pregnant belly to protect the baby? Or do I take my backpack off my back, put it over my belly and hope that if someone comes at me from behind, they won't hit any, anything major. But then I think, but if someone sees me holding my backpack over my belly, they're going to know that I'm scared. They're going to know that I'm nervous and I'm trying to protect myself. So what do I do? And I'm making this plan in my head for what happens if someone comes after me with a knife. And I remember realizing at that moment, this is not normal. This is not a normal way to live. Who does this who's standing by the side of the road and trying to make a plan for if someone comes to stab her and her unborn child? This is not a normal way to live. And another thing that happens, and I think this is, this is really the, the most threatening of all and the most dangerous, um, are the paralyzing what ifs. The what ifs where you can be as rational as you want. You can know a certain situation and be confident in that situation, but these little what ifs kind of creep in on you. And not too long ago, my son called me. He was 17 years old. He was studying in Jerusalem and he got a ride from, he was coming from Jerusalem to Ariel and he got a ride from Jerusalem to, uh, to Shiloh, to right outside of, of Shiloh. And he's waiting there and he calls me up and he says, mom, listen, um, I'm on my way home. Shiloh is about 15 minutes away from Ariel. And he says, but the next bus isn't coming for like another hour. Can I just hitchhike home? And I want to say yes, because I know that he's standing there right by the city of Shiloh. He's waiting for a, a hitchhike. He's a nice Jewish looking boy. He's got a keep on his head. He has his, you know, religious fringes, his seat out. Someone will stop and pick him up. It's only a 15 minute drive. So I want to say yes. But what jumps into my mind, what jumps into my mind is the story of the three boys who about eight years ago were doing the exact same thing that my, my son is asking me to do. Three boys who were standing at the Gush Etzion Junction waiting to get a, a ride somewhere and a terrorist, two terrorists in a car stopped, took, they got into the car. Nobody knew where they were for 18 days. I remember it so well, those 18 days and they were killed. And that's what I think. And I think to myself, I want to say yes. I want to let him take the ride. I'm sure that he'll be okay. But what if he's not? And what if I regret this day for the rest of my life when I told him that he could take that hitchhike? So those paralyzing what ifs just creep in on you because you can't help it because it's, it's a reality. And fear, living like this, living this, this lifestyle um, or living in this environment, fear becomes part of your identity. And that causes, and, and, and it's something that you pass along to your children. And that causes a lot of trauma. And, and I'm talking to you as an American who moved here as an adult. I grew up in America. I didn't live under a constant threat of terrorism. And so I think of the Israelis, the Israelis who grow up like this and how, how you know, that, that traumatizes a person. And that's very difficult. And I think that's one of the extremely important things that we need to do to get out of that is we need to interact. We need to break out of our comfort zone. We need to start exposing ourselves, interacting with Arabs, uh, interacting with Palestinians and, and meeting them as people so that the norm isn't, or the norm that we jump to or that our minds jump to isn't that this might turn into a terror attack, but that these are just regular people like me living their lives. A couple months ago, um, I believe it was in May, right before Yom Ha'atzma'ut, Israel Independence Day, uh, there was a terror attack right at the entrance to Ariel. And it happened on a, on a Friday night. And people like me who are Shomer Shabbat, who keep Shabbat, keep the Sabbath, we don't uh, use electricity, we don't check our phones. So we kind of heard rumors uh, Shabbat morning that there was an attack at the entrance to Ariel. 
someone was killed and we tried to find out and what's going on. We heard something happened. We didn't know the details. Um, we talked about it a little bit over Shabbat. My kids were, were a little nervous. They said, well, what if the terrorists got in, into Ariel? And we said, no, I'm sure if the terrorists got in Ariel, we would know, you know, the police, the army would be knocking on our door. They'd be going around with loudspeakers telling everyone to stay in their homes. And the end of Shabbat came around and everyone jumped on their phones to see what happened. And, and you would think that I had the whole Shabbat to kind of process this information and, and realize what happened and think about it and that I want to get more information. But Shabbat ended and I, I shut down. I didn't want to hear anything. I didn't want to talk to anyone. Originally, they weren't publicizing his name. Then they were publicizing his name. And I didn't want to know. I didn't want to, to hear what happened. It was so close to home. It was so scary. It was right at the entrance. But I realized that people might be worried about me. And, you know, maybe my family in America heard about it or, or friends in the area. So I realized that's not fair. I got to get on WhatsApp. I have to see if anyone sent me a message. And I turned on my phone. I checked my messages. I can tell you that I got the same amount of messages from my Jewish, Israeli, American friends checking in on me. How are you? How is your family? Is everyone okay? We heard there was an attack in Ariel. Messages that I got from Palestinian friends, Arabs that were checking on me after a terror attack, but they were worried about me and they were worried about my family. And so they checked in to see, how are you doing? Are you okay? Is your family okay? What's going on? And I even said to one of them like, whoa, I don't even know if we should talk about this. It's going to be too upsetting. And he's like, I'm worried about you and I'm worried about your family. And that just showed me how far, thank God that I've been able to come in this journey and how crucial it is to be working on these relationships and working on these friendships with Palestinians because bottom line, it's people to people and we're all just people. And we're for the most part, pretty good people. We really are. And we really care about each other and we're really concerned about each other when we're given that in opportunity to interact and connect and get to know each other as people. Both sides believe that the other side doesn't belong, but both sides belong here. Both sides have a history with this land. Both sides have a connection to this land and neither of us have anywhere else to go. And both sides think that they can tell the other one who they are, but no one, no one can tell you who you are. And Palestinians think that Jews are just part of a religion and they can just go be Jewish anywhere. They can be Jewish anywhere around the world. Just be Jewish. It's just a religion. And Israelis think and Jewish people think often that Palestinians are just Arabs and they can go be Arab in one of the 22 other countries. But that's not the case. We belong here. We both belong here. And it's so crucial to realize that about the other side, about our connection, and to accept that about the other side in order to work towards living together and living side by side in peace. It's been amazing learning Natalie's story and obviously getting an insight to your life here. And I appreciate it so much. The day was <laughs> phenomenal. What's up guys? So our first stop here on the tour with Tourist Israel is in the city of Bethlehem, in Hebrew, Bethlehem. This is actually where Jesus Christ was born. Here the shepherds were taking care of all their sheep and goats during the day and night and the angel of the Lord appeared for them at the time of giving birth for Jesus and they told them the good news about the king who was going to born in the city of Bethlehem. So from here they had the sign and they followed it up until they reached the place of birth which is nowadays the church of Nativity. Currently in a limestone cave here in Bethlehem and uh, this is apparently where the shepherds used to dwell which is really cool. And everything, everything here is all carved out of limestone. we're entering right now was actually built in 1952 by an Italian architect and it is where it is rumored that the shepherds slept and stayed. Very very cool designs in there. And we are off to the Church of Nativity to see where Jesus Christ was born. Very exciting.
just exit some parking garage into what looks like downtown Bethlehem. You can see a bunch of churches and architecture is incredible. Really, really beautiful area. Guys, check this out. It's not Starbucks, but it's stars and bucks. Fantastic. Okay, very exciting. We're about to enter the oldest church on planet Earth. Yeah! Are you excited? Yeah, yes, are you I am. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we are entering the Church of Nativity right now. And uh, we're passing through a little arch. He was telling us that the point of this arch is to be able to bend down so you show your respect to Christ before entering the church itself. Uh, this is the oldest mosaics that we have it here in the city of Bethlehem. And this is the oldest church. So as you see, it's looked like a carpet, but the Roman were have, like doing this kind of style. A really cool thing I just learned is they actually celebrate three Christmases here in Bethlehem in the Church of Nativity because they have three different divisions of Christianity here. Um, they have Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, and Armenian. And right now we're in the Greek uh, sector of it. And you can see it's very reminiscent of the um, cathedral in Barcelona where everything's like gold and shiny. Girls, what do you think about this? Pretty crazy, isn't it? It's so yeah. pretty. The designs are so intricate. Yeah. Like everything is so tiny, yeah, it's but it's like tiny. so detailed. Mm -hmm. Armenian quarter of the church. It's very cool that there's like three different types and they're all in the same church and everybody has like their spot. All right, so where we're at right now is the Roman Catholic. And this is by far the largest area that we've seen so far. It's massive. It's like a long hallway going all the way down. Very, very beautiful. From here, on our right side, in front of the priest, this is the Star of Bethlehem. And that's a place where we believe that Jesus was born. It's a silver star with 14 points. All right, so we're entering the birthplace of Jesus Christ right now. Our group was this dark. It's because it's not busy. No. Well, intense. There's like 50,000 people in here. And now we're heading into what is called the manger. Okay, friends, so the, the manger is the place where Jesus slept after he was born. So he was born in the place of birth, which is marked as the star of Bethlehem, and then they move in another place. So he slept over, and they surround him with the animal, and that's mentioned in the Bible. Okay, that's all about this place. It is pretty insane to be standing in the literal birth of Christianity, the largest religion on planet Earth, and it's right here. Crazy. Crazy to imagine this. Guys, listen, when you come in here, you have to be wrapped up and you have to be like dressed conservatively. So Tanya is wearing like this one piece giant blanket thing, which she creatively okay. made. <laughs> and Louisa has killed me. <laughs> She's wearing a I just came out of shower. <laughs> She's wearing a bath towel. <laughs> we're officially out of the Church of Nativity. We're gonna be heading off to our next site of the day. So we're officially in the desert now. We're getting our way to uh, Jericho right now, an ancient city lowest city on planet earth uh, we're heading to the dead sea and uh, as you can see right there you have a little sign for the sea level that's because right here is the sea level line and everything below this is below sea level all right so we're currently entering what is uh, supposedly the oldest city on earth and also the lowest city geographically on earth uh, we're just going to be exploring the ancient ruins i believe guys you know, Jericho is the oldest known city inhabited continuously in all the world. 
It's 10,500 years ago. So our tour guide just sat here and gave us a whole spiel about the city. There's so much information, so much history here that I can't even begin to try to summarize it. But essentially, um, up there on that mountain, that's where Jesus was tempted by the devil twice. Um, when the Israelites were coming from outside of Israel with Moses, they sent the spies to Israel to try to scope out Israel. That happened here in the city. And uh, yeah, that's a little brief overview. <laughs> So here we have the view from old ancient Jericho. This is this is what it looked like. This is the entrance. Apparently the city walls are there and the steps coming up to the city are right there. All right, so behind me you have Elijah's spring, which is uh, where Elijah came and blessed the water. It used to be very salty and then he came and blessed the water, made it sweet, made it drinkable. And now there's a little drinking station there where you can fill up water and actually ingest the water from Elijah's spring. We just stopped here in, I guess, the visitor center here in Jericho. And we got a little falafel pitas with hummus and stuff. It's gonna be good, we haven't eaten all day. Guys, we were just sitting down and this boss came and brought us knafe. I was not expecting to have knafe today. This is, this is a good day. All right, we are heading back on the bus now. We are at the last stop of our trip for the day at the Dead Sea. They're taking us to some private beach here in the area I've never been to before. So we're gonna go check into this beach and then head on in. All right, so we're back down to the lowest place on earth. In front of us is Jordan. As you can see, we have been in that country, which is another little check off the list. These girls are gonna go cover themselves in mud from the freaking little mud bath over there. Weird. <laughs> Day is coming to an end. We just left the Dead Sea. That was another beautiful experience there. I feel privileged to even have been able to go on this trip. Seriously, it was amazing. All right, let's head back to Jerusalem. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm back in the city of Jerusalem. I just got dropped off. I'm gonna go find my hostel now, and then we'll wrap up this video.